Thank you everybody, um, welcome uh, and uh, really nice that uh, you came and did you have interest in our uh, workshop. So uh, I'm starting now because we have quite a packed program so it's better to uh, yeah, uh, uh, be on time. So first uh, I would like to have a few introductory words uh, what we are doing and why. Uh, so the ETUI, together with the European Climate Foundation, is conducting studies on, well, the mobility transition. Uh, how to get to net zero uh, mobility uh, in a just way and taking also, of course, road transport in focus and this project particularly it's about the automotive industry so it's not about the whole mobility system it is about the automotive industry itself but of course we see it as a part of the broader um, uh, uh, mobility system and this is what we are also continuing to do uh, the, the the original idea is and that is the core interest of the TUI to 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 match the green uh, transition, the social and labor aspect with the environment and climate, uh, how we manage this historical transformation uh, uh, in a way that, that is, well, benefiting workers and the whole society. Uh, so, uh, so this time it's about the automotive industry and, and we actually, uh, uh, chose a little bit of a provocative title, whether we, is it to be saved, yeah? Well, <laughs> this is a double question, and it was meant for provocation. So, uh, on the one hand, is it that serious? And actually, the, the case is, and we will see that it is serious, and it is extremely dynamic, and it is moving fast. Uh, the other thing, whether we need to save it or not, well, not for its own sake, because it's not individual transport. That should only be the way uh, to, to, uh, to, to manage sustainable mobility. But the automotive industry and road transport still plays a crucial role. And what is important for us uh, that there is a European competence and a European industrial base uh, that is there. Uh, and, and remains there. Uh, what exact size? Well, okay, uh, you see that, but uh, we, there is also a transformation that we have to manage uh, properly. And this is actually quite a huge challenge. Uh, uh, we also know that, of course, road transport is critical uh, because it's, it's responsible for a big share of emissions and it is performing terrible. I mean, the past performance is just, 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 oh, uh, of scope. So we need to do something. Uh, there are also 13 million jobs that are depending on, on uh, this uh, sector, so it is extremely important. And more than that, it is a perfect laboratory for just transition because it is about everything. It is about digitalization, globalization, uh, and, uh, and deep uh, decarbonization. Uh, so, and, and, uh, so we have this is a laboratory itself. Uh, so this is what we are uh, trying to do here. In this particular project, we had three uh, uh, different uh, pillars. The one starts it with the regulatory framework. That is an evergreen issue. And uh, thanks for Tommaso already being here. Hi. Uh, you will have a very detailed um, uh, view on that and why the regulatory framework is still not proper uh, and why we need to change and uh, 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 that. Uh, so that is, that is still an ongoing uh, subject. Then there is the European industrial space for automotive uh, and, and how this is developing, what industrial policies uh, are necessary to keep it. Um, uh, uh, the European automotive industry had been in a very privileged position in the past uh, with the combustion engine because it was top of the world, not only the German diesel technology, but, but European 
uh, 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 automotive competence was on top, and it was and it is an incumbent position, but this is the past. And now everything is new, uh, and the challenges are huge. So this is what we are going to talk about. Uh, and then, of course, we need uh, just transition policies at plant level, at uh, regional level, and, and, and uh, uh, national level. Uh, and this is actually largely missing. Uh, so uh, we will try to collect practices what are already visible, uh, but then uh, go on. So this is what I wanted to say now, and I pass the word to Alin Hoffman, my colleague, uh, head of unit for, uh, well, Democracy at Work, uh, and, uh, and uh, you will moderate uh, the first panel. So uh, thank you, Alin. And... Good morning, everyone. My name is Erin Hoffman. As Bella said, I work at the EGUI, um, mostly focused on Europeanization of industrial relations. In my previous life, however, I worked at IG Metall uh, and uh, had a lot to do with the automotive sector. So thank you very much for the invitation to moderate this session. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our national experts, which is the focus of this morning. So if I could ask our speakers to come upstairs, uh, to come upstairs, to come up here, uh, Johanna Schulten, uh, I can't see the name, Sebastian Cabonel, Benjamin, and Bob. There you are. Hi, didn't get to meet you before. Please to meet you. So, in this session, this whole morning actually, uh, we get to hear the main results from national studies on how different countries uh, have addressed the issues, some of the issues that Bella um, already raised in the transition uh, of the automotive sector. So what has been done, um, what has been the role of the social partners is something I'd like to focus on when we get to the discussion. We do have planned uh, time for discussion uh, and question and answers. Um, and without Further ado, I will just continue to introduce the people. Next to me is Johannes uh, Schulten. He uh, will be talking about the German case, um, and he works at the University of Duisburg Essen. Uh, next to him is uh, Juan Sebastian Cabonel, who is going to be telling us about France. Also, talking about France is uh, Bob Hanke. Um, who will discuss more the policy uh, uh, responses uh, in the French case. And then we have um, Benj Benjamin Denis from Industrial, which is the sectoral trade union for, amongst other things, the metalworking sector, to give us sort of a European trade union perspective. After the break, then, we will hear more about um, the Italian case and Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, a selection of different countries. So that's what we have this morning. This afternoon, then there are panels to discuss, uh, I think, more the, the policy uh, implications with trade union leaders uh, and other experts. So this morning is much more sort of input and getting a grip and understanding what's happening in the different countries. And as I said in the discussion, I'd like to focus a bit on the role of trade unions in particular in addressing it, since we are the European Trade Union Institute. So without further ado, I will hand you the power. Thanks. There's the clicker. Johannes, you have the floor. So, uh, it's, it's mine, I guess. Yeah, yeah OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And um, as the title, which I can't see from here, uh, <laughs> suggests, uh, I will take in this uh, presentation kind of an actor perspective. And I will uh, focus on the specific practices uh, of, uh, with which trade unions and, um, and um, work councils, because we're in Germany here, uh, uh, react to the new conditions of actions, uh, action in, in, the double, uh, in which we can call the double transition of, uh, of decarbonization and uh, the digitalization of the automotive product. Um, and that brings us to the, um, to the main question. Um, as you can see in this quote from Hyman and Gumbre McCormick, they 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 uh, well they tell us or they the idea is that um, that um, especially in, in in times of crisis um, or especially times of crisis maybe uh, um, they, they 
can offer chances or opportunities for something that we can call a union renewal. And um, by formulating new goals, by formulating uh, or by using new instruments or uh, other new, maybe new forms of action. And I would like to, uh, to build up on, uh, uh, to build on, on this, uh, this thought today um, and try to answer the following questions. Uh, and that's, uh, um, do the IG Metall and, uh, and because we're in Germany, work councils prove to be capable of strategy? Do they develop new or maybe innovative objectives, uh, instruments, and forms of action to secure uh, employment in the arena or in the two arenas, both arenas of collective bargaining and uh, the arena of company labor relations? And what power resources are uh, they lying on? So the empirical basis of um, this little research is, is more or less simple. We have conducted like 15 interviews with uh, uh, representatives of staff members uh, and representatives of uh, uh, local uh, work councils, uh, central work council uh, of, of uh, different companies of the automotive industry as well as IG Metall officials. And uh, in these interviews, it became more or less clear that um, the traditional tried and tested negotiation patterns uh, are, are still dominant. So, and that's more or less uh, uh, the uh, so-called productivity pacts, pacts or productivity agreements. And um, work councils have normally uh, score points in these productivity agreements with their high or with a high level of uh, qualification of the workforce of the, um, of the locations and uh, the process engineering skills of the workers. What also became clear in the interviews is that, uh, well, times are changing and uh, the chances of success um, of, these, uh, of these traditional agreements have, uh, are, are, have become much lower under what we can say the imperative of, of, um, of uh, double transformation. And there are many, many reasons for this. One, one reason is that, um, yeah, that, that both the uh, electronic um, powertrain, the battery, and uh, the areas of software architecture um, are completely new products. And um, these normally require uh, different or uh, new kinds of qualification of the workforce and new uh, processes of engineering, um, engineering skills. And um, often, or even at last, uh, they, they uh, need significantly uh, changed architectures of new, uh, or, or at least new, new, uh, totally new, new plants, and that's a totally new uh, situation for for the works concerts in, in the ne ne negotiation process. Process, um, but let's say uh, the good thing is that. Um, there are some attempts of, uh, to expand, let's say, the traditional or the existing repertoire of collective bargaining and, uh, uh, and company policy instruments. Uh, and I will talk about them with the next slide. And in this slide, on this table, you can see um, some of the innovative, let's say, innovative instruments um, that uh, IG Metall and uh, Works Council are using in the current transformation conflicts. Um, I have highlighted uh, the two instruments which, in our opinions, are the, the main instruments or the most interesting ones, and that's uh, the so-called future collective agreements, in German it's Zukunftstarifverträge, and, uh, and kind of company-centered organizing campaigns, which we see right now at the Tesla fa uh, factory uh, near or next to Berlin. And, and I will uh, discuss these two instruments uh, in the next slides. <laughs> But some words on the other instruments. One is um, uh, it's uh, uh, called social collective agreements, and that's to be honest, it's, it's not a new instrument, but it, it's one that has kind of a revival during uh, the current site closures that we are dealing with in, in, in Germany right now. And um, the point is that site closures normally are uh, negotiated between um, the employer and other management and the work council in quite a legal, legal way. Um, and the problem sometimes is that, um, that the uh, works council do not have a right 
to strike in this uh, legal uh, bargaining process. Um, and the, um, And the point is, with the, this instrument of social collective agreements, um, unions, or unions can um, uh, can demand. Uh, or this this instrument gives. If, if if a union demands a social collective agreement uh, uh, to the management, it has the right to strike for something that, for example, is uh, uh, severance payments or a further um, further further. Uh, um, uh, training measures, so it, it 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 makes in the end the union stronger uh, to to uh, to demand these things. And the other uh, two examples um, are from um, let's say um, uh, the arena of of uh, of the company, and that's um, location negotiation uh, it, and, and from um, from Mercedes Benz and. One of them is, is a very interesting uh, conflict about uh, site closure uh, next to Berlin, but I, I, I won't go into detail, but I think the interesting thing is that, it, uh, that the work council managed it in a very conflictive way to, to prevent this <laughs> site closure. And the other uh, uh, comes uh, from, uh, from the um, um, general workers council in, in Mercedes too, and uh, they during um, or they they manage in a way to uh, to um, to create something that's called economic innovation and investment Con committee and that gives them uh, or that that strengthens the um, the information why that the German um, uh, work council have uh, to the to some kind of new fields like innovation and investment uh, uh, policy of the of the management but um, Let's go on with uh, the, uh, the main point, the collective agreements for the future. So, um, and I, I would say that that's the, uh, one of the most interesting uh, collective bargaining instruments of the, of the past decades, maybe. Uh, and it was agreed uh, in the 2021 uh, uh, bargaining round of metal and electronics industry. And I, I think it's interesting or innovative for at least three, three reasons. For, for, uh, the first reason could be that this uh, agreement for the futures uh, is kind of expansion of, um, of the code determination rights that uh, work councils in Germany have beyond the legal framework. Because it offers uh, the work council the opportunity to um, to work together on future concepts of the different sites together uh, with the management in order to uh, to make sites uh, independent from combustion engine technology. Technology. That's one point. The other, or the next point is that, or the next argument is that um, it has kind of a, a anti anti uh, cyclical alignment. Which, which means that normally um, competition pacts and the negotiation about competition pacts uh, begins when, um, well, when the decision of the management is made and maybe the crisis just is about to happen. Uh, the new point here is that um, the employee side is involved in the negotiation about the uh, future of the site just before or when the crisis can still be prevented. Mm -hmm. And another point is, uh, interesting point is that uh, in a way, um, well, it captures an old uh, trade union demand, which is, which always was to give uh, a greater voice of what we can call producer knowledge in, uh, in, in business decisions. Um, but uh, yeah, nothing is, nothing is perfect and always, uh, we have some problems. So um, the data shows at the same time that this instrument, uh, well, is, is, we can say, um, is, has, is, has some limitations. Uh, and the first limitation is that, it's, uh, that you, most of these uh, collective agreements you find in what we can call the good old world of German uh, co-determination. Let's say in, 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 it's limited to foundation-owned big suppliers like Bosch, like Mahle, like ZF, um, with traditionally 
high-profile working councils with uh, well unionized uh, um, sites. So that's a big, big limitation. And the other limitation is that uh, to demand these uh, these agreements, uh, the union don't uh, doesn't have the right to strike. Okay. Um, Let's go on. Um, <coughs> the heart of these, uh, of these agreements is something that's called processes of common goal. So where uh, both management and uh, workers, works council decide about the future of the, of the site. And um, that's, if, if you have a look at, at the agreements, it's totally um, detailed and, and, and uh, well, well, complex processes, but I want to make two points that, in my opinion, are quite, quite important. And the one point that's crucial is that, uh, that's, that these processes are not only, um, they do not only just take place at the site level, but they are embedded in, let's say, decision-making um, processes at, at, the group, uh, at the group level of, of the company. And, um, and yeah, and that's precisely what um, uh, this uh, interrogation into, into a company uh, intercompany coordination, what makes it easier in the in the opinion of the work councils we talked uh, with, uh, which makes it, it easier to, uh, for example, deal with resistances of the side level of the local management. Um, that's one point. And um, yeah, okay. Then I will discuss the second uh, instrument. Uh, well. At least it, it, it's not, not, not an instrument of the, the uh, second uh, really interesting well, case. And that we can call centered, uh, company centered organizing campaigns, uh, which we have right now at, uh, that's the famous one uh, at, at Tesla next to Berlin. And the other, uh, well, interesting case is there's another uh, company centered uh, organizing campaign at uh, the Cuttle plant, the, uh, the Chinese battery producer in, in Erfurt. And um, yeah, IG Metall started uh, um, kind of an organizing campaign at Tesla, and that's interesting, in 2001, 2002, even before the plan, uh, uh, the plant, uh, well, had begun to, to produce. And uh, they they were kind of ready, and um, <clears throat> and um, interesting is that they have kind of a long term perspective, and uh, with like a two a six to eight, with kind of a six to eight uh, staff of well highly trained professional uh, um, officials. Uh, I would say that it's more or less one of the biggest uh, company-centered uh, organization campaigns in the history of the uh, IG Metall. Um, so far, so good. But um, yeah, well, as, as we all know um, from the examples of the US, uh, of the USA or Sweden, um, Tesla is, is very active in, in trying to prevent uh, unionize, unionization of the employees, uh, and in, in Germany, it's, it's the same. Um, can't go very into detail, but uh, the interesting point is for me is that they uh, they are doing it in Germany in a very 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 intelligent way. Uh, that's meant that instead of fighting um, the recognition of uh, the, uh, fighting the Works Council, they recognize them, and even um, um, yeah, and, and, and they are not only recognizing them, they are actively promoting the, uh, the, uh, the um, works, works Council. So, and that brings us to the point that, um, that uh, yeah, in a way, they are, they are very successful with this strategy in, in getting the IG Metall or IG Metall members out of, of uh, these uh, Works Councils. And um, so you can say that maybe the, the current works council that exists in, in, in the Tesla factory is not only considered uh, as, as very close to the, uh, to the management, it's also uh, considered as, as dysfunctional when it's about, uh, when it comes to represent the interests of, of the workforce. Um, but 
the good point is, or nevertheless, um, the organization process of IG Metall at, at, at Tesla was, well, it, was, it wasn't a huge success, but I would say that was considerably uh, successful because in a way they managed to uh, to um, to affiliate like a, a thousand workers which are now members of the IG Metall in the last year uh, which is, I think compared to to other uh, Tesla factory Tesla factories quite a lot and um, and uh, there was and that's interesting in, in October there was kind of a, a um, uh, a campaign that they did in the plant, and uh, these more or less two thousand of, of these unionized members showed in an official or in a public way that they are members of the IG Metall, while wearing kind of a sticker with a IG Metall symbol at uh, at their workers' um, uniform, at their workers' clothes, so everybody knew it. And it, for a, a, well, for working in a Tesla family, I think that it's quite quite something. So I come to the end, and uh, uh, no, this, yeah, um, conclusions. So maybe you can say that IG Metall and Works Council are able not only to uh, to adapt existing uh, the existing repertoire of instruments to the new situations, but they are able to to strengthen their uh, in these situations their uh, their power resources. But however, and that's quite clear uh, the range of these uh, instruments I talked about is, is quite uh, limited and, and I, I would say that the one or the basic problem remains uh, that we have in Germany is, is uh, lack of active industrial policy of the government uh, that accompanies uh, the change of uh, the change to e-mobility and especially uh, I, I don't know if, 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 if everybody knows after um, the ruling of the federal constitutional court on the uh, climate and transformation fund which was the money to um, let's say to um, that was that the government <coughs> wanted to spend on on uh, on the transformation and uh, and, and, this, and the consequent is that this fund, fund uh, is, 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 um, has a cut of 50% uh, to uh, 2.4 million, and that's a lot less than expected. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes Schulten. I think for me particularly, it was very interesting to hear what, what has been happening in the sector. Um, we'd like to discuss all the presentations together, but I would still like to um, see if there are any questions of comprehension uh, for what Johannes Schulten has presented. Does anybody have any specific questions where you didn't understand something that was presented? Excellent. Okay, then no. Then uh, we'll discuss that in the context of the others. So with that, I will hand the floor to uh, Sebastian Carbonell, who will tell us about the case of France. Thank you very much. I'll put down my time. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to present this um, this paper, these results, uh, which is uh, a, a report for ETUI co-written with uh, Tommaso Pardi. And uh, the question we, 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 we ask ourselves and the question that uh, Bella asked us is, uh, can electrification reverse the decline of the French automotive industry? And we will see that the answer is yes, but no. So uh, this is what I will be, de be detailing today. So I will be talking about first the general context of the deindustrialization of uh, the French automotive industry. Uh, first, its main causes and also the manifestations of this industrial decline. I will talk about then about the strategies of these different stakeholders and actors of the French automotive industry. First, OEMs and then trade unions. And then I will finish with um, new industrial projects in uh, electric powertrain and battery production that are supposed to mitigate the decline in the, in the number of employees in the French autom automotive industry. And I will end with, uh, with a conclusion more generally that tries to answer the question of um, can the automotive industry, can the European automotive industry be saved? And I will try to answer this question by not answering it, but saying more <laughs> who will control it actually, which is sometimes, uh, uh, which, which can be thought also as uh, one of the main uh, 
questions behind this, uh, this workshop. <coughs> and I, uh, there are three takeaways, three main points I will develop. First, electrification is actually accelerating the decline of the French automotive industry. Secondly, there is institutional innovation that could mitigate this decline. I will develop the case of Renault. But at the same time, there is a risk of a race to the bottom in employment and working conditions in an electrified auto industry in the context of uh, green jobs in the automotive industry. So, 20 years of uh, deindustrialization. I will be very fast here because it's something that is uh, quite known. Uh, there, is, um, there are two explanations as to why the French automotive industry uh, has been declining. Well, these are the main explanations according to me. Of course, there are other ones. But the first one is, of course, relocation of production of high volume products to uh, low cost countries, to the integrated periphery, as uh, Peter Pavlinen calls it, which is mainly uh, Central and Eastern Europe, Turkey, and also, uh, and more and more, actually, Maghreb countries, uh, notably Morocco and Algeria, and especially Morocco. And I will show this in the first uh, figure. You can see here the share of uh, French production in France, of, uh, of French cars produced in France, that has been steadily declining um, from the early 2000s to the 2020s. And the share of this production in Turkey, Morocco, and Algeria that has been steadily uh, rising. And at the same time, you can also see the share of uh, production in um, Czechia, Slovakia, Romania, and Slovenia. Uh, voilà. This is uh, apparently a very clear figure, as you can see, the, of this decline in production in France. The second reason is um, something that uh, Tommaso Pardi and also some other colleagues of uh, Gerpisa have been calling this upmarket drift, or also premiumization of the, of the automotive industry, which is, uh, well, Tommaso will detail this uh, a little bit later today, the fact that uh, the automotive industry has chosen a strategic path or more of a profit strategy centered around heavy, uh, powerful performance and also, and above all, expensive vehicles. Uh, you can see it here in these very, in these different, uh, different figures also the, the, the price, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the mass, the engine power uh, that of uh, vehicles has been uh, steadily uh, increasing in the single market. And this has contributed to uh, the squeezing of uh, the shares of um, generalist manufacturers, which are French manufacturers, in, among others, which are Renault and Peugeot, of um, Stellantis today. You can see this uh, a little bit more clearly in this, uh, in this figure, where you can also see the share of Stellantis and uh, Renault of, um, of uh, sales declining, and you can see the others rising, especially uh, with um, new actors emerging that have been squeezing out uh, French OEMs, French manufacturers. Notably, you can see Tesla rising and also Chinese brands uh, rising, uh, rising uh, in, the, in the last uh, decade. So, you can, we, we can summarize this strategy in something that uh, Luca De Meo, uh, the CEO of Renault, something that he said in uh, September 2020 in front of unions. It was, this was in the Central uh, Workers Committee in Paris, when, where he said, I'd rather produce 50,000 premium vehicles than uh, 200,000 vehicles that don't make any money. Um, for me, this really summarizes this, this, uh, this uh, upmarket drift in a certain way. But at the same time, three years later, he kind of began changing his, um, his point of view on, uh, on the st on profit strategy of Renault. And he began saying that actually making vehicles, small vehicles, was a good idea. And this is something that we can see behind the creation of uh, a new subsidiary of Renault, which is electricity, which I will develop a little bit later. Again, manifestations of this decline. First, you can see the decline in production in, of passenger cars uh, of Renault and Stellantis between 20, 20, uh, 2003 and 2021. And you can also see the decline in the workforce, more specifically, uh, 
also in the in the right of the of the screen where you can see that uh, temporary workers which is the top uh, blue uh, color uh, are only partially compensating the the fall of um, permanent workers in the automotive industry and lastly you can see also this uh, the manifestation of this decline in the in the left, where you can see the decline of the share of French exports in extra EU trade motor vehicles, which means it's, this is the share of the contribution of French production to exports outside of the European Union in French uh, in, in car productions, uh, which was around 10% uh, in, in 2004, and today it's around 2.8, more or less. And again, on the right, you can see the negative trade balance of the French uh, automotive industry, a uh, trade balance that has been increasingly negative uh, with um, electrification, as you can see, with uh, the share of uh, uh, plug-in vehicles um, uh, emerging also in, in around uh, 2020, 2019. So what are the strategies of the different actors? And this is, this is where I come to, to look at DMAO again. Uh, there are two strategies, basically. The strategy of Renault is the creation of pure players. <coughs> this is the case with the creation first of Electricity, uh, which is the name of the subsidiary that uh, puts together three assembly plants in the north of France, Douai, Maubeuge, and Ruiz. Uh, Ruiz is actually a mechanical site where they produ produce gearboxes. And this happened through the negotiation of a new collective agreement in June 2021, actually, not 2023. And this was a more of a classical agreement, a concession bargaining in a certain way, where uh, the maintenance of production was obtained in exchange of, over time, lower salaries and increase in the number of working days. And I should also add a, a new kind of segmentation of the workforce with hires uh, that are, as they say, m the market price, which is a uh, lower uh, salary for new, uh, for new entrants. On the other side, you have, uh, sorry, uh, I will finish on Renault. Uh, this strategy was pursued a little bit later. In last November, Renault announced a new segmentation of the firm between, on the one side, Ampere, which is dedicated exclusively to the manufacturing of uh, electric vehicles. Um, it's the same three factories mentioned before with another one, which is Cléon, which is an engine manufacturing uh, site that will manufacture the electric engines for Ampère. And on the other hand, you, you have Horse, which is actually a joint venture with Gili, uh, in which Renault uh, has a new subsidiary, so this is really like a poupe russe, you would say in French, uh, where there is this uh, new subsidiary of Renault called Power that will share with Gili uh, the, um, the control over horse. And it's, it's dedicated especially, especially, specifically sorry, to the manufacturing of internal combustion engine vehicles outside of France. <laughs> voilà. And you have the other, uh, the other strategy we, we, of uh, Stellantis, which is more or less of a non-strategy in a certain sense, or more or less the continuation of the previous strategy, which is the pursuing of the decline. For example, just recently in December, uh, Stellantis announced a joint venture with Lib Motor, which is a Chinese, um, Chinese firm, not for the manufacturing, but for the import of entry range BEVs uh, that are manufactured in China. Voilà. Uh, well, this, uh, these are, again, figures not very, very, very important. Actually, they, they, we should um, regroup them according to geographical sectors, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, uh, and the peripheral countries, where you can also see, um, the, this is more specifically, you can see in 2023, the share of electric uh, vehicles, uh, which are also unfavorable to the French uh, automotive industry. So what are unions doing in face of this situation? And we come again to the question of uh, institutional innovation and also uh, union participation to this transition, the, which is very interesting because trade unions are doing something that they are not very used to do, which is uh, formulate alternatives, industrial alternatives to the ones of management, because trade unions in France and in the French industrial relations system, trade unions do not negotiate on other things that are 
salaries or um, working time. Usually, usually trade unions focus on these two main subjects and working conditions, of course, but not on product architecture or uh, technological, technological change. <clears throat> However, in this context, when we could say that they are put behind the, the back behind the wall, they formulated uh, industrial alternatives. <clears throat> this is the case of uh, the CGT Renault, and they proposed an industrial plan of reindustrialization through the production of a small electric vehicle uh, based on the Twingo, and uh, that would cost uh, less than 15,000 euros without subsidies, the hiring of 4,000 employees, and also the maintenance partly of ICEVs, <coughs> saying that BEVs and ICEVs are not incompatible, and also the use of uh, gas and bioethanol for thermal vehicles. And on the other hand, you have the CFDT Metallurgy with uh, the Fondation Nicolas Hulot, which is a think tank. Sorry? We, they changed the name because uh, he was accused of uh, uh, <laughs> harassment, etc. Okay, so um, the CFDT Metallurgy uh, defended, uh, also produced a report defending uh, the strategy for a just transition through a pact, this time a deal in a certain way between trade unions, governments, and OEMs. Uh, around, for example, the, the guaranteed purchases of uh, French manufactured vehicles by the state, by organisms of the state, and also a new ambitious industrial policy. And now I come to the final elements of the presentation. There are new industrial projects in electric powertrain and battery productions that are also thought of a way of mitigating this decline. Uh, you have the, um, the ACC, the Gigafactory of ACC in Douvran, which promises 1,200 uh, jobs. However, <clears throat> there are many problems with the creation of this new, uh, new industrial site. The first one is that only a fraction of uh, workers employed before will be employed in this new uh, Gigafactory. And also working conditions, employment and working conditions will be worse, and trade unions expect a drop in wages by 20 and 25%. And again, you have uh, the same configuration with mechanical sites. For example, Tremery and Metz are two assembly sites of gearboxes and mechanical engines, uh, internal combustion engines. And Stellantis uh, pr um, came up with uh, two joint ventures, the first one is uh, e-motors, and the second one is uh, e-transmissions. And again, only yeah. one third of uh, employees in these uh, previous sites will be employed in the new sites. So the, 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 the unions are very worried about this. And Renault also created a joint venture with Mint, which is also a Chinese uh, firm for gearboxes and, and gears in Ruiz. However, the company has not announced uh, the number of employees that will be employed in this new um, new site, but we can expect uh, regarding the other sites that it will only be a fraction of the production. One last thing, and I will conclude. Uh, this is all happening thanks to um, instruments of uh, social dialogue, which is the uh, voluntary redundancy plans, which were implemented in 2017 by Emmanuel Macron. Uh, and um, it's, a, it's an instrument for employers to uh, reduce employment without, recur without uh, uh, having to put in place uh, redundancy plans. These are not economic layoffs. These are more of a voluntary redundancy plan. So workers accept a sum of money in exchange of uh, departure. So it's less expensive for the employers and also uh, less uh, costly in terms of uh, judiciary uh, process. So, these are the conclusions of our report. Who can save the French automotive industry, but also we can ask ourselves who will control it? This will be the last thing I will say. First, uh, entry-level vehicles will continue to be produced in peripheral countries. Luca Di Mio announced, for example, that a small electric vehicle will be assembled, not in France, but in Slovakia. OEMs will continue to negotiate uh, collective agreements unfavorable, unfavorable for workers. Uh, and this is linked to the next thing. Um, French labor law has become an instrument of managing the decline. 
the industrial decline. However, trade unions have begun to take a stance in the public arena on electrification through the expertise, through these reports and industrial uh, plans, uh, alternative plans. Employment has been central to the discussions of um, electrification. However, this can obscure the issues of the quality of these green jobs. And finally, there is a rising importance of Chinese capital in the French automotive industry. It began in 2014 with the entrance of Dongfeng in the capital of PSA. But I mentioned different uh, cases today with Mint for Renault Ruiz, Horse with, um, with uh, Renault and Gili, and again Lib Motor with uh, Stellantis. Voilà, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian Cabonoy. That was a, a, a different story from what we heard for the German, but, but full, of, full of nuance and details, and particularly the role of the state, which I think in the next presentation we'll hear some more about from Bob Hanke, looking more at policy instruments. Mm -hmm. The state didn't, didn't come off very well in, this, uh, in, in the story that Sebastian was just telling us. Before we move on, are there any questions of comprehension or detail from what Sebastian Cabonoy shared with us about France? Yes. So this, cha this change in mindset about strategic questions, is that a little bit comparable to what Johannes told us about this last element, the, um, the committee of, of, of strategy and economic decision making? From the point of view... determination in a more uh, economic uh, context. Uh, there is no co-determination in France, absolutely not. Um, the Workers' Council can, can express their point of view in, on, uh, it's called uh, information consultation, information consultation. So they have, they have the right to, 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 to give an opinion on the uh, economic strategy of the, firm, strategy of the firm, but they cannot influence it directly. However, this case of these reports that are more addressed publicly is something that has been changing inside of uh, the French uh, trade unions. Usually what they do is that they, they have the right in the labor law to, um, to do expertise thanks to uh, Sandex, Secafi, Sandex, of our consulting firms that work with unions to produce expertise. However, this was not directly the case. This was more of an independent uh, effort to produce uh, uh, knowledge and uh, or, or and alert alternatives. So there is a little bit of change, but I, we will see if this is something that uh, that is rather new or if it's just um, as you say in French, an éclair dans un ciel serein, a lightning in a blue sky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that, Bob. What can you tell us about the policy instruments uh, in France? I have Clicker, the power, the, there it the is. The thing that controls the entire yeah. room. Exactly. <laughs> Which one do I push? On the right? Here? The, on the other side. Turn, uh, turn around. Turn around. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> As you see, I'm not used to doing PowerPoint presentations. Um, this is the best I can do, by the way. Just <laughs> um, What I want to do is, is talk a bit about basically the, the role of the state, but the role of the state in light of the discussions that we had here in France. Now, th there's, a, there's a way that you can think, think about this that helps even those who couldn't care less about what the French state does, why they should be, be interested in this, which is that it's probably the most activist state still, despite all the, the, the collapse of industrial planning and all that over the last years, in Western Europe. So if you're going to look for the possibilities, you look there. If there are no if nothing happens there, it means the possibilities are relatively small. That's the, the methodological sort of status of this, this kind of a case, if you want. Now let's let's back back up for a moment. Why do we care about industrial policy? Well, basically because what we know is that all transitions are hard. We try to forget that once the transitions are behind us, but we know they are hard. Think of what happened in Central Europe over the last 35 uh, years or, or, almost now. What you see is that essentially you go from one <laughs> economic system, one industrial system, one, one, one po political economic system, I would say, to another one. That means that you have to reorganize the factors of production that are underlying what you're doing into another mix. Now, 
you know, you start with particular types of skills and particular types of capital, and you want to go somewhere else. Instead of making tanks and tractors, you want to make washing machines. Well, you can't really use the skills from the past and the, the machines from the past. In the, you can't gradually change them. And we have here with the electric transition exactly the same problem. Since you can't gradually add an electric car you know, say that you make 500 cars a day on an assembly line, you can't add one car and 499 internal combustion engines, then two, then three, that, that's not how it works. You have a, n a new combination of skills and in, uh, with, with, with capital and probably organizational models underlying it. One of the problems with the uh, transition at the moment is that supply chains are being restructured as we speak and that is often um, what, what the, the effects of that are, what you see in what S Sebastian was ta talking about is that the um, workforce in the car industry itself shrinks, but is beginning to boom in a lot of other places. And so you sort of have a reconstruction of the sector, of the organization, of skills and of cap capital. And that, the, the best way to think about it is that if you have, as it were, on one axis, capital and on the other skills, so sophisticated or high or low, it doesn't really matter. And you're at this point, the curve goes like, like that. You can't walk down that curve. You need to go down to another combination and then go out to the combination of skills and capital that you're looking for. And that means that any transition is going to be extremely hard. Now, why is this um, so in itself? So what's the, the, the big deal? You know, uh, um, a minister of finance or of the economy would say um, markets will sort that out. The problem is not only that that would be a massive s social cost that I think very few will of us in this room would be happy with. But markets are actually not particularly good at dealing with these situations because the transition means that you go from a relatively certain arrangement, you may not like it, but it is a certain arrangement, to a quite uncertain arrangement. Just think for the time being, think about battery standards, charging infrastructure, training systems and all that. We don't know what we will need there. We, we, we're setting battery standards for te technology for, that, that was very important um, yesterday. We don't know what battery development over the next few years is going to be. If you don't know what you're investing in, what do you do? You don't invest. Well, some people do. We, we saw that with the dot-com boom. But that's basically the fundamental point. There's so much uncertainty in this whole process that markets and companies themselves, you see how the, the mayor, he flips left, he flips right, he goes up, he goes down. He talks about any possible strategy that he can imagine because fundamentally between us, he's got no clue either. Yeah? These people make the future, but they, don't, but they make it under very um, and under conditions of extremely high uncertainty. And that's a very important thing to, to bear in mind. Because if capitalists do not invest, we don't get economic growth. You don't get economic growth, you don't get employment. So the whole cycle sort of begins to, to work from, from that point. And that's why we, we think about one of the solutions um, in this kind of a question as industrial po policy. And think of, for a mo sit, sit back for a moment, think of what Joe Biden has done in the United States with the IRA. Essentially, if, if I'm right here, okay, yeah? If I'm right here, what he has done is he has massively reduced the economic and, and uh, un uncertainty for um, all the actors in the car industry to invest in, in the future. Not by telling them what to do, that would not be... I, I also, I, I am a not averse to intervention, but I'm not sure under the conditions that people like me should be making the decisions and you know, policy makers everywhere. Markets are good at sorting out uncertainty if you push them. And that's what Joe Biden did. He created the market so that now investors can start investing in R&D, can start investing in industrialization, in skills and so, so on. <coughs> that's the fundamental thing that the IRA has done per dollar that was invested Three dollars come from the pri private sector. I rest my case. That's why we need industrial po policies, right? Now, what you, um, oh, just one thing. There is a lot of talk about other considerations for industrial po policy, like, dare I say, open strategic aut autonomy. The problem with that is not that it's wrong. The problem is that it's economically illiterate. There is a, there is a fundamental economic problem. Now, we may want to sacrifice some of the economic gains. I have no problem with that. I, you know, uh, there, there is, that's a political choice that we have to make. But we shouldn't act as if it is a so solution to an economic problem. Prices will rise if you make, um, if you produce goods in 
in Europe that are currently produced outside. There's practically no way. There are some accounting pro problems, for example, environmental costs are not fully ta taken on board. You know, it cannot be true that ships that are made in Taiwan are transported to Europe and have no environmental costs. In fact, shipping is one of the most polluting industries in, in the world. So there are some things that you could account for, but fundamentally, by, by trying to enter a market um, that, that uh, sorry, but fu fundamentally by stopping trade, you also run the risk of destroying comparative advantages, which usually lead to lower prices. So if you stop that, then inflation is going to be just around the corner. It's not entirely clear how you, you, you handle that. The same thing when you think about semiconductor fabrication in Europe. 20 billion for a semiconductor plant is a lot of money, and that's before you make a single chip. And then you sell those chips at margins that are so small that you really, I don't think you should be entering that kind of a market. So you need to think about how to build strategic alliances, it seems to me, rather than bring it all back home. But, you know, I've been saying that for several years now. People begin to listen, but it usually <laughs> took me 20 years. No, never mind. <laughs> now, why is it? So that's the background to the whole thing. That's why we have industrial policy. But, you know, as the... You know, as people have always pointed out, that's the, the general story. History and context matters, right? And so in France, what you have had over the last, whatever, since the Second World War, some people say since, what is it, Louis XVI or something called Colbert's prime, prime minister, minister of finance, who sort of came up with the first Grand pro Projet. I'm a bit more modest. I think de, de Gaulle had more to do with that. You have this big <coughs> planning system. That was the way that France thought of industrial po policy. It wasn't ent entirely stupid. The, the goal said, we are not a modern nation. In order to become a modern nation, we need to have economic mo modernization. Economic modernization meant Fordism and ta Taylorism. So all, we, we go all out on what, what that implies for the kind of industries that we, we have in France. And, you know, poof, Renano was born, or na 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 nationalized. Now, <clears throat> France has always had an industrial policy since the Second World War, which had these ca characteristics that I, that I put there. First of all, um, it targets large firms. This is, this is important because oh, th these things are important not because history matters, it does, but because this is the framework that is basically transplanted mm -hmm. from how f French uh, policymakers think about industrial policy into the questions of today. And that has implications for the discussion that implicitly Se Sebastien and I are, are, are ha having here. Um, as a result of the concentration on large firms and the te te technological kind of advances that follow with that, many other actors in this whole transition or in, in the industrial policy area, they're falling by the wayside. So small firms in France were, to a large extent, extremely what, what we call Malthusian. They just about survived till the next day. They then had a, you know, had a had an order. Then they survived for another three months, and so you know they didn't think long-term and strategic. This is night and day. Those of you who know the German mi Mittelstand immediately see, well, what the French did is exactly how you shouldn't do these, these things, right? Same thing for workers. They were basically treated as almost a fixed co commodity. The, 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 the semi-skilled is, is a big word. The, the specialized worker, as it was called, basically did one task on an assembly line, and that was the, 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 the job and the skills that were necessary for that. Regions were not really thought of as strategic assets either. If you look at the map of France, or the, the hexagon, as it is called, you start in the north uh, uh, west and you go to the southeast, you, you draw that line. Industry is practically all on the, on the north of that. There's, there's very little. I, I live in the southwest. It's, it's very quiet. It's very pleasant. There's nothing going. It's actually moving a bit at, at the moment. There's practically nothing going on. And that means that half of France is, is the France that you you remember from the holidays and the, you know, <coughs> sitting in the, Do the Dordogne and all that. That's that France where nothing ever happens, right? And, uh, and, then, uh, and then basically, so basically that was the setup for industrial po policy in France before um, 
this big tra transition is engaged. I, I skip over the 20 years that you weren't allowed to use the word industrial po policy in Europe without being shot at, but you know, we, we are now back where that discussion goes. And what you find is that, um, <clears throat> that there's a lot going on. There's one thing you can say about the French state is that it moves around a lot, right? It's, Louis de Funé, in my view, always captured the, the, the nervosity of the French state. So, 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 those, the young, for the younger um, pe people in the audience, Louis de Funé is like Asterix, but just 2,000 years later. Right? And so you, you think of Sarkozy, you see the, 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 the energy of, of Macron, he wants to move, move everything around. So there's always a lot going on. But the fundamental thing is that most of that is targeted, is, is highly concentrated. First of all, it goes almost solely to a few, few important sectors, but a few sectors. And in that, two large firms in those sectors. So, I mean, the car industry, <laughs> I mean, there are no small firms in the car industry in the standard sense, in, you know, that Re Renault and Pe Peugeot, Citroën Romain at, at the time, Stella Atlantis are the ones. But the, and, and some of the, the large suppliers that, that have become large as a result of the non-industrial policy, policy of the 1980s and 90s, when um, the large car manufacturers forced the suppliers to become bigger so that they had a critical mass that allowed them to develop to, to do research and development on, on their own. But most of the small suppliers, and there are a lot of them, remember the story I told you about these Malthusian small, small firms, most of those, they are completely fall out of the scope of industrial po policy. Let, let, let me give you, I'll, I'll give you one number. The, I, Bela, the, the papers will be on the, on the, on the website soon, right? So in, in the paper are all the figures if you want. But I'll, I'll give you one. The French go government has a, has a green transition fund. I think it's, it's only green, yes. Well, sort of, you can't really separate the, the two, but let's just call, call it that. For small firms, that is of the, the astronomical sum of 300 million euros. For all sectors in the, um, in, in the green tra transition. That's all, um, it's not quite pe peanuts, but it's not far off. If you think of the, the scale of the problem that we have, Donald Trump pays more in fines on an average day than what the French state gives small firms, right? So this is the important thing here, is that these stories, <coughs> they basically, they reflect to a large extent what's going on at the moment, reflects to a large extent what happened, what was set in motion or sort of the framework that was organized <coughs> 70 years ago or so, right? <laughs> and that's, that's a very important bit because that logic that says te technology plus large firms gets us through the tra transition and everything else will be sucked into that, that, that vortex that you cre create, that, that logic is still a, a, essentially the same. And you can see that then in what you could think of as just transition po policies, which is that there are very few and far between. I think Se Sebastian has done me a great, great favor because he's just listed all the ones I know. I don't think there is much more going on. So it's basically Renault, which for all kinds of historical reasons has to negotiate lots of things with lots of people all the time. And that's basically it, right? And then there are some individual things. What happens is that, um, 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 is that basically the, what we think of the, the just transition, of, you know, a transition into <clears throat> a net zero economy that involves social dialogue between employers and employees, which actually should be business and, and employees and unions and employers. That's the sort of the, a different thing because employers are not the drivers in this story. So they sort of follow what happens, whereas unions can be, uh, you know, as, as we see in some con con countries, um, and, and that's it. But they, they follow the rules that already exist in French labor law. And, and Sebastien yeah, rightly pointed out many of those rules are not what we would call ge generous rules, right? I mean, they are extremely tight. So the standard information consultation kind of rules that you would use for just about anything from, you know, where the Coca-Cola machine goes to big restructuring, those are exactly the same rules. So this is not really a lever that you can pull to get into a just tran tran transition that takes on board all those things. There's maybe one small, you know, if you want bright spot, is that at least it looks like 
a, a, a social graveyard can be avoided because <clears throat> the duration of the transition, 10, 10 odd years, and the age py pyramid means that you could probably sort out most of the restructuring by simply not replacing workers that you let, let go. I mean, at least that's, you know, like, like I always say, it's a, it's a, each one of those that you avoid is a drama. Uh, avoid it is not insignificant. But let's not call that a just transition, okay? This is very important. We're not, not talking about active sort of interventions to make sure that these things work. And then, you know, the, the problem is that um, um, since existing plants are hard to um, to convert immediately while you keep... Okay, the, the economics of the... <clears throat> of the electric car are, are simple. If you build internal combustion engine cars, you make a lot of money on the internal combustion engine cars. And Tomaso will give us some of the details la later on, I suppose, because most of the thoughts that I have on that, I, I, picked, I stole from him, I will admit that. Maybe, uh, you know. so, electric cars cost a lot of money. So what do you do if you want to finance electrification of the car industry? You sell more of the internal combustion engine cars because that's that those are the cash cows until you've started to write off the investment in electric cars. But that means that you cannot easily convert existing plants. You you either build new plants not far away, that, that that's a possibility because some of the parts are the same, right? I mean seats and tires are not, not very different between electric and 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 and, um, and traditional cars. But some are um, um, just not, it's not feasible. And many of the suppliers are tied in effectively <clears throat> are through the strategy that the, the, the OEMs are developing to stick with internal combustion engine for as long as possible. The small firms are tied into that te te technology themselves. They, don't, they often don't have funds to reconvert their own operations. And the effect is that when the electric transition is sort of reaching its end, well, that's then goodbye to those small firms, right? Okay, that, that's one thing. But it has one small, small potential bright spot, and that's what I was saying about the area where, where I live, um, is that you see now that regions that were underdeveloped in the past in France, that they are beginning to get a new lease on, or new lease on industrial life because many of the existing suppliers are not really capable of making the transition themselves. So new suppliers begin to show up. It's not in big, big numbers, but we are early days in the whole thing. And that's basically it. But the bottom line is, is relatively simple. Um, lots of policies, but very few that are not uh, 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 sort of di directed at the center of the operation that deal with, with workers, that deal with suppliers, and that deal with sort of the re regional effects. Thank you. Um, thank, you very, thank you very much, Bob Anke. It was a very good compliment, I think, to what uh, Sebastian was saying about the specific case studies and certainly pointed to a lot of important differences between France uh, and, and Germany in particular. Before we uh, take a look at the European perspective with uh, Benjamin Dini, uh, does anybody have any questions of comprehension to what Bob was saying about French policy? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, but you, you still need to speak a bit louder. I okay. don't hear as well as I can. Uh, yeah, thank you Too very many much. Bruce Springsteen <laughs> Uh, thank you for the very informative and entertaining presentation. I think everyone appreciated that. Um, yeah, you mentioned the IRA and uh, Net Zero Industry Act was somehow a reaction to the IRA from the EU perspective and the STEP now as well. And the automotive sector apparently with the electric pro propulsion engines will be in the scope of the Net Zero Industry Act. Um, so the, the uh, act doesn't create a new fund uh, it just reallocates the funds that already exist. Do you think that this would be enough for the automotive transition in this period, or that it should be taken at the national level differently, or at the European level differently? Like, what would be your perception of that? I'll, I'll give you the very short version, because the very long ver version will keep us here for a few days. But the, the fundamental point, I think, is that you... So, I think... 
What does Biden do? <clears throat> Biden says, let's not deal with what car manufacturers do di directly. Let's deal with the entire infrastructure that's sitting outside. A, a, a transition of this sort has what we call net network effects. In order to run an electric car, you need batteries. So you need a battery e ecosystem, as they love to call it here, right? And then you need a charging infrastructure. So you need a plan for char charging infrastructure. You need some agreement on te te technical standards. So all these other things are necessary in order for that thing that you really want to operate. And what Biden has done is looked at the second order things rather than the, than the first or pr primarily. I mean, there is some subsidy for electric cars and all that. And it's not even all that obvious whether they will be enough. But it's very important for if you want electric cars to go ahead, that you have all these other things around. And so in that sense, what, what, what the, the US has done strikes me as, in, in my view, is the right way to handle this problem. <clears throat> Direct subsidies to car manufacturers maybe for a few years if you really want to, but it, that's not the solution. That's more like that's a way of dealing with a problem that emerges in the short term. But I don't think that's a long term so, solution, no. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, before we open up everything for discussion, uh, Benjamin Denis, from the perspective of Industrial, we've heard two very different stories and ways in which particularly the trade unions uh, have approached these challenges. The role of the state is a very different one. What do you do as Industrial with that? What is your perspective on that? Yeah, first, uh, thank you very much for the three really interesting presentations. Um, as Industrial Europe, um, we first see that the transition is already uh, going on. Uh, we see um, OEMs announcing uh, restructuring plans. Uh, we see uh, first and foremost suppliers announcing uh, restructuring plans. Read the news. Uh, it's uh, ZF, it's Bosch, uh, all the, the companies that uh, Juan Sebastian and um, uh, Johannes have, have mentioned have recently announced uh, job losses. So it's already there. Uh, for us, the point is not, of course, to, to challenge uh, the need to decarbonize. Uh, we don't discuss uh, climate reduction objectives. We don't uh, challenge the ICE uh, phase-out date for passenger cars and, and vans. 2035, we take it for granted also because we believe that workers uh, require uh, stability. Uh, if we want to create and trigger investments, we need some kind of predictability regarding the technologies that will be allowed. So if we change every six months, um, the rule of the games, because someone in a big country has decided that he would like to continue to use a certain category of fuels to be allowed to uh, drive his sport car during the weekends with his mates, uh, we don't think that it will create the kind of enabling environment we need to entail trigger long-term investment uh, to transform the assembly lines, to transform uh, the plants also in the supply, uh, supply chain. Um, we also... Um, I think important to remind that um, the so-called good old days are gone. Um, our members do not ask us to continue to produce uh, diesel Passat for the next two centuries. Our members will not come with <laughs> huge trucks and cars and block Brussels during two days asking the Commission to continue to pollute as much as they can for the next decades. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, no, <laughs> we want the uh, EU policy makers and the member states, member states have a role to play here too, uh, to create the environment we need, the policy framework we need to make the transition working. From an industrial <laughs> policy perspective, I will say a word about Net Zero Industry Act and financing in a moment, but also from a social perspective. Um, but it's also worth keeping in mind that things are changing not only because of policies, but, be, but because the society is changing. Technologies are changing. Um, look at the model uh, share of cars in a city like Brussels. It has dropped by more than 10% in 10 years. Again, we are not going to organize large demonstration asking for people to buy cars and use cars because we want them to use cars. No, it would be completely stupid. In the 80s, when the computer replaced the typewriting machines, the unions didn't organize demonstrations to block the rollout of 
uh, computers in the street. No, they tried to train their people, they tried to think about what it means in terms of work organization, in terms of um, uh, training, retraining program, or working conditions. And this is basically, in a different context, of course, what we are trying to do uh, when it comes to the automotive sector. First, when it comes to uh, industrial policy, um, part of our job is to engage in discussions with the EU and with member states to ask to have a European uh, industrial policy to support the Green Deal agenda. Nothing is perfect in this world, but if we can celebrate something in, the la in what the Commission has done, has achieved during the last uh, uh, five years, we can welcome the fact that industrial policy, industrial strategy is back on the agenda. Of course, it's not the Plan Mesmer, huh, what, the France, uh, what France uh, did in the 70s to uh, roll out uh, the nuclear uh, supply chain, so it's something different. We have a series of initiatives, I cannot mention all of them. We have industry alliances, we have the uh, Net Zero Industry Act, the Critical Raw Materials Act, that are legally binding instruments. These are regulations. Regulations means that uh, you create legal obligation for member states. So member states will have to act because of legally binding texts. Uh, so this is something we, we, we have to, to, to welcome. In the same way, an important challenge we have to deal with is skills. Uh, Bob rightly mentioned the demographic challenge we have ahead of us. I always like to remind it that the median age in the EU nowadays is 44 years old. When I realized that I was on the wrong side of the median <laughs> age, it was a bit of a shock for me, but this is the reality we have to cope with. Turkey, <laughs> it moves up. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's moving up. Yeah. And in Turkey, uh, for me and for the EU as well, but if you look at Turkey, the median age is just above 30, 32, 33, if I remember well. Look at Morocco, Maghreb, just below 30 years old as a median age. So we live in an aging society. And the same, uh, it's, and it's even more true if you look at the age profile of the industrial workers, mm -hmm. and especially in the automotive industry, and especially in some countries like France and Italy. Mm -hmm. So this is something we have to uh, deal with. Two, the um, Commission and the EU has launched a series of uh, initiatives in terms of skills. You might have heard about the Automotive Skills Alliance. It's part, part of the game. Now, um, to try to also discuss what uh, Juan Sebastian um, uh, and uh, Johannes showed. Um, I think that the transition is not only a technological uh, and policy-driven transition, it's also the whole economic system, the whole economic model which is changing at the same time. And when I was reading the, the title of the, of the conference before, uh, before coming, uh, can the future of the European automotive industry still be saved? Uh, there is a kind of sense of urgency, a bit of drama behind that sentence. But actually, I invite you to look at the financial results that uh, OEMs have announced for the last two years. Uh, we are still waiting for BMW and the German um, uh, OEMs that will publish their financial results um, in March. But uh, Renault, Stellantis have uh, both published uh, their uh, 2023 financial results in February, and it's absolutely impressive. Absolutely impressive. The margins are increasing. The return on uh, capital employed, the so-called Roche of Renault, has reached historical record, and they announced uh, for 2025 uh, to go beyond 30 percent of return on, on, on capital employed, which is something almost unprecedented if in history of capitalism. So there is a kind of <coughs> striking contrast between the shrinking uh, volumes, between the shrinking uh, employment hours, and the historical profits made by OEM. What does that mean? It means, I think, that we are also witnessing a transformation of capitalism. A transformation of capitalism for different reasons. Uh, I think part of the, uh, the explanation is indeed maybe to be found in the quite intense competition that car makers are in at global level. 
also in the in the EU with with Chinese automakers trying to uh, yeah <laughs> come to the I was looking for the right word uh, <laughs> trying to, to to sell more and more cars in, in in Europe and worldwide, but there is also a question we should ask ourselves: Where is the power in the company in 2024? Um, of course, as trade unions, we want the power to be on our side. We want to use our capacities, uh, or, or, or the, the different entities that exist to uh, negotiate, discuss with employers. We want to extend that power by bringing more people into trade unions. The building trade union power, the organizing agenda is a quite important agenda on our side. Mm -hmm. But we have all, also have to look a bit beyond that. And it's absolutely striking to see the power of the shareholder structure mm -hmm. in the strategies of, of OEMs. Um, the uh, capital OEMs have to mobilize to uh, steer and, and trigger transition is so high that they also have to deal with a series of financial actors that have extremely high requirements in terms of return on investment. And it has a series of <laughs> consequences <laughs> on suppliers, mm. because more and more uh, suppliers have to make pressure on cost to comply with those pressures. Um, a series of OEMs simply say, OK, to stay competitive, uh, we need to supply more and more from other regions in, sometimes in Europe, most of the time out of, out of Europe. Mm -hmm. And it has also consequences on employment and working conditions. Mm -hmm. And we see in a series of countries uh, extreme flexibility taking place with uh, <coughs> um, um, long working weeks, uh, six or, or seven working weeks, workers being almost on call, uh, learning uh, in the evening that they have to come uh, the day after at the, at the plant. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, extreme cut programs, uh, sometimes also touching the basic occupational health and safety or hygiene of uh, installations, such as we have heard in, in Italy, for instance. So this is a bit the reality we have to, uh, to cope with nowadays. And it's not really easy uh, to push back this deep and quick transformation with the usual traditional uh, tools that we have and just to not be misunderstood i still believe that those traditional instruments remain valid and extremely important they shouldn't be overlooked but we also need to be much stronger on one key aspect which is how do we combine the industrial policy agenda with the labor and social agenda mm -hmm. and here we that the eu we believe has missed an opportunity during this mandate in setting high social conditionalities when designing uh, its answer to the industrial um, um, inflation reduction act sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and here i i i would like to to uh, bounce on on what bob rightly said um, i mean in the if the eu wants to be kind of competing with what joe biden uh, and biden administration has delivered with the Inflation Reduction Act, it's not only a matter of subsidies, it's also a matter of better combining the climate agenda, the industrial agenda with the social agenda. Because if you look closely to the Infra Inflation Reduction Act, you have a series of mechanisms that uh, ensure that the, uh, the yeah, industrial and, and green investments will also have a series of social benefits for uh, regions that have been uh, hardly hit by uh, this industrialization companies might receive an extra um, grant an extra uh, amount of support if they invest in those regions in the same way companies organizing um, quality apprenticeship uh, get also extra support. We have also um, uh, provisions uh, providing extra support for, co for companies respecting the kind of collective bargaining system in the, in the US. All these elements, if you look carefully at the Net Zero Industry Act, are just optional. You have mm -hmm. a series of conditions and yeah, uh, project providers, uh, project leaders have to tick one of the boxes uh, in, 
and, and the social <laughs> conditionality is, is just one, one aspect. And this is really a pity. This is really a pity because it's not only about money. Mm. I mean, if you look the amount of money which is currently pouring down in France, in Germany, look at the debate about Intel, look at the debate uh, uh, about the, 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 the state aids which uh, have been provided to Prologium uh, and Vision and so on and so forth to build their Liga factories. Uh, there is money. There is money. But the use of state aid in the EU triggers at least two discussions. The first one is what about regions and countries without the fiscal space to provide that kind of support. And there, obviously, step is far away from what is needed to support those regions that do not have the fiscal capacity to support their industry. And by the way, what also something which is extremely concerning in the discussion about STEP, because initially the Commission wanted to provide 10 billion euros of new and additional money. At the end of the day, we only have 1.5 billion. Earmarked for which sector? Is it for the green transition? No, it's for defense. So we see looming a competition between, in terms of funding allocation, between the green transition and military, military expenditure. This is really a bad news, I believe. Um, but second discussion in terms of state aid, and this is my conclusion, and I close the loop. And the second discussion it entails is a kind of budgetary discussion. With the uh, austerity rules or budgetary rules that are back on the agenda, member states will have to master their deficit, their debt, and it will have budgetary implication. And you might remember that during the um, uh, strikes against uh, the pension reform in France, a journalist asked uh, Macron, President Macron, why don't you contemplate alternatives to your reform to finance the so-called uh, financial gap in terms of yeah, the sustainability of the, the pension system? And he had the following answer. Um, I do not contemplate those alternatives because my project is to reindustrialize <laughs> France. And to reindustrialize France, I need to create an enabling environment in terms of fiscal policy, social contribution that will attract investment. That will attract investment. So if the plan is to finance um, the uh, reindustrialization by providing massively state aid to please Warren Buffett, BlackRock, and a series of institutional investors that are behind the Giga factories, there will be consequences given the austerity rules on the uh, social protection system and also uh, as a result in terms of, of funding of, uh, of public services. And if this is the kind of industrial policy, industrial strategy that the EU and member states uh, would like to design, set up and implement, we will end up in huge troubles because instead of having, again, this combination of social, industrial and climate agenda, we will have an industrial uh, policy that will be implemented at the expense of social cohesion and it's the best recipes to fragment and break uh, even further the EU. That's it for my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin Denis, for helping to indeed close that loop and to link up those three areas of climate policy, industrial policy, and social policy. With that, and you have all kept to your, to your time limits, but we have about 10, 15 minutes left uh, for discussion. So I had a few questions that have been burning in my brain, but I can't privilege my role. I open the floor to you. Um, I think it makes sense if we collect first a few questions and Crystal will be roving with a microphone. So request for the floor. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. Uh, no, we will start here with... Uh, no, 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 it was... No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm thinking backwards. Yes, a lady in the... Orange Thank you very much, yes. Claudia Supan, Land Steiermark, um, here for a regional perspective mainly. Uh, well, thank you for this really, really interesting input. I uh, especially like the one of, of Dennis, Benjamin Dennis, because 
You are the one who really lined, uh, pointed out that demography, the demographic transformation plays a role. And this is something I'm really missing very often. We always talk about the green transformation and the digital transformation. And we don't really calculate in that there is a demographic transformation going on. So um, I would like to know a bit more sort of your, your point of view. So seeing that the baby boomers retire or will have retired in 2030 in Europe, so that's more or less what, what is always said, very soon they will all be, be gone. Uh, is there still a, a, a job or a labor problem there? And seeing that the younger ones, much fewer younger ones, taking over the lead in policy and in making decisions with having different values, so what will that mean? And then you mentioned that uh, the whole mobility system is in a change because people choose different ways of mobility. They start cycling and, and sharing they don't want to own cars anymore, but they want to use solutions. So what will that make? Could you, could you maybe say something on that? And the second thing is, what do you expect from regions? So I haven't really heard a lot about what should regions do, because regions face the situation that, well, industry might earn an awful lot of money, but it doesn't help if they earn it somewhere else or spend it somewhere else. So if we as regions lose uh, jobs, well-paid jobs, maybe gain some less well-paid jobs for that. So tax income and wealth in these regions uh, is at risk. So maybe you could say something about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the lady right behind her, please, yes. Hi. Um, my name is Hannah. I work for Lower Saxony, uh, home of Volkswagen. Um, and I have a question about the e-fuels problem that was mentioned. Uh, it is interesting that uh, apparently all, most, say most OEMs, uh, completely don't want to, uh, are not interested in, in building uh, combustion engines uh, using e-fuels. However, we have a very strong um, and uh, loud minority uh, claiming that they need to be included in the policy. Uh, would you say that causes any harm or will, will it be just solved by uh, the market uh, because the OEMs will not take up the opportunity to build on that? Thank you. Okay, thank you. The gentleman in the front here, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, the Mazzopardi, party. Uh, um, we'll speak later. Also, um, from Bob, there is Vivian Smith, perhaps you know, is, is a scholar, Vivian Smith, a scholar from Boston University, has a nice formula about the evolution of the French state. It's, she says that it was a state in action and now is a state of mind, in the sense that people still look at the French state as the actor that should put up the plans, the solutions, but actually it's just a state of mind. It doesn't have any more the tools to enact an industrial policies. And I think this is also a question that goes to Benjamin as well, which is that somehow industrial policy in Europe does not really exist because it's not possible at the European level, because at the European level you control the single market, but you don't control fiscal policy, you don't control social protection, you don't control labor laws, you just control rules about the market and the money, of course, the euro. <laughs> but it's not possible at the state level either because they've lost all these tools. And so somehow the European industrial policy that you see with the IRA, IRA in the United States is not possible institutionally in Europe. There's not a place where it can be enacted. And so to me, this is in the current transition, this seems as a huge problem. When you compare new energy vehicle policy in China or the inflation reduction in the United States with what is happening in Europe, is that there you have coordinate policies in which things are connected, exactly what Benjamin was saying. Yeah product credits, consumer credits, you have stability because you have one single state that takes a decision. And then in Europe, it seems that this transition is really highlighting the institutional limits of the European construction. So my question is, I know that we have to deal with short-term urgency, so we need to make the best use of what we have. But is there perhaps a need for institutional innovation in this context? Should we open that, this debate as well or not? Okay, thank you. Then on this side we had someone in the front, yes. 
I think the lady in the black shirt, yes. And there was someone else here. Hi, uh, Amanda Gunnarsson from uh, Volvo Group, Heavy Duty Vehicles. So I'm going to ask a question on that topic. I know that this was very car focused, passenger cars. Um, but I would like to pose a question to Joan Sebastian if you've done any similar reflections from the heavy duty vehicle segment since we are, we have uh, Renault trucks in our portfolio. And I would also like to ask Bob if you would say that you would come to similar reflections over the heavy duty vehicle segments <coughs> too. I didn't hear that last bit. Yeah, if you've made similar reflections on policy needs when it comes to heavy duty vehicles like trucks and buses and uh, sort of making the change for our industry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There was another question here in this corner. No? Okay. Anybody else before I close the round? Okay, please. Hi, I'm Letizia from uh, Sciences Po and A2I. And since there are different strategies that unions are advancing for, for implementing the social agenda, and we see in Germany, it's, they work more on the plant and the company level, while in France, they are also proposing some more uh, industrial uh, action. How do you think that um, the power uh, can be channeled, like it's more on the company level or more in advancing a, uh, an industrial policy agenda? Okay, thank you very much uh, for a wide range of questions from what is the impact of the democratic, uh, democratic demographic uh, transition? What is the role of the regions? How do we find a regional balance? The last question, picking up the idea of company level, plant level versus uh, the entire sector. Question about e-fuels, whether it has a chance, whether this applies to heavy duty vehicles or whether there's a different analysis there. Um, and the role of the state and the role of industrial policy at the EU level. Um, given the time that we have, I would like to just sort of uh, go repeat the order that we spoke in um, and ask Johannes Horten of those questions, anything that you would have to add? If you yeah, have about two maybe, or three minutes. Yeah, maybe, maybe the last, uh, yeah. I won't take uh, okay. uh, three minutes. Maybe, maybe the last question of you. So. Well, I, I, I focused on, on the, the company and the plant level policy, that, that, uh, and that doesn't mean that, uh, that there are no, let's say, um, that the E-Metal doesn't have ideas of industrial policy. They, they do have, and I, I, I think that uh, they're quite advanced. But, um, and I'm, I'm not, well, I'm quite sure, I, I think the, the problem that we in Germany have right now is not that there are no discussions or that there are no ideas or big, big plans, let's say, for, for a better industrial policy uh, in, the, in, the, in the unions, in the IG Metall in this case. Um, the problem is that uh, they, they don't have um, the efforts to, uh, to make them happen, happen. So nobody listens. That's, that's uh, in, my, in my opinion, the problem. So uh, they have their think tanks, they have the experts. It's, it's not really it's it's not a problem of of uh of a lack of industry policy mm -hmm. ideas it's more a lack of, of 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 efforts or instruments to yeah to to make them happen and i think that should be maybe uh, uh more in, or worth of discussion than uh than than uh, talk about the whole time about uh, maybe some some problems of the ideas that they have of course, uh, well, that's paper in the end. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sebastian, I think the questions that were more uh, directed towards you and what you added were the one about uh, demographic change. I know you had one of your case studies where my impression was they were just going to sit it out um, and wait for people to leave, supported by public policies. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, the heavy-duty uh, vehicles questions. To what extent is that an issue in the actors that, that you spoke with? I will uh, answer first on the question of demographic change. Well, it's a, it's a very important issue in, in the French automotive industry, especially. And uh, the French automotive industry has been dealing with this with, a, um, I don't know the exact term in English, it's called pre-retraite, which means that you can uh, leave early retirement. Well, early retirement, exactly. But it's not just a very simple early retirement plan. There, there is this massive uh, 
measures of uh, re early retirement inside the OEMs, inside the manufacturers, that even sometimes go beyond what was expected because also working conditions have been deteriorating, so workers also benefit from this. However, there are other issues with um, the demographic change, which is that since working conditions in the French automotive industry are so bad, <laughs> um, workers have medical problems around, they begin to have medical problems around 50 years old. Uh, however, the early retirement plans only concern workers that have more than 57 years old. Mm -hmm. So they have this limbo, this desert to, 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 to traverse uh, of seven years where they are too sick to continue to work, but too young to live on an early retirement plans. So this is a very important problem um, that has been that, has, that is very recurrent today in the in the French automotive industry. Um, I, sadly, I don't have an answer for the question of uh, heavy du duty vehicles. Uh, I would like to, but uh, sadly, I do not. Uh, in, in one last question was the one regarding the industrial relations and trade union power. It's a very important question, and. Um, I will come back to what uh, Tommaso said, that the uh, French state uh, was from um, esprit d'état to état d'esprit from, uh, from uh, I don't remember exactly the formula, but voilà. It is, it's Bruno Amable also talks about a post-dirigist era in industrial relations where the state plays only a role of deregulator, and this is very evident in industrial relations, where firm level uh, negotiation is favored instead of uh, nationwide regulation and branch level regulation. However, this paradoxically um, limits the participa participation of trade unions to, uh, to co-determination, to the <coughs> economic strategy of the firm, because when I interview different uh, trade unionists at plant level, they say that everything is decided now only at central level. And they, on the day-to-day -day basis, their bargaining activity has been reduced to almost nothing. They say, peau de chagrin, to almost nothing. So for me, a way to strengthening social dialogue of, or trade union participation is not only at central level to be more listened by directly, like Luca De Meo, Carlos Savarez, etc., but also at plant level to have more um, possibility to act on uh, work organization, to, on product architecture, etc., at plant level, because it, it's, a, it's a level that has been disappearing, what has disappeared basically uh, in, the, in the last years of, uh, of uh, reform of collective bargaining in France. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now to Bob. Um, briefly, if you can, there were some questions about industrial yeah. policy. I think uh, you're best suited to address the issue of regions, and if you can add anything on heavy-duty vehicles, that would be mm -hmm. good. Uh, so, I mean, let, let's be quick. Yes, I agree with you about the, the limited sort of set of tools that, that exist in industrial po policy. But I think we would agree if I said it doesn't look like what we have, we're using particularly intelligently either. Not, not only are many initiatives at, at cross pur purposes, one country, one country does, has externalities, has, has effects on others. I thought I didn't need a microphone. <laughs> it's for recording. It has, it has effects on, on others, but they don't coordinate their, their, their actions and so on, and then there's the, the not insignificant point that Be Benjamin raised, which is that France and Germany have, I don't know how they do it, but they have a lot more, more money at their disposal than Belgium and the Netherlands, right, when it comes to industrial po policy, so large countries have the possibility of doing more. And I think what, 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 if Europe just became a forum where people would talk to each other about what they're doing and trying to coordinate, we would already be considerably closer to the kind of world that you're, I suppose, hope, hoping for, and where you move from a state of mind to an actual state, right, where, where something can happen. And I think one of the things, look, I, let, let me give one short example. What I find absolutely amazing is how um, 
this, this electric transition, you know, t take the, the German car industry. They're blowing hot and cold on it all the time at, at the moment. Had the German car industry sat down with Peugeot and St Stellantis at the time and said, let's hammer out a set of standards for charging for batteries and so on, they would have become glo global standards to, to tomorrow. There was, is no doubt that if the biggest market in the world sets a standard, that you do that. And nobody was even talking to each other about this. That's the, that's the really important thing. You don't need any money and you don't need <clears throat> A, a hell of a lot of different Macrons running around. You can you can get you can sort this out almost with 20 people in the room, and and even that seems to be impossible. So that's where I'm I'm sort of slightly slightly irritated myself about why why is there so much initiative being uh, you know sort of go, going around, but so little result. I think that has to do with the fact that there's almost no co coordination in terms of strategic thinking. The point about industrial policy, as I sort of implied in what I was saying, if you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answers. And that's fundamentally what's going on here, is that if you think of the, the, the industrial policy as a reaction against market failures in a transition, which is what I think you should do, then you think about what the market failures are and you address those. You don't start with the policy and then say, Say, let's now look for a problem, right? And that's basically, that is the feeling I, I, I have that we've had. With he heavy trucks, I, I have, so I am old enough, this, I, I don't normally do, do this, but I'm old enough to remember when Udivala in Sweden was still an important plant. Why was that important? Because they made single cars there in stationary assembly, right? And about four years ago, when I started to shift my attention to these questions that we're discussing here, I had a, about an hour with, with two guys from the Boston Consulting Group, and they were working on high-end vehicles called trucks and stationary assembly. And I always thought, I, I thought that that's how old I am, 30 years ago, and I think that now is that if, if unions, u, unions, it seems to me, have two strategic issues to deal with. One is, can they capture the logic of what the organization, production, and all that is about, and the stationary assembly model is called the you can, flexible cell manufacturing, stationary, call it what you want. What that does strategically is it puts the power of, uh, that, that, are, that is associated with skills on the shop floor in the hands of the worker, while at the same time, it seems at least if you take an overall view in terms of re return on investment, right? If you take an overall view that it's, it's more productive. So there is some argument to be made there for a, a new social pact to negotiate. Um, and, and that that would deal, trucks would be the place where I would say, if you want to try it out, why don't you look there so that you can see what electric trucks would look like um, under very good con conditions, see if you can build skills models that are different and pr production models that are different. The second one is that if the industry is changing as, as rapidly as it is, where OEMs are, you know, sort of flying, what was the word, sort of, you know, are, are sort of falling into to pieces and, and, and are reconstructing <laughs> themselves while the supply chain is being reconstructed, while things are being repatriated and so, so on. Unions are totally, in my view, and I'm, I'm, I've been a union member for 50 years, okay? So I'm not, I'm not yes, that's how old I am. Yeah, so that, it, that's not because I think they are, they, I'm, I'm against what the unions do, it's because they don't see that those strategic reorganizations are changing the landscape of what is going on. I wrote 30 years ago uh, a thing that was about how, how unions should organize what they call in French la, la filière, the, 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 the total supply chain, the, the va value chain. Alain Supio in the Supio report discussed that with, with, the, with me and put it in there. And we've been going on ever since. Nobody has taken it on. I mean, it seems to be that the unions are stuck in the industrial union model that dates back to essentially the end of the 19th century. And I wish we could... We'll have that conversation in a moment, yeah? I wish we could sort of move on to that new organizational model that is needed. Thank you very much, uh, Bob Hanke. Thank you for your chance. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Benjamin, we're, we're running short on time, but I would like to invite you to, to close this round, particularly picking up on some of the issues that have been raised. Uh, the one that sticks in my mind is, is what was called basically the institutional impossibility of an EU industrial policy, which sounds at odds with what you were saying before. So give us a, yeah, yeah. a final send off into the break. Uh, I, I, is it possible and how do we do it? I'm, I'm afraid it's, uh, that if I have to answer all the questions that I receive, yeah. uh, I might have an issue with the fact that I need to pick up my kids at 5 p.m. Uh, so I'll try to be brief, uh, starting by uh, saying that uh, as um, uh, a trade union representative, I sometimes have the feeling to be a bit like the coach of a football team. You know, uh, everybody around you in the stadium and watching on television knows better than you how you should do your job. But it's part of the game. Um, no offense. Um, I'm a Democrat, so call, always. Call me Klopp. Okay. <laughs> always, always um, happy to engage in a, in a discussion, even though. Uh, uh, some of the views are, are challenging. So starting with um, the demographic challenge and what's happening at regional level, uh, I think it's worth reminding that uh, indeed the bulk of the challenge uh, will be uh, located at regional level because automotive industry is a quite uh, geographically concentrated industry, um, especially in Central and Eastern uh, European countries, but not only. Um, so uh, region have uh, clear a, a role to play in a series of really serious struggles, um, um, sorry, serious uh, challenges to, to struggle with. Um, mm, demographic challenge and the tight uh, labor market challenge. Um, as trade unions, the way we would like uh, companies to deal with uh, that issue is the following. First, um, preventing um, workers' shortage by increasing um, and making working conditions better. First, to keep the existing workforce uh, at work <laughs> as long as possible. Um, the metal industry and the automotive industry remain a physically in, in, intensive uh, activities, activity, despite, of course, progress that have been made um, <coughs> in terms of ergonomics and technologies during the last two or three decades. Look at the Eurofund report. This is a sector where workers are exposed to um, um, musculoskeletal uh, diseases more than in, uh, in uh, other sectors. And of course, we have also to deal with uh, uh, rising psychosocial risks uh, because of the intensification of work and the many challenges that worker, workers have to, to struggle with when it comes to uh, work-life balance. And of course, this is also to be seen in the context of uh, retirement age, which is nowadays beyond uh, the life expectancy in good health, thanks to the smart policy makers that we have um, in many uh, European countries. So the first key condition to deal with that issue is to improve working conditions for the existing workforce, but also to attract uh, more workers in those in those sectors. Um, but we also believe that there is uh, a lot to be said about uh, retraining, about investing in people, in lifelong learning, um, giving to workers uh, an individual right to be retrained, to be reskilled. Um, of course, it has links with uh, what we discussed with uh, UNS, notably in terms of um, uh, social dialogue, workers' participation, and how you anticipate change at company level and sites level. And of course, skills must be part of the uh, agenda. Unfortunately, we have to uh, acknowledge that despite a series of good practices, notably in Germany, where good agreements are negotiated, that kind of epitomize a bit that approach, we also see in a number of regions, in a number of member states, exactly the opposite, exactly the opposite. Look at uh, what Hungary is, is doing, and we had a series of uh, activities with Bella uh, touching that aspect. We see uh, the country having uh, a special law adopted, the guest workers law, not sure that the translation is exactly correct, but which allows the Hungarian government to basically, I don't like the word, but it's, this is what it is, import uh, foreign workers from Philippines, from Bangladesh, to work for a specific period uh, in uh, the country without having the possibility to change of employer and with uh, limited rights. Uh, so if this is the kind of strategy that companies have to deal with the democratic challenge, again, 
we have ahead of us a, a series of really serious challenges in terms of rights and in terms of uh, social cohesion. This is for the internal aspect of the discussion. And of course, there is also an external aspect. And I do believe it's a personal opinion that migration uh, should be part of the menu and that we should stop with the xenophobic attitude and uh, we should go for a migration policy in the EU that welcomes people, support them, train them, offer them, uh, yeah, instead of um, of, uh, offering them the kind of support they need to uh, to find their, 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 their place in the society and including a job uh, in the sectors where, where we need a uh, workforce. Um, E-fuels and technology, uh, no, so first, in terms of anticipation of change at, at regional and at company level, um, we have uh, also tried uh, to um, incorporate in the CO2 standards uh, legislation for passenger cars and, and vans. Um, an article um, uh, trying to, to extend a bit the scope of the monitoring that the Commission will do to employment and industrial relations aspects. And we hope that uh, it will uh, lead to a progress report that will allow the Commission to make a legislative proposal to fill the gaps that will be identified in terms of policy, but also in terms of funding. And of course, Region, providing, providing additional resources to regions in hardship because of um, the shift uh, to uh, a low carbon uh, auto industry must be part of the menu. E-fuels, um, uh, actually, um, in the broad debate, uh, <coughs> if you go back five years ago, we have always said we are technology neutral. I mean, it's not the role of trade unions to say technology X is better than technology Y. But we are not blind, we are not deaf. We see that uh, most of the companies invest in one technology, which is electrification. Some OEMs and some suppliers continue to invest on hydrogen-related technologies, but it seems to be much less uh, prominent than the battery electric vehicle technologies. So we take that for granted. And on that basis, we <coughs> believe that from an industrial policy perspective, uh, policy stability matters, clarity about the technology um, uh, pa transformation pathway matters too. So we prefer to have clarity than false debate about the possibility to create uh, uh, unicorns, uh, toxic unicorns. Uh, and if policymakers have time to waste or time to spend, uh, we would prefer to see their energy being invested in how we will set up a full just transition framework for workers and regions. And we would like also to see those policymakers making specific proposals on how we will create a market for those new uh, vehicles. But I'm sure that Tommaso will discuss this into in depth. Um, Industrial policy um, and what kind Sorry. of institutional... Can I ask you to just to address the, the heavy-duty vehicles thing? Because industrial policy, I think we will be talking about later on today, or you do it very, very briefly. Yeah, very I, briefly. I feel terrible for having totally lost control yeah, of this sorry, panel, because it's all fascinating. Heavy-duty vehicles, uh, we have a network with uh, trade unions from uh, Volvo, Scania, uh, Volvo Trucks, uh, Scania, Daimler, Riveco, MAN. Uh, actually, we don't see the uh, transition and the situation being as dramatic as it is in the automotive sector, for the, the passenger cars part of the supply chain, notably because the uh, <coughs> CO2 standards regulation for heavy duty vehicles uh, is less uh, stringent in terms of emission pathway. The technological scope is a bit, I'm not telling that there are no uh, challenges. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, but uh, we are not talking about a full phase out. 90%. It's not a full phase out. You have a series of exemptions and the technological scope is a bit different with hydrogen in ice being allowed. Uh, in the technological scope, which is not the case for passenger cars and vans. So we see, think that the discussion is a bit different. In the same way, we are talking about uh, a B2B um, business or economic model, whereas for passenger cars and uh, light commercial vehicles, uh, it remains to a large extent uh, a B2C market. So the situation is a bit different, but we can continue the discussion bilaterally. Um, uh, there are challenges, but we don't see them as worrying as they are in uh, passenger cars and, and uh, light uh, duty vehicles. And just 
in one sentence, mm -hmm. um, the kind of institutional innovation we would need to have an industrial policy in the EU. Uh, if I only give my personal opinion, I would agree with having a kind of uh, leapfrog progress in terms of uh, political integration that would allow to have a real taxation policy, EU budget, but I have the feeling that I belong uh, to a political minority uh, from that regard, so I don't think that it will happen. So we have to work with the existing instruments we have. They are not perfect, but they can kind of make a difference. We have the IPSIs, we have the industry alliances, we have a series of instruments that are there, and we should try to make them working as they should. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for uh, all the really interesting aspects brought into the discussion. Um, I uh, am acutely aware that we have other regions. We have Italy and Central and Eastern Europe to discuss after the break. Um, and so we have a break now. Can I have you back in about 12 minutes? That's quarter to 12. Yeah? Quarter to 12, we resume. Sure. Welcome back. Uh, to the second part of the session where we're looking at the results of some of the national studies. In this session, we'll be looking at Italy plant level responses, so picking up perhaps where uh, we left off looking at Germany and France uh, with Matteo Gadi sitting next to me. Then uh, Patrick Gazo has put together a presentation looking at three different countries, Czechia, Hungary, and Slovakia, looking at, he'll be telling us about two faces of the transition, again, looking at trends, policies, and real world reactions. And uh, commenting that will be Manuela Kopp from the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation. They have done, uh, and also a comparative study of just transition in the automotive sector. So I'm keen to see how much of this resonates in the work uh, that you've done and what are the responses we have. So uh, without further ado, uh, and we will be going in an hour now. So we need to make up for some lost time. You'll still get lunch, it's okay. <laughs> but we will be carrying on until um, a quarter past one. No, quarter to one, I'm sorry, quarter to one. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> Matteo, you have the floor. Okay, first of all, many thanks for this invitation. I will present the Italian case. In the previous meeting, uh, I'm focused about the general data about Italian automotive situation. And uh, in particular, I will, I will talk about only passenger cars. So not uh, like commercial vehicle or duty vehicle. And uh, I, as suggested by Bila, I briefly recall the main findings of the previous meeting, because uh, Italian situation is characterized by four elements. The first one is the dramatic loss of uh, vehicles volumes production. Uh, between 1999 uh, and 2022, Italy lost about uh, the 66 percent of production volumes of passenger cars which means that uh, in the 99, Italy produced 1. million vehicles, and in 2022, 473,000. Uh, obviously, the second point, the, the dramatic drop in passenger car production affected the employment levels, because uh, starting from 99, Italy lost uh, 41,000 jobs, in the automotive sector, which means minus 21% about. And uh, the first point is that uh, the fall in employment was uh, partially curbed, or partially contained, uh, because uh, the massive use of social shock absorbers, which heavily affected the wage level of the workers, obviously, and uh, by using the hours uh, used of uh, such shock absorbers, we computed the corresponding number of full-time equivalent jobs, which is, uh, in average, uh, 20,000 per year. Uh, and the, sec the second reason uh, is that uh, the volume of parts and component production is quite good in Italy. Uh, but attention, uh, because a domestic industry 
uh, which fully absorb the production of parts and components doesn't exist, the parts and components produced in Italy are more and more export-oriented. And this is a point of very weakness of the Italian automotive sector because the production of parts and components depends on the choice, on the decision, uh, how to say, take it by, took by uh, industrial assembly plants located abroad, in particular in Germany. And fourth and final, in Italy there, there is no an industrial plan defined by Stellantis. There is also the business plan of two years ago, days, there forward, which is a very general plan, but with not with a specific industrial mission for each plant. And uh, there, is no, uh, there are no collective agreements to manage the transition toward the electrification, because the only collective agreement imposed by Stellantis is a collective agreement that provides economic incentive to force the worker to leave the company. You have to accept economic incentive to leave the company. And in this way, the employment level in Stellantis is reducing more and more. And attention, that this kind of economic incentive are used in particular by the younger worker because they receive economic incentive and they can, on the labor market, try to search another jobs. So only the older worker remain in production. And this is a problem. OK, today I will look at the concrete situation of each single plant, starting from Mirafiori, located in Torino. I remember that in the past, uh, Torino was named the company town because the size, the size of the former Fiat was so large that conditioned all the aspect of the city. But today you can see the, uh, the current production levels. The only mass market model is the Fiat 500, in Italian 500, uh, which is the only full electrified model of the Italian portfolio of vehicle of passenger car production. And uh, the second one is a premium brand, Maserati. Please attention to the model Levante and Ghibli, uh, which are the only model with relatively high production volumes, because the production of, of Levante ceased in December, and the production of Ghibli will end in March, I mean the next month. So, only the model with very low volume of Maserati will remain in production in the Torino plant. And what about the outlook? The BEV, the 500 BEV, never reached the ceiling of 100,000 vehicles, which is the production capacity of the assembly line, and the production is declining because this model is old, started in production in 2020. Now we are in 2024. And you know that uh, the production of a, an old model is declining more and more. And uh, the second point is that the production of the elect electrified model did not activate other correlated activities. Because, for example, battery, are sourced from outside, in particular from Samsung. E about the new version, the restyling or a new version at all, there is no clarity. Also about the timing, because we are talking about 2028 or 2020 or 2030. We already, we already explained about Maserati, the mechanical departments which is producing GR boxes and transmission, is producing only one kind of electric transmission, but not for BEV, only for hybrid model, and is producing for endothermic engine, in particular for Panda produced in Pomigliano in Naples. But both production will end in 2030, so we don't know the future of these workers. And final, the other activity explained by Tavares, uh, like the future of this plant, uh, 
are very, are very small because the circular economy is only about the refurbishment of parts and components from the whole car and the recovery of the fleet. And the other activity is the battery center, but is not a production of battery, it's only R&D activity, which employ about 100 people get rid of from the other R&D department. So new, no new jobs about these activities. Casino. Casino is uh, located in the Middle Italy, quite close to Rome. And this is the ideal plant of Tavares because Tavares and uh, previously Marchione, like Luca De Meo, state that uh, in country like Italy, it's important not the production of mass, 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 mass market model, mm -hmm but the premium or high range uh, um, brand model. And Casino is producing the Alfa Romeo and one model of Maserati. You can see also in this case the dramatic collapse of uh, the production volumes starting from 2017 to until 2022. And unfortunately, the future also in this case is not clear because Stellantis allocated the Stella Large platform. You know that Stellantis defined four platforms, Stella uh, Frame, Stella Small, Stella Large and Stella Medium. The Stella Large was allocated in Casino, but without specify for which model are for what volumes of production, because the volumes corresponding to the employment level. <laughs> On the electric propulsion, there, are, there is only the Maserati Grecale as electrified model, but the current production per shift is about 30, 35 uh, vehicles, so it's very low. Stelvio and Giulia are at the end of life, could be electrified, because uh, Tavares state that Casino will produce <coughs> the electrified model of Alfa Romeo brand, but without clarity, without certainty about the future. We are talking about a new car, but you know that a new car starting from, from the concept, the design, the engineering, the industrialization, blah, 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 take at least 18 months. So, <laughs> Maybe the new model will start uh, not before of 2026. The third plant is Pomigliano. Attention because Tavares uh, states that two out of four plants in Italy are at risk of closure. The first one Mirafiori and the second one Pomigliano, which is producing uh, the true mass market model, which is the Panda, but with endothermic engine. And the second one is Alfa Romeo Tonale, but the future outlook, also in this case, production volumes and employment levels are falling during the time. But attention, because there is no electrification project for the Panda. On the contrary, the electrified Panda will be produced in Serbia. The former Fiat followed a similar strategy mentioned before by Sebastian. I mean that the fall in production uh, is due partially by the relocation abroad, not in North Africa, but in Turkey, Poland and Serbia. And uh, unfortunately, the relocation strategy is running again because the new electrified panda will be produced in Serbia, a low-cost labor country. And there is now an industrial plan, a new investment, because in the Stellantis mind, mindset, with the tonale production allocation, the industrial plan about Pomigliano is ended, stop. So no future for this plan for the time being. And finally, the, the last, uh, uh, final assembly plant is located in the southern Italy, in Melfi. Uh, this plant was built in the past in the so-called Greenfield, Greenfield, without trade union legacy. 
and this plant have had better, uh, how to say, the larger production capacity in Italy, which was about 400,000 vehicles per year. But you can see also in this case the dramatic drop of the actual production volumes in Melfi. Melfi is, uh, how to say, the only plant with a clear industrial mission within the Stellantis framework. Because a collective agreement signed in June 2021 stated that starting from 2024, uh, in Melfi will be allocated the production of new uh, four uh, fully electrified models. And uh, then uh, Stellantis added the fifth model. Uh, but attention, that this collective agreement uh, provides for the reorganization of the production layout by, reduction, by redu reducing the previous two assembly lines to just only one. And despite the promise of Tellantis that the production capacity not, will not change, this is not true because the new production capacity will be around 180,000, 190,000 vehicles. So the half of the previous production capacity. But attention, that Stellantis announced the allocation, in this case, of the Stella Medium uh, platform, and the fifth model, two DS, one Opel, one Lancia, and the new Jeep Compass, also in a hybrid version, but one of the five models open have been deleted. So we cannot talk about five models, but just about four models. Second, the still a medium platform come from PSA. So all the Italian suppliers linked to the previous platform from the supplier of parts and components could be displaced by this decision. And the first concrete effect of this decision is that, for example, the new Jeep Compass will not be allocated to the local supplier. And in Melfi, there is a very strong cluster of producer of parts and components for the Melfi plant. Three minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. About engine transmission production, the only, how to say, the only plant of, uh, invested, interested by the uh, transformation uh, triggered by electrification path is the plant of Thermoli because it will produce batteries uh, by the joint venture ACC between Stellantis, Mercedes-Benz, and Total. But currently, it, it employs about uh, 2,400 people. The new employment level will be 1,200, because only this will be the direct workers. Second, the timing of the new building of the new productive department continuously slipped forward. So no clarity when the production concretely will, will start. Uh, and the, the production of gearboxes and engine for internal combustion engine will cease in 2024, this year, but can continue abroad. Because attention that endothermic production is not ending. On the contrary, in Italy, endothermic production is pulling with high level of production and high level of employment interested by endothermic production. The future of the other two plant producing powertrain, Prato La Serra e Verrone will be just linked to the production of the light commercial vehicle Ducato, which is producing in the Middle Italy in the Atessa plant. Uh, also for the, the different brand of Tellantis, I mean Ducato, Ol Opel and PSA. Also because the plant producing in Atessa was born by a joint venture between Fiat and Peugeot for produce light commercial vehicle. To finish. What about industrial policy in Italy? Nothing, or better. 
The Italian approach of about industrial policy is the classical horizontal approach of the European Commission, which is affected by the neoliberal approach. So, no direct intervention, no public intervention, no public ownership, oh, it's not too Soviet model, no, 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 but only to create the best environment to private business by tax reduction, public incentive, skills and competencies, training, blah, 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 blah. I'm a member of the technical working group in, uh, because I am trade union representative. I'm a member of the technical working group issued by Italian government within the Ministry of Industry. We are debating about new possible industrial policy. <laughs> Unfortunately, all the data and information are confidential because we are still working. So I also I just explain the official measure. The first one is the eco bonus, which is the only measure adopted by Italian government. I mean the provision of public incentive to buy new car, and these incentives are differentiated according to the scraps or not scraps. I mean, if you buy a new car by scrapping the old, the old one or not, and are differentiated also by the point of view of the socioeconomic condition of the buyer. So, uh, Italian government provided 640 million euro for eco bonus this year. And summing these resources with the past, we have 9 million 9 million, 9.9 uh, 9 million euros of resources devoted to eco bonus. The only tools of industrial policies is the development contract, but basically this tool repeats the same mindset of the horizontal policy because this is a kind of public tender, or better, a kind of uh, public call. I mean that, and I conclude, Italian government say, okay, we put on the table, and the number is exactly that, uh, 525 million euros to support the industrial investment project of the private companies. But the decision of the in industrial investment is, from, is for, from, from the point of view of the private company. They decide, they decide where, when, and how kind of industrial investment to do, and they request uh, this uh, financial support by Italian government. So basically, Italian government left to the market, left to the private companies, the concrete solution of industrial policy in Italy. Many thanks, and I'm sorry for the timing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very vivid picture of very specific examples. I think that's very evocative for us to see the reactions in the room. Uh, and of course, a pretty damning indictment of what industrial policy is, is delivering or their mindset. Um, very strict. Any questions of comprehension only, not discussion? Okay, Later. then over to you. Uh, Patrick Gazo, tell us about, you have three countries to cover. Um, Actually, yeah. But uh, we're very interested to hear, because we've heard a lot, it's been on the receiving end, a lot of these changes. What does it look like uh, from the perspective of Czechia, Hungary, and Slovakia? Yes, yeah, so first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, so together with my colleagues, Monika Martiškova and Tibor Mesman, uh, we were asked by, by Bella to provide like an update on what's going on, on in the automotive in in Central and Eastern Europe, um, which might be considered basically, as, as Sebastian already mentioned, like integrated peripheries. And, and so, like, what are the trends in, in employment and, and in regards to just transition policies? And so for those who are in the topic, uh, I don't really have to remind how the investigation in this region, region is, is crucial, given the centrality of the automotive to the economies of these countries, um, like changes that are occurring in the sector act as a significant economic driver that has broader political and economic um, implications. Uh, so we would expect that this transition would have some kind of like strong underpinning in the country's policies. And so far, um, 
this is not entirely the case, uh, but there are some variations uh, among countries, uh, as I will show in the presentation. Um, yeah, so in our study, we dived into the relationship between labor utilization strategies and technological and ecological transition. Uh, in the sector, and we also explored the role of, of employment and, and labor market policies for, for automotives in, in, in three countries, not in, entirely before. We, we, we focused on, on Czechia, Slovakia, and Hungary, because that's mostly where we were uh, doing research in the past few years. So, and we used um, like different kind of data sources, um, secondary research, media analysis, and we also, as I mentioned, we did uh, quite an extensive uh, qualitative research. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we were trying to cover like the current um, trends. Um, so from 2020 to 2023. Uh, okay. Um, so when it comes to transformation, uh, all final car producers announced or are already producing like low emission cars, whether they, they are uh, various hybrid cars and electric cars. Um, in Czechia, uh, EVs are produced in, in Škoda and Hyundai and, and Toyota is focusing on hybrid vehicles. And in Slovakia, we have four OEMs, uh, Volkswagen, uh, Stellantis, Kia, and uh, Jaguar Land Rover. They are all producing EVs right now, at least one vehicle, and we are expecting uh, to start production of fifth uh, OEM in Slovakia that would be producing exclusively, exclusively uh, electric vehicles, and uh, the production should start in 2026. And in case of Hungary, um, there are three main OEMs um, of the plans to begin electric car production in 2029. But they are, which is quite late, but they are already producing uh, mostly electric engines. Uh, so um, then Mercedes uh, intends to start in 2024 and Suzuki in 2025. Uh, so besides OEMs, uh, the network of subcontractors sub is quite dense in all three countries. Um, in Hungary and also partly in Poland, um, they are like a front runners in the region when it comes to battery value chains, um, while Slovakia and Czechia is sort of lacking behind, uh, which is also interesting because in case of Czechia, <coughs> like they are having the lowest share in batteries production, but um, they were deemed one of the most suitable and att attractive locations for battery manufacturing. Um, this was uh, primarily due to the potential to establish a complete value chain, um, including lithium mining. Um, however, in the end, um, the main uh, investor, German Volkswagen, like withdrew with, uh, from this plan to establish the facility in Czechia. And in Slovakia, uh, although this situation isn't like significantly better uh, compared to Czechia, there are some promising prospects. Uh, one notable example would be Innobat company that um, they are producing like a customized lithium ion batteries and Slovak government has also pledged support for this investment by preparing necessary infrastructure for the factory that should start production in 2026. And, but like so far, it, this stands as the sole investment in, into a gigafactory announced in Slovakia. Uh, but uh, lately we have heard also that Volvo is considering like incorporating uh, battery production within its forthcoming uh, manufacturing facility in Eastern Slovakia. Um, Okay, so I will try to briefly cover like latest trends in 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 case of employment, qualifications, uh, migrant workers, and temporary agencies, and uh, what are the labor market policies. Um, so, in all three countries, uh, employment saw like a steady increase until 2019. Um, but Slovakia stands out as, as the only country where employment in the automotive industry didn't decrease significantly. 
Uh, in fact, over the last three years, Slovakia has increased its reliance on the automotive sector, uh, with it accounting for about 22% of all industrial employment in 2022, up from below 20 in 2022, uh, 2020. And so this res resilience might be attributed to, on one hand, like successful kind of COVID-19 retention programs, but mostly it would be due to the opening of Jagger, Jagger Land River uh, facility in 2018 with increased production leading to the recruitment of 900 employees in 2021 and additional 700 jobs in 2022. And the subsequent launch of, of new models uh, and increased activity at, at OEMs have further boosted, boosted uh, employment at suppliers, which resulted in the creation of about 7,000 jobs between 2021 and 2022. In contrast, um, both like Czechia and Hungary saw decreases in, and in employment levels with uh, 12,000 and 11,000 job losses respectively. Um, this decline might be attributed to the increased presence of temporary agency and migrant workers, uh, as I will show later, who were among the first to be laid off during the pandemic. And nevertheless, the automotive sector remains a significant contributor to industrial employment in, in both countries, accounting for about 17% in Czechia and slightly lower 15% in, in Hungary. Uh, when, uh, when it comes to wages, more or less, um, they are around the national average income in, in all three countries. In Slovakia, it's slightly above. In Czechia, it's around average. And in Hungary, it's uh, slightly below the national income average. Uh, so <clears throat> between 2013 and 2022, there has been a consistent trend across countries, including Germany, um, showing a shift from like, middle-skilled to high-skilled workers, while the proportion of low-skilled workers has remained relatively stable. Um, this really like reflects this impact of, of technological adv advancements and, and changing market demands and highlights uh, the need for ongoing upskilling and reskilling initiatives uh, that are pretty uh, scarce right now. And um, as for migrant and temporary workers in the automotive, uh, all three countries are, experience, are experiencing a rise in migrant and temporary agency workers numbers uh, due to employer needs and, and uh, some regulatory changes. Um, this influx is primarily facilitated through amendments allowing sourcing from specific countries on fixed term contracts. Um, this is uh, especially case for, for Hungary. Uh, for example, in Hungary, like there is no limitation in terms of, of percentage of, of temp agency workers employed at workplace. There is only limitation in sense that companies in, in foreign ownership cannot employ more than 20% of non-Hungarian nationals as its employees. And so in practice, even, even such limitation can be like easily outmanoeuvred with, with hired workforce uh, through temp agencies. And so while migrant workers address like immediate labor shortages, there are some concerns regarding the nature of and quality of employment, of course, with some low skilled and low paid positions being potentially automated. But generally, like there is in, in all three countries, there is lack of uh, kind of comprehensive data on, on migrant worker distribution, which, which really underscores this need for, for uh, informed policy interventions. And lastly, uh, policy implications. Um, typically, employment and labor market policies in these countries tend to respond to external influences already present, um, those showcasing rather like an adaptive uh, nature, n not like an adaptive rather than a mitigative nature. nature. And this holds true, um, especially when examining the significant shifts associated with digital and green transition. Uh, 
it's quite apparent that the majority of, of just and, and green transition policies and funds in this region really like inadequately address adaptation and resilience in the labor market. Uh, while there are some like overarching labor market policies and funds um, that are supporting like worker retraining and upskilling programs, um, like particularly for those affected by market changes, the focus in Slovakia and Czechia remains largely on, on like bolstering manufacturing workforce strength with less emphasis on nurturing like high skilled talent, uh, especially in, in research and development sectors. But in contrast, in the Hungarian government really prioritizes these areas. Um, they are offering like heavy subsidies specifically to enhance R&D capabilities. And so generally Hungary exhibits like a greater regulatory uh, activity in labor markets, um, particularly as already mentioned concerning migrant workers. So overall, overall what we see is insufficient involvement of, of various stakeholders in the development of just transition policies, which leads to more mostly like company level labor strategies that are formulated mostly by producer, <coughs> producers and often without some kind of consensus with, with other social partners. And moreover, like this company level collective bargaining has often very limited impact on and in the, on and individual well being relies heavily on broadly defined um, market labor market policies that lack any like sector specific targeting and yeah as, as was mentioned in the previous panel that there is like no like active industrial policy in, in in place and so to conclude um to varying degree among countries uh, we observe like a decreasing relevance of employment policies and labor market policies and on the other hand, increasing uh, multinational corporations' autonomy over labor use strategies. Um, what our data analysis suggests is that there is a change in the workforce composition towards a greater percentage of white collar, high skilled labor, and a modest decrease or, or stagnation of overall employment <laughs> levels. Uh, what we see is, is like a larger division. On one hand, there's, there's like more highly skilled labor with slightly higher wages. But on the other hand, for the slower skilled production labor, we observe a growing reliance on, on flexible employment arrangements, such as fixed term contracts, temporary agency work, and migrant labor. And wages are more or less the same in, in the last 10 years. So to conclude, in the context of the automotive industry, unfortunately, Positive practices regarding just transition are not commonly observed. Uh, instead, what really like predominates is a trajectory of technological change, larger, largely dictated by the needs and visions of, of capital. And in case of Hungary, uh, also like state strategies is involved heavily. Uh, so that would be all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra Gazer, for covering three countries. We couldn't go into depth, and I understand the, the research will go into, into more depth because there is a different situation, but some commonalities, yes. as, you, as you pointed out. Um, are there any questions purely of comprehension? No. Then I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, Manuela, I forgot your last name, sorry. Klopp, Klopp sorry. To Manuela Klopp from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Uh, you've done some work on this. I'm interested to hear what, what sort of piques your interest in what you've heard for these the, the Central and Eastern European countries, also Italy, which is a fairly different story to what we heard this morning. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot uh, for the uh, kind introduction and uh, the in invitation to this um, panel and the opportunity to comment very briefly. Um, let me just uh, jump uh, back to uh, Germany and the German Metal Metals Workers Union IG Metall because German, the German OEMs are often the, the head of the value chain and it's, uh, it's really interesting. There's been a common position paper by the IG Metall 
and the Alliance for Rail and the Association for Cycling, the first time that they publish a common position paper uh, in January this year, and they demand a mobility guarantee for everyone in Germany. Mobility guarantee means like in a certain time, uh, you should have like uh, 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 supply with uh, public transport, uh, but also the possibility to use a car and so on and so forth. We don't have this in Germany so far, and this is uh, quite astonishing that there is uh, such a position. Um, such a mobility guarantee is reality in Switzerland and in part of the government program in Austria. So for Germany, this would be something. If you look at the, at the resolution of the uh, IG Metall Congress in October last year, you see it's only paper, but it's the IG Metall. You see quite, uh, quite progressive uh, political demands. For example, a decrease of unecological subsidies in the transport sector, which I find really interesting, and a more active industrial policy to support value chains uh, for batteries in the EU, in Germany, and so on and so forth. And what we sometimes forget, uh, a fast expansion also of uh, renewable energies and the grids, because we should run our small, efficient electric cars on renewable energy, mm -hmm. of course. Um, yeah. And the IG Metall says, okay, we need a modal shift, which means we should not forget the car, but we have to combine it better with cycling, public transport, mm. and so on and so forth. So they demand massive public investment and also private investment in rail infrastructure, renewable energy grids, electricity grids, uh, charging infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure, which is uh, uh, interesting and important for the production of green steel green steel we need for the production of cars, trains, windmills, dum dum dum, um, and uh, of course investment in digital grids. So it, it was discussed already, so I don't want to bore you, uh, like what is the problem with the Inflation Reduction Act, so the, the IG Metall is fully aware, problem, there are no, uh, there are no social conditionalities, decent work is not, is not mentioned in the reply of the EU and of the German government. And the IG Metall also deplores that there is no European sovereignty fund, which was, you know, which was planned and that we have now only this small thing, this step uh, platform, uh, which provides only, uh, Benjamin mentioned it, only 1.5 billion euro at European level, which is nothing and which is debated today in the, in the European Parliament again and yeah, which you cannot really call a sufficiently uh, financially uh, sufficient, uh, yeah, th these are not sufficient uh, financial resources, of course. So to give you a, a very brief uh, overview what we do, so th this is of course what we uh, discuss in our, in our research work and also when we uh, organize conferences, of course, and uh, we do not only discuss it at society level but also on a company level, the word conversion was, was mentioned here, mm -hmm. so this is a you know, it links to the discussion uh, we had during the pandemic, like when, for example, in the US, the government said, yeah, well, automotive companies, of course, are able to produce um, medical equipment to fight the pandemic. So obviously it's possible. And there's one uh, interesting, a small, huh? but interesting example in Germany, uh, the supplier Continental in Gifhorn, which was planned to, to be closed. Unfortunately, so 450 jobs were, uh, were in danger. And there, um, the IG Metall, the Works Council, the workers uh, put pressure on the, on the management to keep the company as it is and to look for a new investor. And now they changed the production uh, away from automotive parts to uh, parts for heat pumps, which is, uh, which is a good example. Of course, there are other examples which were not successful, but still uh, uh, an example how, how workers try to put pressure on the process, uh, for example, uh, GKN uh, Zwickau, since 2011, the IG Metall there uh, is demanding, please change the production to something ecological, please keep the plant, but obviously now it will be relocated and more than 800 jobs will be, will be lost, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, and I mentioned it, the next challenge that we face is, uh, of course, the production of green steel, so we will organize a, a conference on this in, in Salzgitter in, in April this year. At the moment, we have uh, 60 low-carbon steel production projects running in the, in the European Union, but the question is, where do we get the, the green hydrogen from? Where do we get the renewable electricity that we need to produce the green hydrogen? 
Um, what about the, the, the requirements for reskilling of workers? Because it, it costs a lot of uh, also jobs, this kind of transition. So what do you do with the workers? How uh, can you make them uh, fit for the, for the requirements? And um, yeah, and for this you need uh, subsidies. So what should be the, the conditions when, when uh, subsidies are paid? So you see, uh, of course, European industrial policy, you need this for the automotive industry directly. You need this also for the mobility industry in general, like production of trains, buses, trams, uh, etc. And also you, you, you should not forget uh, the steel industry, which employs, by the way, 306,000 workers directly. And if you count uh, the indirect jobs, it's, it's more than 2 million across the EU. So it was also already mentioned this in, in famous debate about the phase out or non phase out of the internal combustion engine, which is, I mean, like now uh, in, the, in the middle of the European Parliament, the Conservatives and the Liberals bring it up again, which is really not helpful and reminds me a bit of the discussion on the nature restoration law, mm -hmm. these attacks against the, the European Green Deal. So this is all not helpful at all. And uh, yeah, last point, uh, Benjamin uh, already mentioned it, uh, the comeback of austerity policy, this revision of the fiscal rules in, in last December, not helpful at all. It's a figure by the European Commission. Uh, EU-wide, we need every year additionally 520 billion euro to invest to, to reach the, the objectives of the European Green Deal, which is, from my personal point of view, not ambitious enough, yeah, but even to, to reach these objectives of the Green Deal. So 220 billion every year across the EU additionally. So that's why um, yeah, the, the comeback of the austerity policy is really a, a problem. There is a, um, a research by the New Economics Foundation which shows that only four member states are able to finance their climate protection plans under these new fiscal rules. 14 member states will uh, will have to do a lot of uh, 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 um, budget cuts, for example, Italy, 9 billion euro for the next year, Spain, 6 billion euro, France, 13, Slovakia, 440 million. And last point, Germany, um, in the region in, in East Germany, in Saxony, where the far right is in the polls now above 35%. Um, there, um, the biggest solar modules production plan will most probably, unfortunately, close. It's uh, 500 jobs. Uh, they ask for subsidies by the, by the German government. The government is still thinking about it, so let's hope that in the next three weeks, the deadline is in three weeks, there might be a, a, a good decision. It's, um, yeah, but this is, um, this is a, a, a bad example of what can happen if we don't have an... Uh, efficient and well-financed industrial mm -hmm. policy. Okay. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> you know, Leclop, you've helped to sort of broaden the perspective to uh, the issues that, that, that all tie into it as well. I think also the link to austerity policies. Um, and certainly it highlights some of the stories that we've heard here from Italy to Central and Eastern European countries. I mean, these are member states that joined the EU 20 years ago, and yet they're operating under a completely different uh, uh, economic model, essentially. Um, and what you're describing is a sort of badly managed decline uh, with a lot of, a lot of open points. Um, so with that, a different story to what we heard in the first uh, session. We do still have time for discussion and questions. I'll group it like I did last time. We have Bella. Request for the floor. Two. Wait, 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 wait. I'm still collecting. And yes. Anyone from this corner? <laughs> You're stretching, not raising. Okay, fine. Bella, briefly, please. Yes, so Bella will say a question if you want. A question to Marco. You mentioned Bella.
German case and the French case uh, before. Uh, how, how is it in Italy? Uh, how innovative collective agreements are getting? How to f what extent can they cover uh, restructuring issues? So company investment or model business issues, yeah? So that are not strictly a wage or working time, uh, like in the French case. Uh, so that, that is a question. Uh, Thank you. The lady behind you in the green dress. Hello, uh, Els Vos, uh, union official in Ghent. So uh, I'm uh, accompanied by uh, Mark. He's uh, head of the delegation, Metea, also in Volvo Car, Hent. Uh, so um, in Volvo Car, Hent, uh, the transition is going on by the full electrification process. And uh, we recognize uh, the concerns of wage moderation. And uh, within the two years, uh, the new company in Slovakia, in Kozice, will uh, produce. So uh, the question is, um, the average wage in uh, Slovakia, at, um, it was told that it would be around uh, 450, 500 euros a month. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, support aid of the Slovakian uh, state. Um, so uh, we need to strengthen and to support the colleagues over there because uh, it, uh, otherwise it's a race to the bottom. And, um, also, in June, uh, the European uh, elections are uh, held. So uh, the question is, how can we make uh, the, the, the fair employment and uh, social rights uh, a priority in polit politics? Thank you. Uh, next was uh, Benjamin. Sorry, I was noting down the information um, no I, I'm I was thank you for the presentations I was a bit struck by um, uh, something that Matteo said uh, about skills um, in Patrick's presentation uh, it's absolutely obvious that uh, there is a trend in terms of skills requirement in the industry with uh, more and more uh, jobs that require um, higher qualification this is also a general demand or information that we get from our members. Uh, skills matter a lot. Um, workers want to be retrained. They want to have access to lifelong learning programs. They want the companies to invest uh, in those skills. And Matteo, in what you said, you kind of, I don't know, overlooked or even challenged a bit the, 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 the legitimacy of the skills agenda. And I, I, I think I see where you come from. Uh, there is indeed a tendency to design the, the, the reskilling programs as tailor-made uh, for multinational companies' uh, needs. But we believe, as Industrial Europe, that there is an alternative. There is the possibility to build um, a, a right-based uh, skills uh, agenda for the benefit of workers. So I wanted you to clarify a bit uh, your thought on, on skills and uh, yeah, training. Um, I have a question for Patrick. So um, I would like to know how um, trade unions in, um, in Slovakia, Hungary and Czechia um, look at the, what a just transition would look like. So what are the main um, proposals that they are advancing? And to Manuela, I was wondering, because if, if I'm not wrong, uh, IG Metal also published in 2021 an, an alliance with the Friends of Earth uh, and other, another alliance uh, for uh, mobility um, transition. So I was wondering to what extent we can, like those uh, proposals that are quite radical and they imply a rethinking of the um, mobility structure are then challenged in the actual strategy of uh, IG Metal when the, it's not about just uh, the alliance and the reports more, more on the policy agenda proposals. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I have a question for both Matteo and, and Patrick and it's about what I would call the anti fordist dynamics that we see in the industry. You know, we remember that Ford said, I give high wages because I want my workers eventually to buy a car. And then when you see the price of the car in Europe and the wages of the people who work in the car industry in Italy and even more in Central Eastern Europe, it's clear that it's becoming more and more absolutely impossible. And at the same time, the electrification is about providing electric cars to everybody. And for countries like Italy, and even more for countries like Central European country, 
it seems very difficult to get into these transition if wages do not grow and the price of the car keep growing. So this just transition also asks these questions, which is how do you reconnect uh, the people that in your country need an electric car eventually by 2035 or 2040? And the fact that the process that is taking place in the auto industry is going actually in the completely opposite direction because workers in particular in Slovakia, Czech Republic, are manufacturing cars that are not even made for the people living in that country, they are completely exported somewhere else. So is this a problem that is emerging somehow in the debate? Because we know that the European, I mean, car makers need to fulfill their CO2 targets on new car sales, but countries are engaged, again, in biding way by the European Union to decrease CO2 emission in road transport, and if they don't, they will be also fine in pressure. So is this a problem that is, is, is start to popping up in the public debate or not at all? You can just lob it over your shoulder to the lady behind you and then we're done. Thank you. Thank you, Louise de Lafortel from the ZF Group. Um, yeah, I have a question. So, I mean, the transition to electric vehicle obviously is a, is a massive challenge, um, but it, it's made even harder because of the competition that we see from the US and from China. And both of these regions, they have taken uh, quite strong strain, uh, um, stance on trade policy. And I wanted to hear from uh, the panelists a little bit, how do you think trade policy could could maybe help um, um, the EU position on this transition or not, or? Okay, thank you very much. Um, then can we start in reverse order? Manuela, there were one or two questions addressed to you and then we'll work our way back towards me. Yeah, uh, the question on the um, on the alliance between uh, Iggy Metall, Friends of the Earth, and uh, I think the churches were also involved, and um, um, and Paritätischer Wohlfahrtsverband, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it was uh, this alliance was uh, installed in 2021, and actually it, it, it stayed, to, at least to my knowledge, only a nice paper. There did not follow any uh, any action. So that's why this new position paper, let's say, with these clear demands is, gives a bit of uh, hope and a good perspective. But uh, of course, the question is, uh, is there something implemented? Um, can the unions do something uh, together? Of course, it's not so easy, let's say, as between uh, Valley, the, the service union, and Fridays for Future. They have their common strike on, on 1st of March, again, in, in Germany, and it's quite a powerful sign that they fight for good working conditions in public transport. I've heard of some small local initiatives in Germany where a, a, a unionist from the IG Metall joined these, these activities, but not to a large extent. So the question is what, uh, what will come out of this. There is a research by the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, I think it was published two years ago, uh, where they ask um, automotive workers what they think about the transition. And the replies were like 50% we're aware that it's necessary due to climate change, but on the other hand, a lot of them said we don't believe that the government is able to do something positive in this regard, which is really which brings us back to the question of a, a good industrial policy. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Manuela. So the, there were a series of questions to Patrick and Matteo. Um, in the interest of time, I'd ask you to concentrate particularly on the ones that had to do with the role of social partners. Uh, are skills on the agenda? Um, is there this anti-Fordist dynamic? Is it is it perceived as part of the debate on the part of the of the trade unions? If you could focus on that, knowing that we have a lunch break afterwards, that would be yes. fantastic. Patrick. All right. So there have been uh, various kinds of uh, questions. Um, so regarding skill formation, as uh, Benjamin pointed out. Um, like from what we have seen, um, like this like skill formation and requirements are increasingly company specific with, uh, and, and so like these large OEM companies having both like separate contracts with schools and established practices, or uh, they are trying to um, like to, 
to start like an internal skills formation, uh, but generally, like for them, for for big OEMs, this general educational requirements um, of production workers are, are not that much important for for them. Like companies, they are trying to setting their own employment and career standards, and and so this external education doesn't matter significantly. But from from what I have. Um, because I have done also research uh, among workers in, in, in the automotive industry. And what, what we see is that employers uh, also stress that like they are doing more than enough to, to reskill their workforce. Um, that it's basically only their task that stayed in this, uh, especially in Czechia and Slovakia, it's different in Hungary, that they are not doing enough. and, and and so this is like common discourse among them. But on the other hand, when I did this uh, interviews with workers themselves, like they often stress that, okay, like officially there are some reskilling pro programs in, in the in the company. There are some like um, some uh, some courses that they can like take. Uh, but the thing is that often these are just uh, like how to say it, they, they are just formalized and, and not really used in, in their like future career options or they can cannot be utilized in their future career options. So so what we see is kind of like this division between what employers think they, they are offering, but on the other hand, workers themselves can't really see any significant um, influence on their own working life. Uh, so uh that would be one question and regarding just transition and and trade unions in in these uh countries uh, this would be very different uh i'm not that uh informed about hungarian situation because mostly i'm uh, involved in in slovakian environment but um generally uh like slovak trade unions that there is kind of like interesting situation because uh, uh, like the on on the top level of, of trade unions in Slovakia they are they are very aware of of, of just transition policies and and that this needs to be done but on lower levels this is not the case and and actually it really shows like a in, interesting um, division because on one hand uh, like the the, the leading of trade unions are trying to do something regarding this topic, uh, but they don't have any kind of support from, from the bottom level. And, and so, so that's basically their, uh, their task that um, they are dealing with. Or when we ask them about this kind of issues and how they proceed with them, uh, their main um, argument is we just don't have like a, um, support from the lower levels and and we on what we can do is to deal with bread and butter topics and that's all so so that's the situation in case in of Slovakia and I'm not really sure what, how it's in in Hungary um, but I guess uh, might be kind of similar yeah and um, Yeah, not yeah. sure. Okay. Probably that would be all for me. Okay, thank you very much. Again, we can, we're here for the rest of the afternoon as well. We can keep deepening some of those issues. Uh, Mateo, what, uh, what's on the trade union's agenda in terms of skills um, and things that are not bread and butter issues, but actually yep. being actively involved? That's a key question, I think, that would round out this session well. Very briefly, Bela, the collective agreement signed in Murphy was signed because the uh, restructuring of the uh, equipment layout implied the use of social shock absorbers because the reduction from two to just one assembly line implied, how to say, the reduction of working hour, so the use of social shock absorbers, so Stellanti was forced to negotiate with trade union the, uh, the use of social shock absorbers. Only for this, Stellantis signed with trade union a collective agreement. But the new model, the new models, and the production volumes 
was announced at by Stellantis, so no room to negotiate this part of the history. Uh, or better, very little room, and each room gained is gained by the struggle of workers, because otherwise uh, no room to negotiate new models, production volumes, etc. About the skills, uh, you're right, I have to clarify my position. And I'm sorry if my position seemed to be too trivial, but in my opinion, how to say, according to the Italian situation, automotive uh, production and employment, before we have to negotiate industrial plans, new models, production volumes, employment levels, labor organization, and then we have to negotiate uh, training course, reskilling, etc. On the contrary, in Italy, we are talking before about the reskilling of workers, but without know the industrial plan of Stellantis. And in this way, the reskilling of workers become, become a kind of social shock absorbers. You cannot produce, you cannot work, okay to avoid the layoff, you can do some kind of training, some kind of reskilling. Also because Stellantis is using the trainings also on the jobs in Italy. Obviously, the reskilling on the jobs is a part of the training, but it's just a part of the training and the reskilling of workers. Because uh, otherwise, Stellantis Stellantis have to spend money to organize training course, reskilling, etc. Uh, about uh, wage level, you're right. Uh, the 500 uh, model, the Italian 500, was the most popular mass market model in Italy. In a for this, for this way, I mean, the blue collar produced the 500, then acquired exactly the 500. Now, the electric 500 model, the price is about 30,000 euros in Italy. And uh, the average wage is uh, 1,500 uh, 1, uh, euros per month. So, I don't agree with the policy of Italian government to provide money as incentive to buy new cars. An economic policy would be to increase wage and salaries of workers. And again, if you focus the production only about Maserati, Alfa Romeo, I, or La Lamborghini or Ferrari, it's another, it's another. But Italian workers cannot buy Alfa Romeo cannot buy Maserati, etc. I know that between the A segment and the high premium segment, there is a middle range. Because if, how to say, uh, if the Marchionne, Tavares, on the male mindset uh, dominate, this implies a kind of division of labor between uh, countries that produce uh, low-range vehicle, but the mass market models, and the other one that produce only high premium brand, and the worker cannot acquire only low, medium range of the vehicle. So the, the issue of the wages implies the issue of the international division of labor, and the trade policies defined by European Commission are exactly defined to put in competition the working class of the European countries. This is my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> On that prerogative note, which links back to a question we had about the regions uh, in the first session and the role of the trade unions in both, I release you to your lunch break. Thank you very, very much to the panel for having rounded out this morning's discussions. I'm looking at Bela. I assume the plan is still to resume at or close to 1.30. Yeah, 1.30. Um, 1.30 yeah. to resume for a number of political discussions and positionings. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience, and enjoy your lunch, which is right.
I don't think so. Either. And I only recently understood that you have had a past at Atsena yourself, right? Is that oh, yeah, yeah, before Baru, yes. Yeah. Yeah, did, you, did you start the fishing with Atsena now? Yeah, yeah. So I'm sitting here. All right, I think we can get going. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us today for the second part of the event focusing on the automotive industry. Um, we will kick off this uh, first panel with a keynote speech by Tommaso Pardi. He's a senior researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research. And he will give us um, the policy challenges and possible responses in delivering a net zero transport. And then we will follow with our, with our panel um, and we will really try and dive in the policy responses and the necessary to address these challenges. And here we have Bela Galcozzi, he's senior researcher at the ETUI and he is the organizer of the event and he has been the, the project leader of this automotive industry project within the ETUI uh, in co-partnership with the ECF. Uh, we have Celine Domecq, she is Director of Public Affairs, Head of Volvo Cars EU Office. And we also have Andrea uh, Klugshield, he is Chief Strategic Foresight and Engagement Office at the European Automobile Manufacturers Association. So Tommaso, I think we can start with your keynote speech. Okay, so um, I will need just my something to shift the, the slides. Here I we think go. you have the clicker right here and you have around 15 minutes. Okay, I will try to be brief. Uh, uh, so I will start very briefly with these slides, if it works, uh, doesn't, perhaps I do it the other way around, no. Okay, something has happened. Okay, so this slide just to remind us why we are electrifying uh, the cars. So you see on the top the transport sector and cars emissions and how they've been growing in Europe since the 1990. And so the Fit for 55 amendment say, well, this is a problem and we need to bring back these emissions towards the final target, which is carbon neutrality in 2050. So by 2030, we need to bring it back here, which is of course impossible because the one on the top is, is emission from cars on the road. But in order to deal with this problem, so the 100% battery electric vehicle says by 2035 is an answer to this problem. And of course, when they dealt with this problem, which actually emerged in the public scene with the diesel gate, uh, it was there before, but it was not really debated. So the, the answer that was given to why we've been failing to reduce emissions was, well, we pick up the wrong technology and on the top of that, car makers were cheating. So the solution that was brought forward in terms of policy response was the right technology is the battery electric vehicle because it's a zero emission car. And we reduce the cheating as much as we can by introducing new, about well, these terms here refers to the test cycle. So we change the test cycles, we introduce a real drive emissions, we have board device, so we check better the emissions that come from the car. And the problem I have with that is that there has not been a debate about what was wrong with the regulatory framework. You know, because if this failure happened, it cannot be only because car makers were using the wrong technology or because they were cheating. There were people overlooking that and they were not taking action to change that. And I will go forward to say that the problem persists because we have not changed the regulatory framework. We have made it harder. We have introduced this ban for internal combustion engine, but the regulatory framework for cars is more or less the same. So I think there was a wrong diagnosis, not because diesel were a good technology or car makers were not cheating. These are facts and there's no doubt uh, there are important factors into that. But there were also more profound problems that I call the upmarket drift, is the fact that the car, the average car sold in the European market was kept moving in the wrong direction. I mean, what do you do when you want to reduce CO2 emission or you reduce consumption and physics plays there? Lighter cars, less powerful cars, consume less, so they emit less. Now, the industry has kept moving in the opposite direction by making cars that were year after year heavier, more powerful, and also more expensive. So you can see that the, that the engine power is in red, the mass is, is in blue, and, and sorry, sorry, I go back just a second, and you can see that the CO2 emission that were, they were expected to achieve is, is the bottom line, and actually, 
is uh, uh, they made it, but actually they made it by cheating. So you see that the light blue is, is what they were actually really doing on the road and not on, in the uh, laboratory test. So there are two key regulations that explain why the car gets heavier and, and, and more powerful. First of all, there is the type of prover regulation, the fact that the cars becomes more sophisticated, safer, uh, but also heavier and, and more expensive, and that creates a vicious circle. And while I'm, I do not discuss that some of these norms were required, there's been an overinflation of norms pushed mainly by premium car manufacturers and suppliers that see there an opportunity of, of standardized norms and, and products. And the most important one, the one I would like to focus on, is this one, is the introduction of weight-based target uh, for CO2 emissions. And uh, so just to give you an example, so what, what does a base standard? It means that if you produce heavier cars, well, your target is less demanding, and if you produce the light cars, your target is more demanding. And the main problem of that is that if you reduce the weight of a car, which is the most natural strategy to reduce your emission, well, actually, you just get a harder target. It's not a strategy. You cannot do that. It doesn't make any sense. So I'll give you an example. This is the Clio. So this is... Uh, has to meet 119 CO2 grams according to the regulation and it weights 1.15 uh, tons. This is a hammer, okay? This is a 2.9 truck. And according to the regulation, it can, it can emit 200 grams. That's okay, okay? And if you want, you say, well, I, I make hammer, but I want to become a greener car maker. Let's, I, I want to make clear. Well, actually, you reduce by 81 grams your emissions but you're still compliant with the regulation. I mean, if you do that, you don't get anything in terms of incentive in terms of the regulation. Actually making a lighter car is a difficult task. So there was no incentive at all to make lighter car. Actually, the opposite was true. When you make bigger cars, but easier to comply, but also you can make more technology into that. So there's been a push towards going up, and that will happen. So uh, you can see that, uh, so basically when you increase the mass and the engine power by that amount, you just add 32% CO2 emission to the car. You also do diesel and other technology, but that only reduced by 40%. So the net result is 8, 9% reduction, and what was expected was 40%. So that's why we're moving to electric cars now. Okay? This way of reducing CO2 emissions simply did not work out. Cars got bigger, heavier, more polluting, and the technology you put into that were not enough to generate the amount of CO2 reduction that were needed. Now, the problem is that electrification now is, is got into the same, okay, no, just, just a second, I'll go back to, to another problem. So, the other problem you see is the price. You see the price going up by 70%. So, these cars becoming more expensive, you have another problem. You want, what you want, you sell new cars to reduce carbon emission in the road, but you need to diffuse them. If cars become more expensive, you don't do that. Cars become more and more premium products, and you don't get the decarbonization that you expect. And that is what is happening. So the car fleet in Europe has kept increasing from 186 million to 253 million in 21 years. But the number of new car sales has kept declining. So the solution is becoming smaller, and the problem is becoming bigger. So, and when you break down this by countries, then you can see how polarized the situation is in Europe. So let's say 20 years ago, basically, we had a divide between Western and Central Eastern European countries. In Western countries, it took 13 years to renew the car fleet, 31 years in Central Eastern Europe. When you move 20 years later, the divide has grown bigger, and it's also there is now a divide between Northern European country and Southern European country. So it takes seven years more in Northern European country, 20 years, it takes 16 years more to renew the car fleet in South European countries, 29 years, and it takes 48 years to renew the car fleet in Central and Eastern European countries. And this despite the fact that these countries were actually coming out from the post-Soviet disaster in 2001, and now have been integrated in the European Union, but yet you can see that the renewal of the car fleet has slowed down even more. So we do have a problem because actually the CO2 emissions are more concentrated precisely in the countries where we cannot sell new cars. So you can see that the growth of CO2 emission from road transport for cars has been spectacular in Central European countries because they needed cars, but they couldn't buy new cars. So what they bought, they bought all second-hand cars coming from Germany, Austria, Mali. 
And this has contributed to an amazing um, uh, increase of CO2 emission. And this also has another side effect, is that has created a market which is very good for premium brands, in particular European premium brands. So you see that the market share has increased by almost 50%, is the blue line. While the generalist brands that were supposed to produce the car for everybody were, were struggling. They were moving up market, and they were losing market share, they were losing consumers. And so we have also these problems. Who is going to produce the cheap electric cars that we need to decarbonize road transport in Europe? And now what we have is that the electrification has been caught in this upmarket drift. That is not a necessity. It's not a necessity that an electric car costs 60,000 euros. But because we have this regulatory framework, that's what is happening in Europe. So you can see that the battery electric vehicle has, has, has taken in just 10 years, what is, I think, 600 kilograms. It's, you know, it's moved from a very small electric cars that we got at the beginning of the 2010 to the kind of very big electric cars that we have today. So, the, so you can see that the average weight of a battery electric vehicle in 2021 sold in Europe is 1,700 kilograms. And in 2023, the average price for this car is 66,000 euros. That is the average price of a battery electric vehicle in Europe sold in 2023. It's twice more than in China, which also shows that with a different regulatory framework, like the Chinese one, and we got that back perhaps in conclusion, you can actually make cheaper battery electric vehicles. And when you see where the share of, where the sales of battery electric vehicles is concentrated so far, well, clearly, you only sell these cars in northern European countries. More than 80% of these sales is concentrated there. And if we want to reach 100% sales by 2035, we need to sell these cars somewhere else as well. Now, what is the impact of that on the European automotive industry? Uh, as you can see, this is the market share of new car sales on the left, and on the right you see the battery electric vehicle market. You can see that the violet part, which is the generalist brand, has been squeezing during the last 20 years, and even in the battery electric vehicle market is not doing particularly well. The premium brands are resisting, but we have a new problems with the battery electric vehicle, which is that we have new competitors in particular Tesla, but also the Chinese brands that are coming to Europe, which have started earlier, are more vertically integrated in, in the battery value chain. They have larger scale of production, lower production costs, so they're entering very easily in the European market. And they have cheaper products, of course. And you can see that, yes, it's only 5% in 2023, Chinese brands plus Tesla. Okay, so this is, this is the squeezing that I was talking about. You can see the foreign brands taking more place, and you can see that here it's still small because, well, the battery electric vehicle market is only 16% in 2023. But when you look at their market share in, I'm trying to go quickly to the end, when you see that the, the, the market share on the battery electric vehicle market is already one car out of four in the battery electric vehicle market that is sold by Chinese brands and uh, by Tesla. And when you look at the Chinese markets, which is the most competitive battery electric vehicle market in the world, you can see that these two groups of brands, they control 90% of the market. And that the European brands that used to be leaders in the Chinese market for conventional cars are very, very small. And you can see the reference in price. Huh? So you can see that the Chinese brands are coming to Europe, while well, they have a very strong competitive advantage in terms of the average price of their car. They are 40,000 euros cheaper. And we can see where the European average battery electric vehicle is positioned by comparison to Chinese and uh, you, even US cars. You can see that on each segment, the most expensive battery electric vehicle car on average is made in Europe. And when you look at the impact of this evolution on the production level of countries, you can see that for the time being, the transition is small because we're talking just by a 15% share of the market. But you can see that the squeezing of countries like UK, Italy and France keeps going on. Uh, you can see that the green, red and light blue is, is still becoming smaller. You can see that only the premium manufacturing of cars in Germany is resisting. Uh, and, and you can see that it takes more than 50% of the production of the battery electric vehicle. 
And so you can see that the tendencies that were at play before and we have discussed with the Italian case, with the French case, are still going on. And, and there's nothing is changing with the battery electric vehicle and probably as, as we said with, with Sebastian before, this is actually accelerating. Coming to the conclusion, if I can move in forward. <laughs> okay, so let me come to the conclusion. So, Electrification per se is not the problem, it is the connection of electrification with the upmarket drift. This is not the most efficient way of decarbonizing road transport in Europe by any means. And one of the problems is that we're just electrifying internal combustion engine vehicle in Europe. We are not conceiving battery electric vehicle as new different type of cars that require a new type of regulation, a new regulatory framework that can help car makers in making lighter, more efficient, and more affordable battery electric vehicles. Because if you electrify an ICE car, well, you just add 500 kilograms to a car that was already very heavy and very expensive. So it's not way these cars can be affordable. But the car makers alone cannot make the cheaper battery electric vehicles we need because they are not pushed to doing that. They're, you know, they're kept pushing on doing heavier, more expensive cars. The average battery electric vehicle cars in Europe move from 50,000 euros of price in 2022 to 66,000. So it's still moving in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So we need a different regulatory framework. We cannot keep using the same rules that we had for ICE, for BV, and this must be changed quickly. This is not a just transition because if you look both at the access to cars, citizens need green cars tomorrow. Otherwise, they will not be able to move around. They will not be able to access cities. They will have to pay more money for fuel. They need these cars, but they're not available. And they will not available if you not change the rules. And also, you can see that the same problems we had in countries like Italy, France, or Central European countries keep going on. This is not a just transition for the workers. There is no room for them to take advantage of this transition. They will be on the losing side. So, we need also to take into account the fact that at the same time, this is making the European automotive industry more vulnerable to new competitors. And so the market will also be smaller. And so that will increase the problem. So I think all these elements need an industrial policy at the European level that is not there and needs new regulations. And so I will stop here because all the ones are too long, but I look forward to the debate to be more precise perhaps on some of the proposals that might be put on the table. Thank you very much. So I think what we'll do is we'll open for a Q&A session at the end of the panel, but perhaps our panelist, Tomaso, raised some very important and thought-provoking questions. If you would like to perhaps say a few words um, on the presentation that we just had, and then I have a few questions prepared for you as well, obviously. Um, do, do, shall we go in any particular order? As, uh, as you like. <laughs> I don't, but, Maybe you know, ladies first, but, um, you know, as, okay. as, as it fits. C Celine, please go ahead. Sure, let me start then. Thank you for the presentation. Sorry, Tommaso. We discussed it already a bit last year, but <laughs> we have more to discuss this year. I don't agree with everything. Um, in terms of, of regulation, I mean, you're right. Yes, the, the current CO2 standards were made in a way that you could still, that was the argument of the auto industry, and that you could still have a wide range of vehicles from the big ones to the small ones. Um, we can discuss that another time. But when it comes to BEVs, I think the fact that today uh, the first ones were ICE vehicle turned into BEVs, it's because we had to start somewhere. So we can discuss also if we were too late in the transition or the same. The fact is now we are transitioning, but we had to start with the platform we had, which were for ICE. And we can't see it as a, you know, it's not that, okay, we have now uh, made our ICE in a BEV version and we are done. Of course not. We are still researching, we are still innovating, we are still investing in our facilities and our people. And the next generations, they will be on, and they already exist, on full BEV platform, sought from the first as a BEV. And then, I mean, in terms of CO2, I think the, the energy efficiency um, will come uh, as, a, as an element at some point. But before that, you have already other regulations who are pushing us towards lighter uh, vehicles, towards more recycled content, more sustainable vehicles. That comes in the battery regulation that will come with the ELV. We are going to go towards new materials and so on. It's progressive. So I think we will go in the right direction. And you see plenty of OEMs, and, and we are moving in the same direction, coming to 
smaller vehicles or more affordable vehicles, but it takes time. And this transition is extremely expensive uh, because you need to retrain your people if you don't want to lose them. You need to invest in new facilities uh, in terms of, of production and so on. And you need to finance that with something. And the best way to finance that is to make a margin on the vehicle you sell so that you can reinvest. The markets are still very lukewarm about you know, uh, financing the transition. And, and because there are still doubts about whether BEVs can be profitable, whether they are the right solution or not, it's not necessarily easy to finance yourself fully on the market. So you need to make this money. And it's easier for premiums when you have a bigger vehicle, where you have a bigger margin. There's, there's no surprise there. It doesn't mean that it's like this and that's not going to evolve. I think I would be rather optimistic to think that we are going to move towards a much broader offer in terms of BEV vehicles, but you just need time. Um, that's my initial comments. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andreas. Would you like to jump, jump in? Yes. Um, the mic is working. I would assume you hear me well. No? So, um, also from my side, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to get to know you. I understand you have been in Geneva um, yesterday. Yes. And uh, there, I think you were able to, to witness what Celine just described, that uh, the BEV technology obviously is entering now the smaller vehicle segments, also um, driven by European uh, manufacturers. So um, what you're describing here, that this logic of top-down innovation uh, results in relatively heavy cars, is something uh, that is snapshot-wise correct, but it moves in a, into a different direction. No. Um, yes, some of the um, European automakers, and namely the so-called premium brands, have a certain customer base. And yes, you know, not only the auto industry, but also media and, and many uh, people uh, also from academia were proposing that the logic of you need to have minimum uh, four or five hundred uh, kilometers real world range in an electric vehicle you know, resulted in uh, an industry responding to that request from customers, from media, from stakeholders in providing vehicles that actually do cover four to five hundred kilometers. And yes, in turn, uh, with a battery electric vehicle, you see then weight growing. Yeah. Now, the answer to that question could be, um, you know, you probably uh, have uh, a vehicle that does not necessarily cover um, all issues in life, yeah, like, uh, you know, doing your daily commute, which is somewhere between 35 and 40 kilometers per day on average, but also allows you to drive to your grandma or to Italy into the vacation or wherever, yeah, but then you end up with numerous cars per household, which again is a question, hmm, do you really want that, yeah? So there are mixed targets here, mixed KPIs that you need to, to, um, to follow. And uh, I think also with Celine seeing the glass half full, mm -hmm. the auto industry is broadening the offers. Yes, the Chinese uh, competitors play a role here as well, obviously. By the way, um, when you compare the Chinese market prices at least, you need to bear also in mind that uh, battery capacities in the Chinese market vehicles are way lower than they are with the European and also with the US American competitors. So that is also a factor that, uh, you know, it's, it's always uh, relevant to compare what you, uh, what you want to compare versus uh, actual numbers then. Um, I think what you concluded with, and that is we need a different industry policy that is something that many stakeholders uh, would support. And, uh, you know, when you think of the value chain, uh, mainly where, um, you know, 90% of the refined lithium is in Chinese hands, yeah? where you have a real issue around semiconductors, according to McKinsey, 11 million cars were not built during the semiconductor crisis, which has a repercussion on you know, the bottom line of, of uh, OEM's um, uh, annual turnouts, but also, you know, with regards to labor and other topics, it is a huge issue, yeah? Then um, there are plenty of open topics here, not to speak about infrastructure, not to speak about uh, generation of green energy, and not to speak about the integrity of the grid. That is the question, what happens behind the charger? No? So many, many open items, all of them, and I think that is something we really can probably even concur, resulting in a request for the EU policymakers in the next term 
to come up with something that deserves the name of a European industry policy. And I would go even further to say uh, that also covers then an automotive industry strategy that is uh, really worthwhile keeping that extremely important industry in Europe and keeping it thriving, as the US Americans do, as the Chinese do. Thank you very much, Andreas. Perhaps, Villa, would you, you would also say, like to say a few words? Well, uh, you know, uh, I have a dilemma, actually. Uh, better to say a few words now or, or start my input, uh, which is actually related I think, to I think the... we could actually start with the input. You have around 10 minutes each, if that's okay. So we have 15 minutes for the Q&A at the end. In any case, my question was a segue, perfect segue to your presentation for Bella anyway. So are we going towards a more unequal but greener future or not? So is it than me? Okay, uh, well, I will then start. Uh, well, the way it looks like we are going towards a more unequal um, a, a, a future of mobility. Uh, and I have the feeling also based on Tommaso's presentation and also based on the most recent developments of, on the automotive market that some very basic policy issues are wrong and we missed an early opportunity uh, to embark on a well sustainable uh, a, a, a transition process and i tried to to uh, uh, put this into some points let's start first what do we mean about a just transition in mobility or in for the car industry this first would mean to have a place for europe so this means preserve european competence in building these mobility solution not only cars uh, then there is uh, the just part, certainly for the workers, how the workers are facing these, all these restructuring processes on their massive uh, uh, cost pressure that we have seen when we saw the different countries and the different plants. It is a battle. It is really a battlefield. Uh, uh, how to manage this uh, in a just way for workers and then how this transition can be just for the whole society that means affordability of mobility of of affordability of of sustainable mobility for all uh, and within that also in individual mobility so this is really about the affordability uh, but this is not uh, uh, it is also linked to the major objective decarbonization uh, because, well, okay, so if we look at the 2040 targets now that, that came out, and with that, or at least a commission proposal and sectoral uh, composition, then actually for, for transport, the 2050 target is zero. It's real zero. So it's not the net, the net, net zero is something else. It is a combination of sectors, especially with the privilege to the agriculture. Uh, 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 not uh, uh, doing so for transport, it's really zero. Yeah? Uh, and then, then you might really have the question, how to achieve that? Is it possible to achieve that? Uh, and, and then I come back, uh, well, okay, first I would like to say what were the issues that we were <coughs> underestimating, uh, the challenges that we didn't realize enough uh, early. Uh, we have been following this debate at least five, six years now. Uh, most of the concerns have always been raised about the labor supply or the labor need of electromobility. So building an electric car is attached with less labor demand. So this is actually the problem. 
that uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, on embarking on the course of back to mobility, we are losing uh, employment, and that was kind of in focus all the time. But it was not so much uh, in the centre of the debates. What is the position of Europe in this transformation, and how competent Europe is in the uh, the competition to electromobility, and this means uh, we underestimated this handicap European automotive industry is facing in the competition with China and the US uh, with the heritage of the IC, uh, uh, so the combustion engine technology, that was actually a European monopoly. monopoly. It was the Europe excellence, uh, and that was where Europe is really, really uh, in, a, in, a, in a top uh, position and had been uh, a real, uh, uh, so, uh, and to transform this system into electromobility is a different thing than the, the upcoming from scratch uh, Chinese uh, hundreds of, of, uh, of uh, 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 enterprises that are growing out of battery production and, and suppliers and some state-owned one. It's a full mix of and a very competitive landscape. And the US where, uh, well, okay, apart from Detroit, there is a genuine new uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, landscape building up, mostly uh, based on venture capital and capital market financing. And the Chinese uh, one is financed uh, by, well, a very active role of the state uh, uh, overall with a very, uh, very, well, a strong uh, industrial policy. Uh, whereas in Europe, the only way to finance this transformation that is starting anyway from the handicap is purely market-based. So companies need to finance all that from their own profits. And this is that drives the companies uh, for, well, the high margin cars uh, and for, well, mostly the uh, 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 upmarket uh, uh, trend. This is, it looks quite dysfunctional uh, and it is definitely dysfunctional in two ways. The one, to achieve the, the emission targets, because this is, as Tomaso said, a really much harder way to do. Uh, and it is also socially, uh, well, uh, not very fair and just because it doesn't provide uh, affordability. Uh, for normal people, uh, not even in Western Europe, uh, not to speak about the rest. I would only uh, mention one uh, 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 thing, uh, it is from Tommaso's paper, uh, that is saying that for Central Eastern European countries, the total fleet change with the current uh, car market uh, would take 48 years, 48 years. So I mean, what I mean, uh, uh, this is the the expected time of the total. So when the last uh, uh, car that is now on the road uh, would disappear, I mean this is incredible, and this is going up each year, uh, and the car fleets even in Western Europe are getting older. Uh, so it is not a sustainable process. But uh, but uh, but what I would, uh, and that is really a question. Uh, I completely agree with Tommaso to point to the dysfunctionality of this upmarket drift and also that the uh, previous, well, the steel, uh, the current uh, uh, CO2 regulation and the uh, uh, emission standards are pointing to this direction with the uh, uh, mass adjustment uh, uh, formula, plus also the technical standards uh, are helping that. But is this all? I mean, is it, and, 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 and what can you do? So is it really the case that if we, I wonder, from tomorrow on, the mass adjustment formula would disappear? Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm not really sure how to get this done, because the car companies now are 
absolutely under the squeeze of, of margins, and they are just, uh, without having a profit margin, they, they would, I mean, it's, uh, uh, they, they wouldn't, well, sign up uh, to this. Uh, and by the way, uh, in the previous panel, we also talked about actually companies are quite profitable. The last year profits were good. Yes, but I mean, uh, most of these profits were done with the combustion engine. And this is why Mercedes is now uh, 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 prolonging uh, the life of the combustion engine compared to its own uh, 2030 uh, exit target. Uh, prolonging, uh, uh, Audi is, is uh, expanding uh, 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 also the combustion engine uh, uh, part, uh, that is also a problem for, for the European uh, uh, location now. Uh, so, how, how, okay, I have to finish, yes? Uh, so, I mean, the question is how to make it, uh, because, uh, and then the last thing uh, on that is, well, well okay, so, I really think that we are talking about European industrial policy and about the non-existence of this policy. Uh, but this is really, really a problem. And without having European resources, no sovereignty fund, uh, this, this absolutely uh, minimalistic uh, step, uh, uh, we will not going anywhere. Thank you very much, Bella. I think now we can hear the industry point of view and, and Celine, perhaps. Um, you've outlined quite clearly in the event that we had, I think it was a year ago, more or less, what Volvo is doing, uh, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about how Volvo is at the forefront of integrating sustainable practices and if there are specific programs to address workers' needs and concerns in this transition. Right. Um... <sighs> What we have done, when we took the decision to go full electric, of course that meant a massive transformation for the company. Um, the first question was, what's going to happen to the people? Uh, because as you said, we say traditionally you need less people to assemble a battery electric vehicle, so what do we do? So what we did initially was to try to integrate more tasks. So for example in Ghent, which was the first plant that we turned full electric, um, well, we uh, created, we removed a parking lot to create a battery assembly plant. And so those of the workers who could not work anymore on assembling the car moved to the battery assembly. Uh, that has required three years of work in terms of retraining all the workers, for which we got support as well from the local authority. Um, and, and that's part of the, the solution is to integrate more tasks. I think for many years in the industry, we had a trend where we let a lot of things done by the suppliers and, and now you see a trend where we bring back some of the things that we might have outsourced in the past to create more jobs. Um, so, and we are still creating jobs and we're opening a new plant in Slovakia that will open new jobs as well there, so uh, it's not all negative. This being said, yes, some jobs will be lost and you need a lot of retraining uh, and that costs and that takes time and support is always appreciated for that. Second thing, we have a paradox because we are also uh, having difficulties to hire all the competence and talents that we need. <laughs> so on the one hand, you have too many people, on the other, we don't find the right ones. And, and we are competing today with sectors we didn't use to compete with. When you're looking for software experts, for example, you're competing with the Googles and, and you know, uh, Apple of this world. And sometimes going to California is sexier than going to Göteborg, for instance. So, it's not an easy fight. I don't see why, but you know, <laughs> more sunshine maybe. In any case, and more seriously, uh, we need to develop a lot of new skills that we need in our industry that we maybe not have needed before. And that's, that's also a new challenge for us. Uh, we are opening tech hubs in Stockholm, in Poland, to try to attract these talents. And there, I must say, actually the sustainability part, the going towards electrification, trying to do the right thing in a way to address the challenge of transportation and make it more sustainable is actually an advantage because a lot of the people applying to work for us are actually appealed by this idea that we want to do the right thing and try to minimize the impact that our industry has on the planet. So, you know, you have to find the right balance. Uh, I'm not sure we have completely found it yet, but we definitely have a lot of measures. Um, again, you can, have, you can think about the general regulatory framework that could help uh, today working in one country and 
For another one, it's still complicated, despite the single market, you know, in terms of taxation and whatever else. So there would be ways also to facilitate um, uh, mobility of workers and so on. And, and in the supplier industry, I think it will be much more difficult than it is for the OEMs in terms of workers. The impact will probably be much bigger. And I think when we talk about, and you had a question maybe later about, you know, joining forces together and discussing what can be done. I think if you look at the full electromobility ecosystem, so not just the production of cars, uh, but if you look at the infrastructure to charge it, the electricity, Andreas, you mentioned the grids, and they, they are going to, lot, uh, to, to need a lot of work to be able to sustain the electrification, not only of transport, but of uh, production uh, in Europe anyway. All this is going to require much more jobs. So the jobs which will, loss, which will be lost, there will be new ones coming, but the problem is that you don't have a 100% match, of course. It's not because you're losing a plant in the middle of Portugal that the, the jobs are needed there, and maybe it will be in the north of Denmark, and then that's far less easy. So that's where I think the work needs to be done between the industry in a broader sense than just us, uh, and uh, policymakers and trade unions to see what can be done. How can you have a better match? How can you, uh, you know, encourage mobility? How can you support retraining or rescaling? Um, what else has we done in terms of sustainability <laughs> to continue? And I think to go back to the cars becoming also lighter and, and hopefully cheaper at some point, um, it doesn't stop with electrification. Electrification is a fast way to zero tailpipe. Uh, and we don't have much choice because if we want to be at zero in 2050, as you said, uh, right now the options are limited. But obviously we know that it's not the end of the, of the road. Uh, the batteries take a lot of energy and resources to be built, and that's the biggest CO2 component of the, of the BEV that needs to be tackled. And if you look at uh, biodiversity, not just carbon, but biodiversity, then you see electronics is actually one of the main culprits. So if you want to have more sustainable vehicles, we are going to need to work on a lot of things. Circularity is one. And, um, that's why uh, I think at EU level, rather than focusing, and again, I think energy efficiency will come anyway for, for car standards, but I think we need to look at the broader picture, and that would be f really going uh, faster on renewable energy, access to renewable energy, and that needs to be affordable as well, both for the people charging their cars and for us uh, as manufacturer, because energy is one of the biggest costs we have. Uh, and, you know, if we have access to renewable and more affordable energy, we can also lower the cost of our production and therefore of our vehicles. Second thing is working, again, as you said, in China, they have the lithium, they have all the processes. We don't, and we don't have all the raw materials in Europe. And that, they are not going to come miraculously to Europe, but we can actually do more refining, processing, and recycling in Europe, and that's where we would need investments. And if it's not public investments, because member states are not always particularly enthusiastic about that, <laughs> at least facilitate access to the funds that exist and facilitate permitting and facilitate all these kind of things. So there's other ways to go around to support uh, industrialization and that will help as well. Um, and what else? Affordability for people. The other challenge for car makers is that we used to make cars and that's how we make money and that was all fine. But as you said, the market is not growing that much anymore in Europe. It's a mature market. So, and, and again, to go to more sustainable mobility, it will not just be about replacing ice by BEVs. It's also about changing patterns and how the way people move and maybe less cars or differently. Uh, and that's a big change for us because that needs, we need a new business model, so to speak. And you don't invent that from you know, one day to the next, you don't change, and you try, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, a lot of car sharing schemes have disappeared, new are coming. It's not easy. And because you have a gap as well between younger people who are maybe more ready to switch directly to a new model, and older ones, even like me, who are used to a car since, you know, the day I was 16, I started driving and not having a car. So, yeah. <laughs> but legally, you know. Legally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With my parents in the car. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, but you see what I mean? Where I'm used to have a car, it's, it's, whereas maybe my kids will not be used to that and they will be used more to taking their bikes or the metro because it's more natural to them. This is an ongoing journey. Uh, for car makers, it's not an easy journey, but I think we are all embracing it now. We are all trying different things. The EU can definitely help with better frameworks. Um, what we don't mention as well is the difficulty of, um, you know, sometimes take CBAM. CBAM is a good thing in the sense that they want to compensate for the fact that maybe in other parts of the world the materials are not produced in the same uh, carbon efficient way as we do. Okay, good. But then you look at 
the details and you're like, mm, maybe there might be negative consequences, but okay, let's be optimistic. How do I report? And then you are faced with, my God, on your computer, such kind of tables that I think you need a degree to be able to fill that in. And that's resources that you're not spending on something else, which would be a better use of the money. So we're not saying, I mean, EU regulations are good. They are pushing us in the right direction. They can be supportive. But in terms of implementation, in terms of the, you know, how we can live with them. There's a lot of progress to be done. And I think for us as Volvo Cars, main message for the Commission is you've done a lot with the Green Deal uh, you know, under this legislature. You've set a course which is extremely clear for our sector. Fine, that's done and we're happy with that. But now implementation, because we are still waiting for a lot uh, to be implemented, to know how to implement it. Simplify things. We don't know how many passports we would need. We need one passport for the battery, maybe one for the car, maybe one for something else. You know, so simplify what you've done. Make sure that it's workable for the industry, not adding cost. And then you know, support renewable energy, support um, raw materials in Europe, strategic partnerships, because we are a global uh, sector and we are in a global world and we need the others because we don't have everything in Europe. And with that, we should be on the path and then we can go and work on small affordable cars for the public. Thank you very much. It's, it is sparkling, yeah. yeah. So Andreas, I have a, a segue question for you. So do you think that the current trajectory towards electromobility is going to succeed for EU manufacturers? And what are, at least in your opinion, the primary challenges? Is it market share decline or is it complexities of vertical integration or something else? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. And um, before, before I jump into it, I uh, just want to uh, build up on one or two topics that you mentioned. One is, whereas the uh, OEMs, the actual car manufacturers, will in a way deal with that, the suppliers will have an issue. Yeah? And we've seen numerous studies, uh, also by our colleague association, if you like, um, Klepa, um, uh, producing numbers in that regard uh, and, and uh, making that part of the discussion. But as I'm here uh, in, in, in this forum, I think it is extremely important to also remind everyone of the role of the suppliers, not only for our industries, you know, value creation to a large degree happens in the supply chain for us, but also when you think about labor market and name the topic of uh, skill uh, and so on and so on. And even if, as you pointed out, uh, net there might be trade-offs and you know, uh, other industries will employ, um, looking at Germany, and I think it's not different in other areas of the world, supply bases are very regional. Yeah, you have local and regional champions and areas uh, geographically where suppliers are basically uh, the main uh, employers. And you cannot tell anyone from Turinga in Germany to go to Portugal, not for holidays in this case, but to stay there and, and uh, become a happy um, employee in a, in a solar factory or whatever. Yeah? So there are many structural issues out there. Another structural issue you just mentioned, but I think it's worthwhile reminding everybody of is in Europe, compared to the US and also China, the energy prices are two to three times higher. And when you have energy intensive industries and with every battery vehicle we are producing, the energy dependency rises uh, in our production cycles and value chains, then this is a cost factor. And this is the question for industry policy. Now I'm finally coming to your question. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, so thinking of the market, I am somewhat optimistic. You know, this industry has shown over 100 plus years that it's able also to, to transform, to change, to innovate. And innovation is a key topic here. Yeah? And uh, again, uh, Tommaso, you have been to, to Geneva where you saw tons of Chinese uh, exhibitors. Yeah? but also the one or the other European and um, probably the company of the current ATSEA president, Luca Di Meo, for example, without mentioning the brand name Renault. Oh, I did. Um, 
who are actually moving in that direction. And there are other member companies of ATSEA obviously doing very much the same uh, because the question of the affordable electric vehicle is going to be one of the major game changers uh, going forward. And everybody knows that. It's, it's not a secret. It's, it's well, well taken care of. The question is, do we have a level playing field? Yeah? Do we have in an international comparison a level playing field? And the answer up to now is probably no. We have, as you pointed out, uh, Bella, and, and very interestingly so, though, thank you for your, for your intervention here. We have in the US a very supportive, for numerous reasons, a very supportive climate. And we have in particular in China a very supportive climate. And in particular, when you think China, then you have a large command over the value chain here as well, which is an extremely important factor. Yeah? because it gives you also the ability to play with prices. Yeah? Namely, if you have a political strategy behind it. And so when you're asking me about the market, the answer is product-wise, I'm optimistic. Level playing field-wise, I'm not so optimistic. And it's a difficult question here because, you know, um, what we don't want is a trade war, you know, with the... Uh, uh, with the um, electric vehicle as a reason for that. But what we probably want is conditions in the EU that supports in a similar level and a, to a similar degree as they do in the Chinese and um, US economic environment. And I can only, and I take that as a little marketing break for you, uh, refer to the ATSEA manifesto here. Yeah where some of the key topics are actually mentioned. Uh, I brought some five with me. There's uh, tons of material on the ATSEA homepage available in that regard. And that is, an, I think, uh, a relatively important contribution to what the next commission is going to do. Yeah? Um, it's a little bit of a make it and break it. Yeah? It's a little bit of a make it and break it. It's very important. And uh, that brings me to the second part of your question, and I mentioned it several times now. The question of um, you know the value chain and and how we are going to play that topic. We need to do more in Europe. That's the easy answer. We need to do more, and it's a difficult one because when you go to Germany today and say, "Listen, guy, I found lithium in your backyard. Let's do a mine here," the answer will be lukewarm to say the least. Yeah. So uh, it's not only geographically and geological availability of that raw materials, but it's also about culture and it's also about the willingness and the understanding that Europe has something to lose. You pointed out, global champion, the auto industry being dominating, uh, one of the last European uh, export champions, by the way, uh, with a global uh, relevance. And I think if Europe decides to be a manufacturing continent also in the mid and long term, it will need the auto industry as a backbone. And in turn, the auto industry wants to be in Europe and wants to be that backbone that has been so relevant. By the way, also in the last crises of Corona and so on, I think the European auto industry, the OEMs, as much as the um, suppliers have shown that with them, uh, the situation in Europe is better than it would be without them. And we want to play that important role going forward, but we need EU policies to support that. Thank you very much. So I think we have a good 15 minutes for, for open questions from the public. Um, if you could raise your hand, I think we can collect three and then address them. And then I think we have time for, for a few rounds. So, I think we can go from the front. I already. Speak loud. Hi. No. Yeah. Now it works. Thank you very much. Um, and Andreas Klugischer, you've said something. If you could present yourself, yeah, that would sorry. be sorry. Yeah, again, <laughs> I did it in the morning already. Claudia Supan Steiermark, uh, here for the regional perspective. Andreas Klugischer, you, you said very wisely that uh, you can't, well, that the suppliers are key and that there are regions where you've got clusters of suppliers 
and that these regions are potentially in troubles, or you can't sort of uh, compare an average somehow of Europe to these regions. So what advice would you give to those regions who have mainly suppliers and not OEMs and have strong clusters? So maybe you've got some advice for us. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Hannah. I work for Lower Saxony, one of the German regions. Can Sorry. you hear me now? A no? bit. The mic, yeah. A bit louder. It's, it's green, so it should be, yeah, yeah. very closely, like Better. this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I work for Lower Saxony, one of the German regions. Uh, I have just, uh, of course, I will read the ASEA publication, no, uh, no question about it, but maybe you can give me a glimpse. Uh, do you consider, uh, when, when uh, suggesting measures, that maybe some of the measures taken by the US and also by China are not uh, WTO com, um, compliant. And uh, the EU is predetermined to, to uh, keep to the uh, WTO standards. Um, do you uh, also um, elaborate on that? Thank you. Hello, my name is Sigfrido Ramirez. I'm from Jerpisa, also like Tommaso. It's a question for the people of industry. I think that in September uh, there was a manifesto of the stakeholders of the automobile industry asking the European Commission to do more and to restart a dialogue uh, of the sector, which looks like there has not been dialogue in the previous four years, what I have the impression when reading that, or not at the level you were expecting. There are now elections, uh, so... Probably, are you, what, what is the situation now? The, the Commission has given you more uh, elements aside from this announcement uh, that was done by Ursula von der Leyen to open an anti-subsidy uh, investigation, which probably will not change anything in the short run. Uh, so this is one question. And maybe one of the measures that you are requiring collectively uh, uh, was, for example, that the Euro 7 regulation was not stricter in, uh, in, in pollutants, like apparently has been the case now. So this is a good uh, uh, aper uh, aperitive of what is expecting from industry now, that we go more on that direction of uh, uh, low, less regulations, like in Euro 7, which I, some, some people, I think, transport and environment call it Euro 6, because there's not much change from Euro 7, not the, the current regulation. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can start addressing these uh, first three questions. I think they were mainly addressed to Selina and Andreas, but perhaps also Bela and Tomaso, you would like to jump in and say a few words. Perhaps Celine, you would like to, to go first? I wonder if they got more, more towards Andreas, but I can try to answer anyway. On the clusters, yeah, I don't have a miracle solution, but I think... Sorry. Oh, sure. Sorry, no, can no. you hear me? Yes, I can um, better. Maybe mapping of the skills which are present in these clusters and, and see then what's possible around. It's not going to work everywhere, but I've heard that, for example, in, in uh, Ghent and Antwerpen, you have Humicore with uh, stronger materials and recycling, and you also have uh, the, the petrochemical industry. And the petrochemical industry, at some point, they are going to have less business to do when you know, they don't have to sell petrol for cars, and, and Yumiko is actually poaching them because you need the same kind of skills or they can reuse this skill or retrain easily for what they're doing with recycling. It's not a miracle solution, it's not going to work everywhere, but again, you know, trying to, to talk in a broader sense, industry broader sense than just automotive, maybe some places it will work to find that actually the skills that are there are very close to what other who are investing in, in different things are looking for. So uh, that's one idea. Uh, on trade, I think Europe is, is probably the most open market you can find. Uh, and, and we are trade believers. And, and as a Swedish company, we are definitely free trade believers. But clearly, not all uh, abide by the same rules. And we know that the WTO is not in a particularly good shape for different reasons, uh, which doesn't facilitate things. Um, <laughs> Europe is trying not to be naive, and they are launching investigations, for example, whether that will have the right outcome or not, we don't know. 
Um, it's a very complicated question. I think we should not go towards a global trade war that will help no one. And, and as Andrea said, first, we don't have all the materials we need here. And when we have them, we are not quite sure that the people who are on top of them will be very happy for us to go and dig. Uh, so, yeah, keep on the dialogue open. Try, I mean, pray for Trump not to come back. Pray for the WTO to, you know, get back on its feet. Uh, but that's a lot of uh, if and wishful thinking. I do realize that. Um, and meanwhile, make sure that you try to, you know, help what you have on the ground. So again, invest in more circularity and collection so that you can get more materials without digging it. Strike partnerships with the, the countries that are still open to these kind of things and, and willing to cooperate. And uh, but it's going to be a long road and no easy solution for me. And on the last thing, um, on Euro 7, uh, I think for the industry, it was a bit more the question of you're asking us to go very far on a technology that you're telling us is going to disappear. In our case, we are happy it's disappearing. We want to be there. But, you know, investing in, in a technology that we are supposed to make disappear when we need so much money for the new technology didn't seem like the smartest way to spend our money. So that was the main critical point we had towards the Commission, and I think we have been heard. So at least for the passenger car side, I don't know for the, for the truck side, but for the passenger car side, I think we have been heard enough so that now we do not have to pour so much money into something that the Commission is telling us do not produce in, uh, you know, in 15 years. Less than that now, 10. Thank you, Celine. Andreas? Okay. Yeah. Um, so on the supply base question, thank you for that. Um, Question And I want to reiterate that the, uh, the car manufacturers have been more and more dependent on the suppliers and will also in the future depend on suppliers. Yes, there's insourcing uh, happening. Yeah? Some do it more, some do it less, but the role of the suppliers is going to be extremely important. So, uh, Celine, you were pointing out upskilling uh, is, is, uh, is a topic there. Uh, when you think of the broader aspects of auto industry, we have been traditionally also very much benefiting from the fact that the supply base was willing and able to innovate. And that does not change with the advent of the electric vehicle. So that innovation potential that is in the supplier base is going to be extremely relevant going forward and uh, you know i can only encourage everyone who runs a small medium probably even large uh, company in the supply chain to give us innovation because you know the the development of the electric vehicle is on an industrial scale i don't know 15 years old maybe something 20 maybe so there's room there's room for innovation there and it will be driven also to a large degree by the supply base you know uh, celine was praying for the um, for making wto functional again and as a son of a vicar i'm all into praying you know <laughs> here we go but um i would be surprised if that works out <laughs> The answer cannot be trade wars. I think that's also understood. Uh, I think the answer is to some degree that the European Union looks at its own strength and potentials and just plays the game. That doesn't mean, you know, a, a financial kind of trade war, so to say, in the sense of, you know, the more money I throw out, the better I am. But it certainly also means uh, that you look into the uh, regulatory overburden here comes your question then to some degree, and really decide what is priority here. Yeah? There are many means that Europe can do without paying so much money. Yeah? And uh, you know, if, if Europe wants to know what to do in that regard, the new commission, uh, ATSEA, is willing to help. You know? we, are, we, we have some ideas. Yeah? Uh, and that brings me over to, um, to your intervention. Um, so I think when you refer to the manifesto, it's probably the one that I had in hand just a minute ago. Yeah? Um, and when there is the impression that the commission doesn't speak with the auto industry and the auto industry doesn't speak with the commission, then this is a wrong impression. You know? There is an interaction. There is also, I think, on the commission side, a general understanding that this industry is important going forward. And yes, here and there, there are 
some signs that this industrial deal logic resonates, and it does. Yeah? So let's see what is happening. Euro 7, when you are considering that, and I may misunderstood you a little bit, as a sign that the Commission finally uh, has decided to be uh, less pushy. I'm very much uh, with Celine, uh, you know. Um, this Euro 7 regulation is still a regulation, so it's, it's there. And uh, the initial idea uh, of the Commission was according to the auto industry, but also I think according to many, many experts, really going into extremes and with that making it super costly. So uh, I think while Euro 7 is again a new regulatory framework that pushes the limits again further, it is uh, better than it used to be. Yeah, But uh, I wouldn't say it's, it's a win or anything like that for the auto industry in that regard. And um, I think that's probably all fields covered, I hope. Tommaso, perhaps you would like to um, respond to the questions, but also perhaps to the interventions that yes. succeeded you as well. So, I think one key element when you think about how to make affordable a battery electric vehicle, and then of course, I think you're right, you, you, you have to touch upon autonomy. That, that's how, you know, you just say that. In China, they're, they're cheaper. Yes, of course. They have smaller autonomy. And at the same time, we are used to have cars that make 500, 600 kilometers of autonomy. So we need to, if we want to have an affordable electric cars with a smaller autonomy, then we have changed our way of using a car. But are there policies and regulations that are helping cities, regions, countries to go into this direction? I do not see any. So I perfectly understand you when you say, well, they tell us, well, quite out of the blue in 2022, well, in, 10, in 12 years' time, you need to make 100% electric vehicle sales. But at the same time, you're not putting on the plate anything to help me making this vehicle affordable. You keep a regulation that actually says, if you make heavy cars, you get lower CO2 regulation. Why I should make any lighter cars? It doesn't make any sense. That's you put this incitation on the table. You're not making anything to help me selling cars with smaller batteries that requires Recharging station everywhere requires new mobility system, requires rethinking the integration of cars in modal service. So when I need to go 500 kilometers from the house, perhaps I take a train, but it's integrated in a mobility system where it works for me. Nothing is on the plate of that. Of course, cities are doing that. Some cities in Northern European country, each one going in his direction with each one different regulation on about how do I let cars in, how do let cars out, how many, which kind of taxation, what kind of fiscal policy. Each city is different. And these are very weak policies. They are not roadmap. They are not fixed on target. Mm. So I perfectly hear you. I mean, what can we do? We just go the way in which the European Union has set things out. But I think they were not very well thought of. The same about the battery value chain. I mean, it's very strange that you have to weigh the IRA to realize that you need a, 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 near, a net zero act, industrial act. No, I mean, first you decide to go 100% sales of electric cars, and then you realize that you don't have the batteries to, to, to supply that car. I mean, so I think that when we talk about industrial policy, it's also general view, a strategy, and desirable goals. I think, personally, that if you want to make affordable electric cars, that cannot be let out in the air and say, well, let's you figure out. That needs to be put on agenda and figure out how do you make it concretely. And you coordinate that from the top to the bottom. Because if you have 27 different approaches how to do that, well, the industry will not be able to make that affordable car. So I think that when we talk industrial policy, we talk about a general framework and strategy. And I think all the problems you're talking about is that there is no plan, no strategy, and that is urgently needed. And I think that starting from that, what are our desirable goals? We want affordable cars for everybody, then we need to think what kind of regulation we need for that. We cannot just let the market play out. We want what market share for European car manufacturers tomorrow, but then we have to think about Chinese competition. I agree with you, trade is not a solution. Trade barriers was a solution with the Japanese car makers because we didn't do anything in Japan. <laughs> uh, that's true. It wasn't too easy to say to Japanese car makers in the 80s and 90s, we freeze you 
your market share, and then we figure out how to integrate, and that will work out well. With China, you cannot do that, so trade barriers are not a solution, but you need to deal with them too. Chinese car makers want to be in Europe, they are in Volvo, uh, and, and you can deal with them, but you need to set an agenda, okay? How do we make an agreement about the batteries we need, the technologies we need, uh, the mark, how, how do you make investment in Europe, uh, under which conditions, uh, just transition? I mean, is it fair that Gigafactory in Hungary use workers that come from Philippines under uh, six months temporary? I don't think so. I'm, uh, I'm playing by different rules in my factories in, in, in Europe. Why should Chinese investors have a different advantage? I think all these things need to be laid out and negotiated. I think this is terribly missing. So I, I see many stakeholders, industry all, Benjamin Denise before, you from RCA, Secret Devries yesterday. I think also environmental NGOs should agree on that. And I think that there is the scope for putting aside difference between different stakeholders and coming up with a common proposition for the next commission and say, well, this is a green deal. Well, the previous one was not a deal. The deal is I put something on the table, you put something on the table and we find an agreement. Now let's make a green deal. I think that should be a convergent, if each actor, each stakeholder keeps uh, pulling uh, the cover on their side, I think we will not get that. I think the stakes are too important to be in that situation and that is very important to find a convergent point from the stakeholders point of view and then figure out a plan and a strategy. Thank you very much, Tommaso. Perhaps, Villa, you would like to say a few concluding words to this hmm. panel? Uh, well, okay, I, I'm aware that the time is up, uh, so really like, okay, one thing on the trade, um, uh, trade barriers, it's really not kind of Europe, Europe's um, uh, tool. Uh, Europe is the weakest link uh, between the US and, 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 and China. Uh, both have instruments and power that Europe doesn't have not only because Europe is fragmented, but, uh, but, but dependencies are there. So this is really, really, I think, uh, quite uh, uh, off, off the table. But we will see. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, what is, what Andreas called as level playing field, this is really what, uh, where, where uh, much more uh, could have been done, and it is absolutely unbelievable that there is nothing there. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, not only in the Net Zero Industry Act uh, as, as, as labor uh, 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 conditionalities, but also with the state aid and the investment incentives. So when the Hungarian government is now providing one or two billion euros for BID to put up the first big Chinese EV company, uh, there is no conditionality uh, for uh, at least some minimum standards uh, I, on labor and environment. And the same was with the, the uh, uh, cattle, uh, and before that uh, with Samsung and LG, so four battery gigafactories, uh, had been uh, established with massive support, with the uh, uh, commission's uh, approval, uh, without any health and safety, environmental, labor standard, at least some minimum. This would be easy to do. Uh, that would be the first step. But this is really the main direction I think uh, would be uh, uh, important. On the suppliers, I would only like to say one thing, which, uh, which comes from the German study, Johannes, uh, uh, which is another dimension of the supplier side, that some of the suppliers in this completely different uh, vertical uh, perspective are completely different than the old ones. For example, Amazon and Google, a supplier. You don't deal with them the same way that uh, with uh, OEMs uh, when they have needs in the software uh, side and in those uh, uh, parts that Europe is still not uh, properly prepared you have different conditions. Uh, so it's the other way around, supplier. Uh, uh, that's, that's another uh, side of the story. OK, so that's... Thank, thank you. you very much, Vela. And also thank you very much to all of our panelists and keynote speech as well. I think we'll see you in 
10 minutes so that we can start for the second panel at 4 p.m. sharp. Thank you very much. Second panel? I can open this. I can open it. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have to get started now with the second panel. So for this final session of the conference, we will be focusing on um, just transition uh, and what this means in terms of policy framework. Uh, obviously related to the automotive industry. I have the pleasure of having with me today Judith Kirkendarling. She has um, been elected very recently as General Secretary of Industrial. Fabio Domanico, that is the Deputy Head of Unit Fair Green and Digital Transition at the European Commission. Christina Tilling, that is Head of Land and Transport at the European Transport Workers Federation, ETF. Oh, oh no. And finally, Thomas Wobben, Director of Legislative Works at the Committee of Regions. Um, is everything okay over there? <laughs> okay, well, I think we can get started with the first question. Um, that a question for, for Judith. So, from an industrial perspective, what are the key elements of a just transition policy framework um, that would ensure that workers in the automotive uh, sector are not left behind? And we know that just transition has been a very important uh, topic that you've been working on, especially with the Just Transition Manifesto. So, perhaps you could say a few words about that. Sure. Um, so good afternoon everybody and, um, and thanks for the invitation uh, to Industrial Europe being twice. Uh, I think we, we're top and tailing uh, today, so with uh, Benjamin this morning and he, um, he gave me a bit of a, an update of what he said uh, this morning, so hopefully uh, we'll be singing from the same uh, hymn sheet, uh, that's always good. Um, on, um, and he said this morning that he uh, already outlined, outlined how um, important the whole question of just transition is for industrial Europe. Um, in 2022, we published um, a Just Transition Manifesto, uh, which laid out the experience uh, after around 25 roundtables that we organized at regional level, at um, national level, in sectors, in different parts of Europe where the uh, topic is particularly um, uh, difficult. I mean, I think you can see from the slides in uh, Tommaso's presentation that I saw earlier, and I'm sure in the discussion this morning, the countries where the question of the transition is more complicated than elsewhere. And as a result of all of that um, grassroots uh, discussion and, and policy uh, discussion, we developed a common manifesto uh, within industrial Europe. Obviously, this covers uh, the automotive industry, but broader, it covers our full manufacturing, mining and energy uh, membership. Um, and since 2022, we have been pushing uh, that uh, manifesto. Now, there are different elements to it. Part of it is about a call for an industrial policy at European level, an industrial plan. Um, and, uh, and I think some of that has come out in the last, um, in the last panel. Um, then there, in terms of managing uh, the uh, transformation underway in our, in our industries, uh, clearly you have to n understand and be able to measure what you then want to deal with in policy. And what we've fundamentally lacked at European level and in many member states and in many regions is really a, a common mapping and an understanding of where the workers are today who are impacted by the transition and where the uh, jobs tomorrow will be. That kind of uh, proper, effective employment and skills mapping, which is so fundamental if you want to then uh, develop 
on the one hand a public policy framework um, in terms of uh, the transition but also for trade unionists shop stewards in companies at regional level at sector level to be able to negotiate and understand in an, in the negotiations exactly the full um, the full scale of of the of the situation you really need uh, that common mapping so that uh, that is a, a fundamental part of, of what we have laid out um, and then following on from that mapping you then have uh, the framework for negotiation um, for us it's absolutely uh, clear that you can have a transition your transition may be more or less fair but it's not a just transition unless it's negotiated by the workers impacted by the transition through their trade unions and workers representatives um, with employers and government representatives and that negotiation has to be done at different levels it can't be just left as we've seen in some countries to the company level to the site level where it's very difficult to negotiate fair just transitions um, when um, sites are you can't negotiate at a regional level but work looking at job to job transitions within a region as we heard in relation to the supplier um, sector um, in some regions in Europe and some of the research that uh, Gipis has done in the past uh, particularly in northern Italy looking at the heavy concentration of um, suppliers in some regions you have to take a regional approach then uh, you have to be able to uh, deal with the skills challenge we just heard uh, the enormous need for reskilling and upskilling some of the studies that um, you can quote and there are numbers different numbers thrown out by different people but the platform for electromobility did a, a very detailed study which estimated that something like 2.4 million automotive workers will need to be upskilled and reskilled by uh, 2030. This is an industrial revolution of its own. Never mind the technical revolution which is underway and the innovation that's needed. So you needed a coordinated approach and you need to ensure that workers have the rights which match the scale of the challenge that we're facing. So we are pushing for proactive in investment, um, information and consultation rights traditionally information and consultation rights apply once a decision has been made what we need is anticipation and management of change rights that's turning reversing the frame to make it a proactive um, right to be involved in uh, negotiating and and identifying the strategy and fundamentally uh, we need a right to training across Europe and a right to training which is really an accessible uh, right to training and we're at the end of the year of skills um, we know that there have been lots of uh, activities focused on the the reskilling and upskilling challenge but uh, the the difficulty that we face is that looking at the commission's own data only 30 percent of workers in Europe currently in the last recorded year had access to in work um, training and upskilling so to meet the challenge of uh, the transition we need a massive investment in terms of um, skills in terms of training and that has to be not on the basis of uh, the political will or the engagement of companies uh, where we have good companies who are doing this investment um, but we need a framework which ensures that workers wherever they are in Europe whichever part of the uh, value chain they sit in whatever size company they're sitting in that they have a right to employment security which is a right to education and training so this is the kind of framework um, and obviously none of this comes free um, the cost of bad transitions is enormous. We have many examples in Europe of bad transitions and the implications, long-term costs to regional economies, long-term costs to, in terms of socioeconomic outcomes. The cost of good transitions is not, um, it's not cheap, but at the same time, if that is perceived as an investment in the future of the European economy, and we see um, you know, what, uh, what was being said um, uh, from the perspective of Volvo, I say uh, that investment in IT skills, that investment in, um, in the skills link, the broader skills linked to the green transition, then we should see that as an investment in the European economy as a whole uh, for the future. So it's how you, you frame this that's so important. 
what and my last word because i've baffled waffled on sorry but that is the the framework that we're pushing in 2021 we came together uh, the comment was made bring all of the stakeholders together well we've already done it uh, we came together asea Kalepa, um the uh, transport and environment uh, the european climate foundation the etuc the european transport workers federation industrial europe we created a coalition for a, a just transition for the automotive sector we linked up with the um, Committee of the Regions, with the Automotive Regional Alliance, who are pushing a similar agenda, I'll let you tell it. But um, this is an agenda which has increasing um, uh, kind of backing behind it. What we're missing is the political engagement um, at the national level uh, from governments and the political engagement then in the European um, Commission's uh, uh, policy framework, but maybe um, if there's time in questions, I can come back to some of the developments which were asked about earlier in relation to our letter that we sent uh, in September last year um, uh, to von der Leyen, ahead of the State of the Union, and some of the other initiatives. Thanks. Thank you very much, Judith. So Fabio, from the European Commission side, so what programs and initiatives are currently in place uh, and are planned for, for the next few years for those workers um, that are operating in the automotive industries and for their communities? Um, and how does DGM also uh, envision the role of social dialogue uh, within this transition? Okay, okay, yes. So good afternoon. Uh, I'm, we, uh, I'm actually, just to say a few words about me, I work in the FAIR Green and Digital Transition Research Unit. So the just and the FAIR transition is really at the core of what we do. Um, we, we, we are aware, our commission also is uh, pretty well aware of the challenges of the automotive sector and uh, participated in many events also recently. Uh, we see, uh, you already discussed the issues of the automotive sectors, also from the employment side, in terms of uh, job creation and job distractions, with uh, evidence uh, pointing out sometimes in different directions, but uh, uh, on the shortages, that is a long-term trend, uh, al almost 10 years, there is this trend of uh, skill shortages in the, dif in the different subsectors, in some of the subsectors of the transport, and the need for skill, upskill, also considering the transformation that this sector is uh, under, undergoing. We also heard already this afternoon about the competitive aspect uh, from third country, especially from China, how do we deal with this, uh, whether NZI is, the, uh, is sufficient to co counteract all the others uh, like the US, uh, IRA, and so on. What, uh, what is the just transition framework in place in Europe that it would also apply to, it also applies to the automotive sectors? And also I want to give you some hints how we move forward, at least I hope, with the next commission. Uh, and some hints also have been discussed also this after, uh, before with the 2040 climate target plans, because also there, there are, I know uh, uh, the document may be uh, recalling for zero uh, emission by the transport sector, but there are also other interesting points that I will make in my uh, short uh, presentation. So first of all, our unit uh, was in charge of the recommendations, um, council recommendation on fair transition toward climate, towards climate neutrality. We gave guidance uh, in July 2022. We gave guidance to member states on how to support a just transition. Uh, there are different pillars. This also includes uh, active quality support, uh, skills, uh, also social aspects. The need also for a whole of society, society approach to support the just transition. What does it mean? That we need to involve all um, stakeholders, social partners, authorities, at the local level, at the regional level, national, and so on. Otherwise, we cannot have a just transition, just to connect to what you were saying before. Um, this, uh, this recommendation didn't stop there. We did the first monitoring exercise uh, last October to see where member states are. And in that context, we noticed that uh, we, what are the main conclusion that we have done, uh, we, we have received is that member states are um, 
uh, in each, uh, starting to implement uh, the just transition framework and the, and the actions, but there are uh, significant differences across member states. And, uh, and a more coherent, a more comprehensive approach is needed. Um, we will not stop there. We are continuing to have a second review of this recommendation these years. And also, we will have in the coming weeks, in our months, uh, hearings also with social partners and uh, civil society to hear their view on the just transition, different sectors, and so on and so on. Um, now, <clears throat> what we have done uh, in, in, in the thermal skill, it just has been mentioned, this year is the European. Uh, uh, year of skills that goes until uh, June, I think, of May 2024. There have been more than 600 events, other activities. Uh, some of them also refer to the uh, automotive sector. We have, the, in the context of the Back for Skill, uh, we have the European Skill Alliance, which you all may have heard about it, probably part of it and also with the objective to reskill 5% of the workforces uh, in the automotive sector each year. Now, I understand this may not be enough, also in view of the fact that, uh, as you said, there are two, four point million workers that they need to be retrained. Um, there is also the Bacterial Alliance, the same things to support skill, and I think already 50,000 learners have participated in trainings there. Um, we will hear more uh, about the uh, regional also aspects and um, what else do we do? We also support uh, skills uh, and vocational trainings also to, to support short term with uh, different initiatives, uh, skills. Uh, uh, on funds, a cohesion funds, uh, the, um, the funds of the European Commission supports different uh, uh, initiatives in the sector. Uh, on infrastructure, for instance, the charge infrastructure, on R&I activities for the MODV sector, and on training and skill, as already said. Just to remember the RRF, so the Resilience and Recovery Facility, supported with 2.3 billion, if I'm not wrong, the recharging infrastructures of the sector. I also want to recall here the social climate funds that will enter into force in 2026. Um, just another example where, where there are 65 million billions from the ETS revision that will be extended to transport and, uh, and building uh, sector. So there are 65 billions from the EU level plus 25 from the member states. Why I'm mentioning it? Because he has two aims. One, uh, to provide uh, uh, temporary support to the most affected by this transition. But the second, I also will support structural measures, including uh, the recharging and the uh, infrastructure uh, for sustainable mobility. So that's also an important uh, aspect. Um, Overall, these are two examples of funds that support, apart from the one on skills. Then we have the, another aspect that I wanted to mention is uh, a commission activities, that is the um, pathways. And there has been recently, at the end of January, one on mobility pathways, and I think has been, a report has been published with a bottom-up uh, initiative, if you want, where uh, the stakeholders uh, join together, identify more than 110 initiatives to support the mobility, uh, the, the transition, how to increase the resilience of the mobility sector, so also the automotive sectors. And if you look there, there is uh, different pillars, infrastructure, skills, the social aspect of uh, especially the, the workers, uh, r and and so on and so on. So very interesting also to see how um, now, industry itself uh, sees the challenges and the action needed to support the transition. Uh, social dialogue, as it has been asked, is also a very important aspect. Um, we cannot have a just transition without social dialogue. It's part of our recommendation to member states also, and uh, this has to be done at all level. It's important uh, to have anticipation, it's important uh, also in terms of skills uh, for the restructuring. Uh, they have the special knowledge, you have the special knowledge on the regional, local level, and so on. So cannot be a just transition. I cannot complete, agree uh, more on that without uh, involving them. And finally, the last point I wanted to make is the 2040 climate target. Uh, 
It's true that there are different challenges for different sectors. This is a vision. How do we go from 2030 on? And um, it will be, of course, for the next commission to set more concrete targets. And what, for my side, what is uh, interesting also to see is that two important aspects are mentioned there. One is the company dividend so you industries, and the second one is to have a stronger just transition framework. So you cannot uh, achieve our objective in terms of climate neutrality without uh, also these two aspects. So it's clearly stated, and I, for that reason, I believe at least it will be getting even more interesting to see, and we will have more and more action also in terms of just transition for the sectors and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. And um, Christina, now I give the, the floor to you. So back on our trade union angle, so you represent uh, ETF. Um, so what, what are the primary concerns of uh, transport workers and what does just transition mean for the sector that you're operating in? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think, uh, as uh, uh, Judith also mentioned, just transition implies uh, managing a transition. In transport, we wonder, uh, we uh, transit towards what? Uh, um, we've had uh, several waves of liberalization in public transport, in rail, urban public transport. So if that is the transition to something, then it did not work. And this cost us 20 years of experiments, at least in rail. Um, so um, there is uh, indeed automation uh, in transport, but very little. I think uh, we um, can resign to the fact that at least in road transport, and that is bus coach, um, for instance, uh, automation and uh, assisted driving even, if not autom fully automated driving, uh, is uh, an utopia, and also for lorries. Um, so we will still need that driver uh, for long uh, from now on, because uh, to have automated ve vehicle on vehicles on infrastructures uh, that imply car users, truck users, cyclists, and so on and so forth, that would need a special investment in infrastructure to, stay, to, 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 to start with. So there we will need the mobile workers in transport and uh, we wish as ETF to even have modernized fleets, but we don't. Uh, the resistance to, uh, from uh, the side of the industry is very high because the industry is, uh, in road transport at least, is operating on very low margins. They do not make money from transport. Uh, they can't even pay wages. Uh, we all uh, were confronted last year with two uh, wild strikes uh, of truck drivers in Germany, uh, truck drivers from third countries, non-EU countries like Georgia and Uzbekistan, and uh, their claim were wages. And the companies in question said, we didn't budget for wages. If we were to pay wages to these drivers, we would go bankrupt. So, um, in transport, it's transit to what? Um, there is a mixed uh, feeling that this transition to whatever uh, the policymakers uh, took us to was not a success. Um, when it comes to shortage, um, we, we, uh, we don't have a, a labor surplus, uh, not today and not in future. We have a labor shortage in transport. Uh, transport perhaps was an option for uh, new uh, job seekers in the past because it was associated with probably visiting other countries or so. But nowadays, everyone wants to work close to home. They want, they want uh, socially friendly hours. Uh, they do not want even to start their shift at 5 o'clock in the morning, like the typical tram or bus driver or the typical short-haul truck driver. Um, so. No, we don't even have uh, a problem of a shortage of skills. To get a skilled transport worker, you would need to spend uh, training from two months to two years, let's say. Yeah? 
kept talking about two years for for uh, train drivers, for probably air traffic controllers, and so so and so uh, forth. But there are a fair amount of jobs where training is available and it's of short duration. And here we also have shortage, which shows that let's talk the truth. It's not the shortage of skills. It's the shortage of people. Uh, the mentality of young people and young job seekers has changed and the trans transport professions do not tick the box. They are not dignifying and they mean being stuck in traffic or sleeping in lorries or uh, being faced with third party violence if you work in the railway system. So uh, here we've got to go back to the source, um, I'm saying for, for instance, for, uh, for rail and urban public transport, the source was those days in which um, rail and urban public transport were publicly owned mm -hmm. and were offering stable jobs because people want stable jobs because they want to get on with their private life. And that's why work needs to be stable. So we need to go back there because privatization does not work. And it also doesn't work because transport doesn't make money. It's not a money maker. We have in urban public transport tenders for routes where there are no private companies tendering. And these tenders are open for months and months. It's not attractive even for, for the private uh, uh, um, um, operators. So we need to get back to the basics rather than, than transit to something we don't know uh, to what, because uh, also modernization of transport uh, industry is very slow. And there is quite uh, a, a big resistance, and that is, again, because transport does not make money and there is no money to invest. My last remark, we were discussing yesterday with uh, Judith and, and Ben as well. Um, for instance, electrification of bus fleets. Buses come from China. Um, they, there are no, so to say, safety standards at European level that can ensure uh, that uh, drivers can uh, step in when there is a situation and the bus catches on fire, and we had situations where these buses caught on fire in depots and the fire uh, extended so fast that uh, a whole bunch of vehicles, uh, we talk about, you know, 10, 20, were um, ashes in a, a few hours, putting in danger the life of, uh, you know, the neighborhood because it was mm -hmm. a depot. But imagine something like this in traffic. Mm -hmm. So. There is modernization, but on very cheap money uh, in transport. So not even that we have. <laughs> so it's, it's a very tricky debate when it comes to transport. Very tricky. I think we should fo uh, focus more on uh, making, um, uh, investing, investing public money in transport if we want a transition to, to something that means dignifying job, reliable transport, and attractive sector. Thank you very much, Christina. Thomas, now I'm giving you the floor. So what about the re regional and local dimension? So what do these two dimensions have for um, just transition and what types of policies and initiatives could serve as a model also for other countries and at the European level as well? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been here last year again. And uh, I'd like to make a link between the two uh, meetings. Um, uh, first of all, we, what we talk about is a very local matter, a very territorial mm -hmm. matter. Uh, cities and regions mm -hmm. are in charge of, uh, let's say, providing a lot of the infrastructure, the dialogue, the collaboration. The, they are pur purchasers of buses, uh, they, uh, they regulate, they control. So, uh, and they are very close to the industry because if the supplier or the OEMs have a problem, the region has often a problem. So the link between the regions and, uh, and the, the, this uh, mobility revolution is very, very close. I was very struck by your question of the conference. Can the European industry be saved? Because I think we are, I'm a bit less optimistic as I was six months ago. Um, we have seen with the farmers 
-hmm. what the cost of non-transition is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, uh, when you see the figures of farmers and the figures of people in the automotive industry, you know that the problem could be 10 times bigger if the transition doesn't work. We have also seen, and I can say that as a consultative body, um, uh, we don't have power, but we can talk about everything, that we are concerned is what, how the European level is reacting to this pressure. Because imagine the following. Uh, imagine the next commission has understood we have to delay, we have to change, we have to uh, review what we have discussed, and the whole uh, road to uh, uh, electric uh, uh, EV, the whole road gets into trouble. And also for the regions get into trouble. We have a lot of regions who have suppliers, who are deeply path dependent. They're proud to what they produce and they want to produce it as long as they can. So if they see a window to maintain their business model, they will put pressure on politics to, uh, to change, not to change. They want to extend. We have at the same time the OEMs who have invested billions for the new model. But they're also already starting to think, is this the only way? Do I need a second uh, way? We see it with the Stellantis, the C3. It was foreseen as an electric. Now it will also have a combustion engine as an option. Mm -hmm. This will kill the transition, the revolution, when we have no clear picture. And the big problem we have is we have done it top down with a regulatory uh, approach without having the power and the engagement of everybody to stay on track. And that's where uh, you did what you said is very important. We need just transition as a deal between those affected and those who want it. And so far it is not a deal. Mm -hmm. You said about the green deal, we need a deal. The deal means that uh, you need to take into account what is the situation on the ground. And then you have to find a solution for that uh, territory for that places for those workers there for the industry and the public sector needs to help this transition and it needs indication what in what to invest and this is where we need the clarity and we are we are worried that we're losing the clarity the second thing what is also important we have a communication on the on the 2040 target with an excellent impact assessment but when you see the impact assessment and the communication itself, what is in the impact assessment is not reflected in the, the, under, in the main policy paper. Mm -hmm. The scale, we have two maps. One is regions with challenges and regions with opportunities, which are totally different. So the question is, how do you bring that together? So the cost of non or bad transition is the cost of uh, non-cohesion, it's cost of the single market, it is cost of many things at a really big scale. So for, for doing that, of course, in the future, I come from the public side, so I'm not arguing from social dialogue, but what can regions do to do so? We have instruments like cohesion policy, we have the just transition me mechanism, but so far, these instruments were designed that you first have to be poor to be helped. Yeah. And we cannot afford that we first get everybody to a marginalized place or to lose our competitiveness, to lose our competitive edge of the industry before we start kicking in these instruments. Mm -hmm. So we need an ex ante way how to that strong stay strong, because if they don't stay strong, who should pay for those who are lagging behind? So for staying strong, you would really need to, to, to have a new concept of cohesion, for example, which is just transition. This ex ante approach, we have to avoid that we, we have to have a, a, a co cohesion to the top. This, to be said, is, of course, the new commission needs to, and behind this also, of course, the, the, the member states, have to put local solutions, regional solutions in the center. Social dialogue with uh, 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 things that work. And what, of course, the problem we have in the whole transition, a lot of things are not economically viable at the moment. They are not, they are too expensive. The Chinese competition is bigger. We have also the problem that some companies so, uh, who decided to get out of combustion suddenly have to come in, back into combustion and maybe have to buy the more engines in China because some of these companies have sold this. So the, the key issue is coherence, the key issue is to link um, 
the regions to it. And uh, the Committee of the Regions has uh, set up and uh, supported a network of auto the Automotive Regions Alliance, mm -hmm. 30, 35, 36 regions who are heavily dependent on the industry. Uh, some of them OEMs, but most of them supply, so the supply chain. The OEMs, what I hear, will survive. The supply chain is an open question. Mm -hmm. So we need to address this in, an, in, a, in, a, in a just way. A just means to, together with them on the same level. And that is where, where we are supporting very strongly the just, tran just Transition Manifesto, the joint collaboration with the uh, em employers. Um, because the worry we have is, if we want to achieve climate neutrality, we have to have everybody on board and we have to listen to where the real problems are and not just to uh, set an ambition without knowing how to reach it. Mm -hmm. And that is where the regions can play because if it's not working there, it will not work anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we have seen, I've just come from Italy, I've just had a, a discussion where the Minister of Economy of Italy was involved. And what you can clearly see is the green discontent it's not only an issue on the regions, it's also coming from, in, from member states if they don't see how they can uh, see uh, this uh, in, a, in a successful way. So, so that's why it is such an important point. And where one, and that's the last sentence, my worry is, a uh, colleague from the Commission has listed what different actions there, there have been done and everybody is doing something. This is a uh, the, the, there is a, t a tendency of fragmentation of these industry, instruments without addressing really the key issue. And the key issue is to maintain competitiveness because we cannot afford to subsidize everything without having this competitiveness and to have to put local solution in the center, social dialogue in the center in order to, to make it work so that everybody feels part of it and not that we have uh, a distinction between those losers and, and the winners. And this, this, this concern is really there because we can see it, what happens with the, with the debate on farming. And uh, if, if we don't get that together, it will be difficult to make this revolution in a, in a constructive and just way. Thank you very much. Tom. Perhaps before I give the, the, the floor to the audience, would you have any comments or responses to the interventions that came after you, Judith, or other panelists that you perhaps want to say a few words before? Um, maybe, maybe just uh, to say that I think the uh, to link on to what Thomas was saying at the end. I think what's extremely important is to recognise that just transition is um, is the means, but the final objective is good jobs in a in a more cohesive uh, society if you have that as your policy objective then the the policy framework works a little bit differently and you bring in the job quality dimension which is clearly key in transport work in transport sectors but we also have big job quality uh, questions um, in manufacturing increasingly as well with the increasing intensification and the pressure uh, through cost competitiveness strategies in different companies um, on, on the workforce. So um, that's why from our spot aside as Industrial Europe, we started with the big focus on just transition, but increasingly we're focused on what our objective is. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the the good industrial job for us industrial jobs but good industrial jobs um at the end um and to try and uh, uh and make that the the focus because if we end up in a debate at european level where competitiveness is defined as cost competitiveness um then we are on an extremely negative cycle uh, downward in terms of uh in terms of European, the European economy uh, in general and um, quality of, of living and working conditions. So it's extremely important for us to have that quality dimension right in the middle. So I, I subscribe to what you were saying at the end. Can, can I? Of course. Uh, I totally support that. Uh, and of course, the automotive industry sector was a high paid uh, sector, highly competitiveness, highly competitive. The problem is, we 
we, we are challenged with cost-cutting uh, uh, competition from China, and, and our products are not as good as they could be. And, they, and the market, the, the mm. people, uh, do not uh, buy the, the expensive products. They cannot buy them, and, and, and so we, we need innovation. Mm. We need uh, uh, investment policy. in this uh, a place based in, in industrial policy. Yeah. And of course, we, we need to do it. We need to bring all these together from the how to solve the problem and not just setting the standards everywhere. Mm. Because what we have is a real life experiment of all these different rules, how they work together. Mm -hmm. And we have to turn it the other way around. How can these rules help this transition with innovation, mm. with place-based, with supply, with uh, uh, raw materials in a way that it stays a well-paying uh, industry uh, for the future? Mm. Christina, Fabio, would you have maybe perhaps a, a few words to add? Otherwise, we, can, we don't have to. We can also... I mean, from our perspective, of course, uh, one, our key object is quality job and support the social mm -hmm. aspects also, but that's, and there is no just transition without these uh, quality uh, jobs uh, aspect. And uh, um, yes, it's, um, there is need for a more current, co current approach. There have been uh, calls also for having a more current approach. Uh, uh, we are we are trying to do from our side that's our job. There is also the industry as a part. We have to work all together. Uh, if you look at electric cars, I'm not an expert, but I understand also the competition from China comes because they focus on a different segment. So maybe in, on some aspect, they also it's also be be more attention to what the consumer wants, or smaller cars, or also less expensive, and so on and so on. And um, yeah, so that's uh, a bit the, uh, the the difficulties with this, and um, I, I, I would otherwise I subscribe to all uh, what you said that we need a bit more ex ante anticipation, both of these changing on skills on the on all aspects. The Commission has tried with NZIA, there is also a cri cri critical material act which try to secure the upstream uh, value chain and so on and so on. There are challenges for the industry, as uh, everybody already said, that uh, the electric car will require less pieces, so also less uh, workers and so on and so on. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, why can't we talk about a European model? Because uh, Europe and the expectation of European citizens as working citizens and and living beings uh, is based on uh, choices that have ma been made in the last 80 years. So we reflect uh, a level of, of uh, assertiveness that I'm not sure uh, can be satisfied by putting Europe in a global competition, um, so to say, setting. You know, I mean, what can we do to compete with um, China? Uh, lower the standards, uh, try to, flex, to, to make work more flexible, um, cut down on social security, uh, go to countries where there, there are no checks on social security and posting. That's what we can do. Is this something that will attract in future our young workforce? Is this a model that we want to build now? Why, don't, why can't we have a European model? We in transport honestly see a complete drain of workers. Mm. There are, so how do you get them back? Uh, there is no question that you can take, make, a, uh, I don't know, a, a, an Amazon driver's job a dignifying job. So the only way to attract people back to these sectors is by offering good terms and conditions mm -hmm. and legal wages. So I think we should all get together and think of how to build a European model and um, competitiveness. Uh, okay, in relation to what? We need to relate more to our citizens, our members at trade union, as trade unions, because otherwise, as you well said, we wait until 
the conflicts is explode, like the farmers' conflicts, and then we found, found, find out that with stupor that a Belgian farmer was paid some couple of years ago 800 euro. I didn't know that. This is below the minimum of Belgium. So um, that's where we have to reframe things and we start discussing about these things. Thank you very much. Perhaps I think we can take a few questions uh, from the audience. I think we can collect a few and then we see if we have time for one. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for Thomas Wobben. Thank you very much for your uh, input. And uh, I think it sounds good at first if we say we need a place-based and bottom-up approach, but could you be a bit more specific what that would look like? Because if I think it through, doesn't that just mean that we stay where we are? Because you said it yourself, a supplier in Baden-Württemberg who focused on uh, ICEs, what he wants is to focus on ICEs in the future. So uh, could you be a bit more precise um, what the future of the automotive industry could look like from a bottom-up perspective? One. I think we can collect a few and then. Um, okay, I have a question for most of you, so feel free to answer. Uh, one that is very specific and perhaps is more to, to Fabio and perhaps Judith, I think you're also aware of that, the ETS2, I think industry all has taken position into that. I will just turn in my face to the, to the audience. Mm -hmm. How many of you, we are in a specific place, so perhaps mm -hmm. you know, know what ETS2 is? Just. Okay, it's a good amount, but still, you know, it's a minority. So ETS2 is, is, is a carbon market for fuel in road transport and housing. And I'm still struggling to understand myself what it actually is and how it works. So you mentioned that, and you mentioned the social fund that yeah. is connected to that. So if I'm not wrong, the social fund is generated by the selling of CO2 permits. So it's basically a taxation, a CO2 taxation that people will pay on their fuel, and that this money will go to commission to the European Union and the states, and then it will be redistributed in a way that it will help the transition. But first, the money will be paid by the consumer, if I'm not wrong. So can you explain a little bit that? And, and so I know, if, if I'm not wrong, industrial was against this, 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 this um, carbon market. Mm -hmm. So can you, and this is coming, 2027, the carbon market will be there. And, and will create, in my opinion, problems and issues. I don't think it's not debated enough. It, to me, is a good example of how the, the European Union policies are scattered and not coherent, because this is, cre is going to create a lot of pressure on many states, and in particular those who cannot afford electrification, because they will need to buy more permits. So that, that's mm -hmm. the first question. And I'm I just asking then to, to Fabio, are you, do you think that the just transition has received objectively from the European Union enough attention? Working on that, are you happy with the resources and the tools you have? Or you would like to have more? So if you have a magic wand, what do you think you should have as a tools to really make the just transition work? And for example, transferring more money from rich European state to poorer state, which is not there in Europe, could be a way forward. And my final question is, we look at IRI, and we see a lot of money that is coming because we need a lot of money to support mm -hmm. that. But we see also social clauses and financial clauses. Mm -hmm. So basically, this becomes a tool uh, to make many different things. So it's, it's public money that is given to the industry, but they say, well, you have to make good jobs with that, located in certain place, respecting union and so on. And at the same time, so you cannot make uh, you cannot rebuy stocks with the profits you make out of that. You need to reinvest, and so you, you, you address two issues, which is, which is just transition for workers, but also the finance pressure on companies to, to, to reduce the pressure on that. So can, you, can, can we this the solution and how Europe can raise this money? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think about the Next Generation Fund, that was the first time Europe took debt on its own. Is that a way forward? Why is not debated more? Thank you. And I think we have a final question from Bela. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I'm only uh, <coughs> having this question because Tommaso already mentioned the ETS2, and it's actually in his paper. Uh, what I would like to add on uh, as a question, uh, could it be that the ETS2 
with the social climate fund can become an accelerator of inequality in Europe. Uh, I mean, yeah. the point That's is that if the ETS2 starts to work, first with a limited carbon price, but then when uh, uh, after 2030 uh, opened up, uh, imagine that let's say some regions in Europe, like Central Eastern Europe, it's not embarking on a very dynamic uptake of electromobility, so they are stuck in the fossil fuel-based car with the average age of 22 years in Poland. Yeah? Uh, and then the emission trading system kicks up. Nor uh, not Norway, because it's not member, but uh, France or Germany or Belgium is doing well uh, can sell carbon credits and Poland can buy it and the price is going up. So those who cannot afford electromobility at large scale will be penalized. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of just a scenario, a horror scenario, but can we end up there? And, and then what will we do? Very easy answer. I think we can conclude with a question from Ifrido in the back and then Bela, I'm sorry, but I think we'll, ch we'll eat a few minutes from your concluding remarks, and then I think we can have uh, a couple minutes for the yeah, one question is about uh, the next election, no? there are elections soon, maybe it's the best moment where to put your, your key um, elements no? for the position makers. Uh, in the past, as we have observed as academics, is that in the automobile industry a lot, there have been a lot of initiatives and the European Union has a lot of tools. The problem is the coordination or non-coordination of tools, competition policy, we are not mentioned, we are talking about the electric, electrification, but it's also the digital transformation, not only in product, but also on factories, no industry 4.0. So I think the auto industry has its specificity, has always had exceptions huh? in trade, for example, uh, which is another instrument that we are not uh, mentioning. So basically, uh, in other um, um, uh, settings where we have this discussion with uh, scholars, particularly in Jerpisa, also with colleagues from regions, no, where we were discussing this, one, one thing was missing is to have a place where uh, we can have like an observatory of the uh, automobile industry, where we can bring academics, uh, stakeholders, uh, because this is a, 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 an industry which is uh, having a lot of uh, changes we were unexpected. On batteries, for example, we see how the technology now is quickly changing. So we need really to have maybe a long-term dialogue and not depend only on whether the commission would like or not would like. Or of course, this you, is your job to try to, to have the commission hearing you and, and making something out of it. But my, my, our, our impression as academics is that the commission has never been able to have a coherent position, and then when they have a coherent position in front, member states have their own uh, Interest and there were never a way to create a, a basic deal. No, and so I don't know whether this is the impression you have still today, but maybe an election is an opportunity no? to come with something which can uh, be sustainable in the next four or five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can start with Judith and then we carry on. And, uh... Okay, um, Bailey, your question was a lot longer than my answer will be. Um, yes. We, we anticipate the reason why we uh, opposed ETS2 uh, as a model is it's a regressive taxation on the poorest in society, um, not just in terms of mobility, but also in terms of heating. Those who are the least able uh, to and have the least, you know, in economic terms, have the the least opportunity and information about the, the choices to make are the ones who are penalised um, by by ETS2, so throughout we were we didn't see this as uh, the tool. Um, markets have their roles, but markets are not the answer to everything um, in terms of, uh, in ter and certainly in terms of climate action, uh, there they have a limited uh, role in our view in terms of uh, how you push it forward. The the difficulty is amplified because um, the the revenue is recycled but then it is subject to national decisions of how it will be spent. So you then have another um, 
uh, kind of hoop to leap through to ensure that it's distributed to the people who actually uh, need it the most and different you will end up with a patchwork across Europe of uh, the impact um, and uh, I think it's the quickest way to create a European wide gilet jaune uh, movement um, and um, and real opposition to to the overall um, direction of travel which as Thomas said you know the question of the cost of inaction or of policy incoherence or ambiguity is really high um, and we have to be making decisions now. We need investment decisions to be made now. We need uh, the direction of travel to be very clear. And all of this is a recipe for, for confusion. Um, from our perspective, I think that Benjamin said it this morning, so hopefully I'm repeating what he said. Um, but uh, the question of uh, social conditionalities is really critical um, in, the, in the policy framework in terms of um, uh, support. Uh, some of you may have seen that last week there was a big industry jamboree in Antwerp um, bringing together the energy intensive industries. Part of the reason why we decided that we should co-sign uh, that Antwerp declaration was we convinced the energy intensive industries that there should be social conditionalities tied to public support for industry. For us this is absolutely critical in terms of demanding a European in investment and industrial plan, but there has to be a return uh, for society. Um, that has to be about guarantees around uh, the quality of work, about maintaining um, uh, production and uh, transforming production. So social conditionalities have been very effectively used in the IRA. I th would add a little bit of water to the wine um, that we have we are big fans of how the IRA is be is using is being used in the absence of a social policy in the US we have social policies in Europe so we shouldn't uh, just uh, be going for the base load of what they've done in the US we should be upping the ante. I mean, the pay transparency legislation at European level means that um, companies can be cut out of public contracts if they don't uh, comply with uh, certain levels of equality in terms of equal pay. We should be adding uh, ambitious social conditionality into industrial um, policy uh, support, whether that's direct the subsidy side and state aid or whether that's public procurement uh, conditionalities whether that's um, access to research money uh, then you start to really have um, have some kind of impacts and um, and things like uh, minimum which they have in the ira which are, are really positive in our perspective this idea that a certain amount of the work has to be performed by apprentices qualified apprentices, not uh, bargain basement um, kind of uh, cheap labor, but qualified apprentices is a way of dealing with the labor shortage mm -hmm. question. Yeah. You create a shot in the arm. That's what that policy has done for the US automotive industry, is you bring in large numbers of young people into an industry which has a terrible um, uh, demographic pyramid. So some of these uh, policies we also think are in the self-interest of uh, of the companies. I'm kind of looking at Volvo to see if we get our first uh, corporate advocate of that in, in Europe. Um, uh, then uh, I, I wanted just to say something on the, um, the EU level resources. Um, and I think it hasn't been mentioned, but it's a very important uh, development. Draghi is preparing this report on competitiveness. You may have seen that over the weekend when he spoke to European leaders in Ghent, he said the biggest question that we have is the investment gap. We have to um, address this um, investment gap for the long term competitiveness of, um, of industry. And we obviously need to be thinking about um, things like next generation EU2 or new models of but we also need to be ensuring that the money that has already been allocated is being spent so if you look at the just transition fund which we fought for decades to get at European level I've, I was part of a lot of those fights with different hats on in different parts of the trade union movement and in parliament um, but uh, we fought for a long time to get that money only two percent of the money has been allocated from the Just Transition Fund. We know the need that there is 
at the, uh, at the local level. Our members are already engaged in the transition, and yet the money which is allocated for the transition isn't making it to them. So there needs to be also a real reflection on how we deal with this absorption question around um, investment, how we link up a just transition framework post uh, the European elections. If you have the framework, you have a just transition observatory at European level, you have best practices of how the funds are being absorbed, maybe we can increase the absorption rate and maybe we can make sure that that public money is actually getting to the workers who are the most affected uh, by the transition. Thanks. Thank you very much, Julia. Well, uh, many questions, so I'll try to complement uh, what has been already said. Uh, actually, just to, yes, there is this green discontent now that comes uh, more and more, but it's very dangerous, and this is connected to the fact that we cannot afford not to have a transition, not to have a just transition. So it will cost much more, and we, will, and we saw it already. In, also in terms of climate, uh, the impact will have on workers, the impact will have on society, we cannot. It, in, uh, why I'm saying this? In this context, how do I see? I'm not an expert of ATS2. I work at DGN before, I know some uh, part of it. So I hope is a uh, house is, um, is seen as an insurance that more sectors move versus the decarbonization. So it's not seen as an instrument of creating more inequalities. And the social fund comes on top to support the most vulnerable, because we are well aware that the most vulnerable in society, there are tons of studies demonstrate that they pollute, they consume the less, but they, they are the ones that support the cost the highest. So the ATS in this sense and the social climate funds I hope is uh, an instrument that uh, accelerates the transition and not uh, and, and maintain it fair and not that accelerate inequalities. We also know that, for instance, with the energy crisis and so on, there have been um, poverty, energy poverty, transport poverty, and we also know from study that there would have been uh, there have been an additional 10 million people going in uh, so-called energy poverty. There would have been 70 million without uh, all the action and measures that have been taken. So we also have to consider this context. On the um, US, the, yes, the NZIA and so on, social conditionality, I don't know, I understood what you said, I completely agree. The point is that in Europe, uh, we have already high social uh, work standards, we should maintain them, so we don't need more social conditionality. At least so far, this is the point. And um, you, you can see also in this discussion with farmers that some of these points have been put at, uh, in, on, on the plate. So that's a different story. Uh, the NZIA also includes, uh, there are chats and discussion also task force between the US and Europe to avoid that there is anti-competitive behaviors, also these things you talked about, the WTO and so on. But there are already discussion plates. The, I believe the NZ also includes uh, some sort of European-based manufacturing. There is a percentage of, uh, so, of in manufacturing that should happen in Europe. There are key sectors, I think there are eight, that will be supported with big projects. So I, there is uh, action taken. Whether this is enough, uh, we will see. Um, there are the skill academies for this sector that have been created in these days. So there are activities from the European uh, to uh, counterbalance international competition. Um, then uh, on the magic uh, wand, I, I can answer you uh, because uh, the internal discussion started on the next commission, what should do, what we will do, uh, already started. I, wh what I can tell you now, it's, uh, what I like is the calls that we receive from the European Parliament and from the Economic uh, Social Committee. Uh, there are talks uh, uh, and there are uh, resolutions uh, talking about uh, the need to have um, a commission or just transition. So the next uh, commission should have, I would love that. I mean, what can I say? It's uh, the, my job. The, the, You're the, the commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> that takes a while. Uh, <laughs> but, but there are concrete actions behind that. Our uni, for instance, is uh, starting an observatory. We will launch a just transition observatory this year because there is also lack of evidence on certain aspects, on, on certain regions, on certain sectors. 
which will gather evidence, will connect stakeholders, and so on. This is not enough, okay, but it's a part, a part of the bit. There also, the, what I like also, what has been proposed, uh, is uh, a just transition directive. So something that uh, set uh, a framework and that requires member states to prepare for these just transition plans and to implement them. I think Spain does it. The, the, there are concrete things that can be done and then can also be applied to the automotive uh, sectors. And this is probably for the next commission to decide, but the calls are there, have been done by the stakeholders, and uh, these are a, a few examples. Um, yeah, uh, yes, uh, the, let me see if there is anything else I wanted to, to mention. Uh, the, I know also from industry and for you that there is a call from the Just Transition Funds to have number two, which will also include the automotive sectors. I'm not saying this is not uh, a good idea, but it's not uh, to me uh, to decide to see which sector should be included uh, or not. Uh, I'm, I'm also surprised that only 2% of the funds have been allocated. I knew the situation for, for Italy, where maybe this uh, didn't happen because I'm Italian, but I didn't know that this is abroad uh, for, uh, for all Europe. And um, yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Christina and Thomas. I think we have to be quite um, succinct because I, I'm afraid they will kick us out at some point. So, <laughs> and I would still like to leave uh, the final words to Bella to wrap things up. So just really w one minute each. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll try to keep to this challenge. Yes, so um, mm, mm, emission trading systems, I, I think in, in transport, it's obvious we want less, um, uh, transport by road uh, because it's just toxic, also social, and more transport by rail. But the Commission has just opened infringement, no, investigation procedures against two of the remaining three big rail companies, freight rail companies, state-owned, Germany and France. So, uh, and I guess some smaller f rail freight operators are waiting to chip on the edges of this huge market share that is covered by the French and German operators, and that's not going to work. So, so we want more uh, road to be transferred to, to rail, and that is an ETF position that is checked with our road and rail affiliates, but we won't see this uh, too, too soon in the future, unless, of course, we put pressure for the European Commission and we can get some inspiration uh, from what is going on for the moment. And uh, on social condi uh, conditionality, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that I take the floor be, uh, after you, because um, for this, uh, we have clear <coughs> examples that without social con conditionality, we are going to kick... Uh, to disencourage even more workers to come into transport, all right? So uh, the, uh, working for an urban public transport operator has become a sort of Russian roulette because you do not know what to expect as a worker because you may tomorrow be transferred from one operator to another on completely different conditions that you had when you first took the job. And that's why social condition, that's just an example where you need as a worker to know what you're engaging on, you know, stay in a system where you can make a career and you can work several years. And that's because standard procedures do not uh, include any social, um, just an example, you know, but we have more. So I wanted just to, uh, to focus on these two points. Yeah. Maybe just one thing on the Just Transition Fund. Of course, the problem in these fundings is always uh, the money f is only been uh, absorbed when it has been spent. That's a big difference to Next Generation mm -hmm. EU, where mm -hmm. it's counted, mm -hmm. the money has been allocated, then it's been counted as spending. So that's why they always say it's all been allocated, but the spending is a different thing. I, I have three points on the regions. All regions want to be innovative, want to uh, uh, develop. A lot of them have strategy dialogues with the industry, with the uh, social partners. Uh, a lot of them do mapping, because that's also where a crucial lack is, that we don't have a proper mapping of the transition. Uh, the Commission has to do a report next year about uh, how the uh, transition is going, and we need a methodology, and we have cases like in Thuringia, where they split a car in different parts and see who is producing what in these cars, and what of this is green, red, and yellow in terms of its future use, and they approaching the companies, and they investing, for example, into interior design of cars, because they see that as a growing thing. So regions make strategic choices of investment and innovation policies to do. 
Second point I wanted to say is about um, uh, next generation EU. Next generation EU, anything like that, an investment fund and so on, if it works like uh, this one, as a budget transfer to the national level, mm -hmm. uh, you have a high risk that it doesn't reach those who are really needed. We have an ex existing system of funds close to the regions, to the places. That's the social fund, not the climate social fund, the social mm -hmm. fund. We would rather have liked that the European social fund would be extended than creating another uh, European climate social fund, which works like an NFA, uh, like a uh, next generation EU budget transfer to the national level, and nobody knows what is happening with that. That is very crucial. Reducing the, the funds to what works, and the problem is that what works is when people are closely connected and monitoring it. And um, the last thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, the uh, the industry policy linked to the places, that's the, what the IIA is doing with the uh, social obligation, but also with the territorial obligation, that is needed in order to make it work, because if we don't, then we don't get the jobs there where they are needed in, in this area. And the last sentence on competitiveness, I think we cannot afford a, se a sector only to be uh, able to uh, survive when it is protected, when there is uh, state subsidies coming in and so on. It needs to be, there needs to be an economic case that it works. And, and what we hear from the Commission is that competitiveness will be key link to the future of the Green Deal. It needs to be just and competitive. That is the key and it is linked to the places. I think that is a message for the Green Deal 2.0. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you to all of you that have presented today. Thank you so much. I think now we can leave the floor to Bela to say a few wrap-up words. Uh, I really, uh, well, I hope that I need a microphone. So I really have nothing more to add. Uh, we have exploited the time, and it was really a great discussion. And uh, from the beginning, uh, so well. It's no need to wrap up uh, actually anything, and all has been said here, uh, but definitely we need a European industrial policy, we need European resources, and we need social conditionalities. And that is probably the lowest hanging fruit and to start with. Uh, but, so this project, at least in the form, uh, is coming to an end. Uh, we will publish uh, all these, well, first of all, the presentations that uh, will be uh, uploaded here uh, at our event website that uh, uh, we will also have a different website, a project website, and then all the papers, because there are papers behind these presentations, uh, will be uploaded and you can read everything, detailed uh, numbers and figures and uh, everything there. And after that, we will also have a book publication, but that takes a little bit more time. Um, well, thank you, and thank you for the attention and the active participation. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.